The following is a presentation of the St. Louis Chess Club. The possibilities are endless at the Singfield Cup in St. Louis. With the field drawn, a single decisive result would have a dramatic impact on the standings. Wesley So finally got the ball rolling, defeating his opponent for the first victory of the event. Alareza Ferruja decided Wesley had the right idea, but despite having chances, was forced to settle for a draw. We waited three rounds to get one, but we finally have a win and a leader. Round five of Amazing Chess. Coming up next. Welcome to round five of the Sinkfield Cup. It's a beautiful day here in downtown St. Louis. Rest day is on the horizon and players are gonna leave everything on the board. Let's go to the studio and get started. Welcome to St. Louis, the home of chess in America. As the St. Louis Chess Club proudly presents the Sinkfield Cup, we have a leader. Who will join the party? We'll find out right now. Hello and uh, welcome. It's day five of the Sinkfield Cup. And after some intense battles, we now have a sole tournament leader. Now with so much at stake, will the players push their limits in pursuit of victory? We'll find out. I'm International Master Ivan Kahowska and it's a great pleasure to be alongside these fantastic Grandmasters, Yasser Sarawan, and Peter Svidler. Jovi, as always, a great pleasure to be with you in studio as well. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our coverage of the fifth round of the Sinkville Cup. Today is the day before the rest day, and the, finally, we did have a breakthrough. Yesterday promised a lot of fireworks, and it's very close to having three out of those four games being decisive, but only one was. And Jovi, do the honors and tell our viewers the standings. Absolutely, Yasa. And there you can see it was Wesley So after his victory over Richard Report that moves him to first place with two and a half points out of four. And then we have a whole group of people all drawing their games. So that means right. everything is even between the t all of them. And uh, then we see Richard Report there on uh, ninth place. But just remember that Jan Krzysztof Duda has been withdrawn right. and did so after round two so that means his games have been avoided and uh, the format for this year's St. Phil Cup Joby well it's a 10 <clears throat> player round robin and the players are playing the classical format of 90 minutes for the first 40 moves and then 30 minutes for the rest of the game of course the players do have that 30 second time bonus increment from move one and no draw offers allowed which should mean fighting chess. One point for the win, half point for the draw. It has been fighting chess and uh, I gave the plot away. Tell us the schedule. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, today it's round five on the Saturday, November the 25th, but bear in mind tomorrow is a rest day. Players will not be playing, they'll be re-energizing, recuperating, right. and then they will play one game per day until Thursday, November the 30th. And of course, there will be playoffs if necessary. Thank you, Jovi. And Peter, lots of really, really good reasons for winning this Absolutely. single cup. Absolutely. And I'll name three. And those three are glory, self-fulfillment, <laughs> and the attention of the adoring public. Perfect. And also what you will just see on your screen in a moment here. Uh, are right more about, reasons. More reasons. <laughs> prize money for this tournament, prize money for the Grand Chess Tour, and the chance to play in the candidates in some order. And this, these are the very, very well-paid tournaments, the biggest purse, I think, in the history of uh, chess outside of perhaps the World Championship matches. This is the prize fund for uh, the Singfield Cup. 
Uh, as you can see, a very cool 100 grand up top, 65 for second, 48 for third, all the way down to, in our case, 13,000, because there will be no 10th place finish with young Krzysztof Duda sadly uh, uh, withdrawing from the tournament. And there is also an additional purse for the Grand Chess Tour as a whole. The first place seems to be locked up, although there are some uh, permutations still possible, but there is a very uh, hotly contested fight for second and third, still a lot of money at stake, as you can see, 175,000 of additional prize fund there. And then, of course, there is the last two spots for the candidates. And a lot of players in our tournament are still very much in contention, and in particular the rating spot, uh, the race is uh, very much ongoing, as you can see on your screen, Alireza is still ahead, but with yesterday's victory, uh, uh, Wesley So is now within within striking distance. One more Absolutely. victory puts him probably atop uh, that particular list. So all to play for in that all important fight to become a candidate. And then the candidate uh, tournament obviously gives you a chance to fight for the world championship match, which apart from glory, attention of adoring public <laughs> and self-fulfillment has a prize, prize fund of its own, etc., etc., etc. And welcome to woman grandmaster Anastasia Karlovich, who is uh, closer to the action than we are. Thank you, Peter. Hello, everyone. I'm really near to the playing hall. I'm waiting for the players to finish their games and come here for the interviews. We also take care of the social media accounts of Grand Chess Tour and St. Louis Chess Club together with Begim Tohirjonova, woman grandmaster. So, of course, and Peter, you're absolutely right. Everybody in the chess world um, are following this, this event, not only because of Grand Chess Tour results or Sinkfield Cup results, but, but uh, because of this uh, possibility to get the, the spot in the candidates tournament. Wesley so didn't only win the game yesterday, which was also, also very impressive for all of us, but he also um, decreased the gap between him and Alireza Firuja to five points only. And I wonder what is going to happen today, because every game can be decisive, uh, not only for Sinkfield Cup, but also for, for the rating um, of, of those players. So, also, funny story happened yesterday with Anish Giri, who uh, published this funny tweet. As I was walking out of the elevator, I heard a man who greeted me earlier tell his companion, this is the CEO of Chesscom. So funny tweet by Anish. Uh, you know that uh, this year, first, on 1st of April, Chesscom made him CEO of, uh, of Chesscom, which was very funny. Everybody knew that it was April's joke, but it seems like not everybody knows uh, what's going on. But for for sure follow social media and know who is Anish Giri and it's really nice that people keep recognizing our players in, in, in St. Louis. Uh, if you missed some action, uh, please, don't, please come to Grand Chess Tour website, official website for all events and uh, Sinkful Cup as well. And check our round recaps, uh, which are written by Kostya Kovutsky and uh, Begim Tohirjonova. If you missed some action, you can always find out what was uh, happening during the day. We have also some moments from the chess games of the players. And uh, of course, fifth round is approaching us. The players are gathering uh, probably right now in the hall, and it's time to get back to the studio to Yasser and Joey. Thank, Thank you, you, Anastasia. I like this idea of Anish as a CEO of uh, chess.com. Somehow that, that fits, as we see there in the World Chess Hall of Fame, Ali Reza adjusting all of his pieces, something I like to do, get the zen of the tournament hall, get myself settled, fill in my score sheet. I always like being early. Yeah, it's good to get psyched up and have a pre-game ritual. Absolutely. Uh, but do the honors for our audience. Tell them what they can expect for this round five coming up. Where's the excitement? Oh, uh, yeah, so we are <laughs> spoiled today because take a look at these pairings. We have Lenia nice. Dominguez with the white pieces facing off against the new tournament leader, Wesley So. Then Levon Aronian, who yesterday had a break. Well, he's back on the board facing off against Ali Reza Faruja. Now, Richard reports while well, he suffered his first loss yesterday. Right. Today, maybe he can bounce back as he plays <coughs> Anish Giri. And there at the bottom, Maxime vasher le against Jan Pomniacci. That one, for sure, is going to be a thriller. Absolutely. That game between MBL and Nepo has a habit of actually deciding the outcome of a first place. Uh, remember, famously, one of MVL's victories came in the very last round as he defeated Nepo in an, Absolutely. an excellent and, game. And the player missing in action today, Fabiano Carano, will, will have two, two rest days in a row because 
tomorrow is everybody's rest day. Right. And then he will play his third black game in a row. So he has a bit of a funky, funky schedule there. Quite the challenge uh, for Fabius. We see MBL at the board. And for MBL, as we know from the Grand Chess Tour, he needs certain things to happen. Number one, he's got to win first place clear. In a way, his situation is the simplest of, of them all. He doesn't really need to watch anybody else. Right. Whatever happens elsewhere, happens elsewhere. But his, his task is extremely, extremely straightforward. Win this tournament, hope Fabi for some reason has a meltdown. But the, right. the, the most important thing is the one thing that he would want to do anyway. So right. I, think, I think for him, nothing really changes all that much. And he has a big challenge in Nepal. Absolutely. Yeah. They've, they've had some fantastic battles over the years. Uh, the, 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 the very, very long candidates tournament of yes. 2020, 2021 featured yes. uh, some very important games between the two. We're going to start our coverage be between uh, the players Lanier and Wesley. Lanier as we uh, came into our show uh, in round one, it said, Lanier has played in quite a number of Sinkfield Cup events. He's never lost a single game. Yeah, no, he, he has an undefeated score here at the Sinkfield Cup. And uh, I was just looking at him yes. right now. Is he eyeballing Wesley? <laughs> <laughs> I think he was looking past him, but I'm not sure. I guess he was looking here as to who's our bell ringer. Yeah. The official bell ringer. Okay. Let's do it. The bell has been rung. The players. And round five underway here as E2, E4 has been uh, Lanier's long staple opening move. And, you know, I think of certain players as E4 players. Mickey Adams comes to mind. Lanier comes to mind. And they really have a very tight and very clear repertoire, uh, Peter. Uh, for Lanier, how would you categorize him in terms of prepared, prepared players? I mean, we were having that discussion about who's the best prepared players in the world. I think he is very, very high on the list, in particular because he wouldn't be in very many people's conversation when you discuss the best, player, best prepared players. He is sort of slightly off to the side. He's seconded uh, Fabi. Fabi, he, famously, yeah. Yeah, and... Uh, but even, even without the seconding work he does occasionally, he is just extremely well booked up, works very diligently on chess. And uh, I've always admired his chess. I think he is, he plays very harmonious, very kind of straightforward, simple chess pieces, mm -hmm. generally go where they belong. And watching him play when he plays well is, is a joy. Absolutely. Well, we've seen earlier in the event, Wesley essaying the uh, Berlin, Knight F6, D3, a D3, Bishop C5 occurred in his previous games. I'm sure he's going to stay true to form in Knight F6. After all, he leads the tournament. He's got the black pieces. Exactly. Equalize, let's go. Berlin is a tough <laughs> nut to crack as exactly. well. Exactly. And, uh, well, yeah, there here we go. it comes. And, in fact, these two have played the Berlin against each other before. So they do have Castles. some history. Castles. No, oh. uh, D2, D3. Uh, today, I wanted to say that I feel that Linier is actually more of a more of a castles player, and after ninety four, I think he uh, rookie va varies one. between rookie one and and the um, end game proper. Uh, so interesting, interesting to see what will what will happen today. And uh, when I think about this particular variation, for some reason, the games of Wesley really come to mind because it seems to me that he, in particular. Uh, has been playing the black side of these positions forever. <laughs> I mean, really. And, and really well, I think. And he really knows, well. He knows exactly what he's doing there. He is extremely solid in general, and yeah. this, this opening in particular gives him uh, ample scope to be solid. By but no, way, it seems D4. like we're getting, we're getting the opening today. Uh, the, 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 the end game. Yeah, the end game today. Unless Lanier wants to uh, go for the somewhat gambly line starting with A4 or Bishop A4, there's... But no, yeah. No, yeah, they're going right in. Didn't seem, didn't seem likely. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, earlier before he left us, uh, Duda had played the black side of the Berlin against Anish. We we thought he might have blundered upon. If he did, it turned out to be brilliant because <laughs> I'm pretty sure he hasn't. He, yeah. Because he got a very easy draw. That was the. Uh, bishops of opposite color, color ending round where everybody <laughs> got bishops of opposite color except for one 
uh, game. Well, okay, Berlin ending, that's a, a long story. We'll, we'll wait for the players to uh, find the novelty in that one. We'll go around the horn. I'm going to go to the game of Levon Aronian versus Ali Reza. We do have a Nimzo Indian with knight f3 on move four. And a pause from, from Ali Reza because obviously there is plenty of options here. If you want to continue playing the Nimzo, you're I think supposed to play c5 here. Right. There's also the option of course of playing d7, d5 and switching back to the Ragozin. I'm sure Castles doesn't lose either, but <laughs> those, the, those two I think are the main two lines you're choosing from. Yeah. And also Could you know B6. that castles doesn't lose? <laughs> B6 is also B7, very B6 yeah. is all, yeah. Uh, not the trendy E3, Bishop D2 no, uh, lines. What is the line, uh, by the way, where they played the early Bishop G5? What was that called? Uh, that was I'm not sure. I'm, I'm Boris, really horrible with, yeah. with variation names. Boris Baski, uh, I had a game with Svetasar Gligorich. I was on the black side uh, where they play bishop g5. The inclusion, however, of bishop g5, I don't think is actually a very good move. I think black actually more Leningrad than equalizes. Leningrad variation. The Leningrad, that's a, I had it in mind that it had a Russian name. I just didn't, but I imagine that if you did castle, the move bishop, bishop g5, g5 would, absolutely. takes more legitimacy. Absolutely, than and this is why b6, Yovanka absolutely correctly pointed out, b6 is the way not to play c5 or d5 mm -hmm. and maintain some uh, some flexibility. Uh, and queen b3 very quickly played by, by Levon here. So we're uh, going in slightly offbeat directions. Of course, even this will have been played at least dozens, if not hundreds of times, but it's not the most topical Nimzo, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, offering a chance, I guess, for Ali Reza to, 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 to play a game of chess. The choice here would be between c5 and a5. Right. c5 seems more straightforward. Right. And uh, if, if we're talking about this particular structure, you, very often you would have the queen on c2 here instead of the queen on b3, for instance. Uh, how does that line go? Somebody help me out. Well, if you don't mind me saying, mm -hmm. uh, queen b3 uh, against b7, mm -hmm. b6 is actually a line I pioneered. It's even I got my name. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> so you did with it. And you're absolutely right. a7, a5 mm -hmm. and c7, c5 are considered the most challenging. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've actually had blitz games, uh, don't ask me why, where, they went, where I went a3, they went a4. And uh -huh. I went queen c2, and I was like, I was so proud of myself having learned the pawn to a4, right? And the point here, of course, is that if you take on b4, you will have to give up this, yes. uh, this queen after knight c6, and then if queen b5, My you, queen is it, does get, it does get uh, yeah. caught by rook a5. Exactly. So then the idea, uh, um, in my match with Jan Timon, Jan played c5, mm -hmm. as you were about to say, and then I play a3. It's very important to include the move a3. And then you have to make the determination, are you going to take on c3, are you going to drop back to a5. Mm -hmm. And my, my game with Jan went uh, bishop a5, bishop g5. Yeah, I remember and you the, playing this and then castling long. Uh, castling and long, cast that's precisely right, that's precisely right. I, I don't know if Levon's trolling me by the because <laughs> he has a habit of coming on the show and saying, uh, you know, I remembered, you know, old Yasser once played this, you know, yeah. old, yeah, he gets in his quotes, I would, you know. I would, I actually wouldn't put it past him to just, just do this to, to tickle, to irritate. tickle, tickle. Yeah, tickle. Well, not, I don't think you're irritated, I think you're happy. But it, this is a good idea, right, because yes. Ali Reza, very young, yes. uh, will he be familiar with the ideas the of your... Yeah, exactly, it's a, it's a very, very uh, tricky line, and uh, there's some complicated variations that you have to navigate. If you're not well prepared, uh, it's easy. And I can kind of guess by Ali Reza's uh, body language there that he's been caught a little bit off guard by Queen B3. Does look that way, yes. Yeah. Uh, let's continue our uh, walk around the tournament hall, our ever popular uh, Joko Piano uh, with Knight C3 on the yeah. board in the game of Richie. Pianissimo Anish. even. Pianissimo. Pianissimo? Yeah, I think, I think the lines where the knight goes to C3 are uh, 
One of them is Joko Piano and one is Pianissimo, and I keep on mixing up which one is which. This is the quietest one, or perhaps right. the well, other you one. you passed the test, because I'm looking at the database here, and it says Pianissimo. We're not worthy. Yeah. We're not hooray, worthy. hooray for me. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I gave this speech many a time already, but uh, this is a very... I don't need very many things to, to, to make me laugh, and this being the absolute in vogue way of playing the Italian, is, uh, it is, is actually making me kind of uh, uh, giggle because this is very much would be in vogue in like the 16th century, Absolutely. and we're now and we're now returning to this and looking at this very seriously. And in fact, this is maybe the central attempt. Why do you say 16th century? Yeah, this is my scholastic say, upbringing. I, I was going to say, you know, I did, I aspired to I play did, this. I did some training at an under 12 tournament, and right? I kid you not, every game started like this. And they right? were literally just copying each other. And the big point, obviously, is that if you black were to castle, <laughs> mm -hmm. And if you have a complete copycat, yeah, so this would happen, but that's right. a bit too sophisticated. For ah, <laughs> it happens, happens after castling first. Right. And then Castles. after d6, the bishop comes out and knight to d5. Right. And I have gotcha. seen so many games that finish like that. Well, the funny part was I don't think you were on camera when you were saying that you're surprised that, uh, that, that this is in vogue. And you were looking directly at me when you said the 16th century. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, like, look, I mean, it was my scholastic uh, days, yeah. not the 16th century. Yeah, I, nice. I can't. Uh, but it has actually been revived, Peter. Absolutely. It's, it's, being, uh, it's being discussed very, very seriously at the absolute top level with the intention of uh, very often White will play bishop b3 quite, quite early. Uh, in, in our game here, Anish goes h6 because bishop g5 is a serious thing to consider know. here. Uh, castles, castles happens. Uh, h3 for now. Which surprises me a little bit because very often they play bishop b3 already here, but for now, Richard starts with h3. Uh, Black gives themselves uh, the, a7, the a7 uh, square for the bishop. Uh, and perhaps in some positions b5 might be playable, but in general, I don't think you want to be extending on the queen side, providing white with a target. I'm expecting bishop b3 somewhere here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then. Uh, we have already, we definitely have seen some of them in the Rapid and Blitz. I'm not right. sure if we've seen uh, one in the Classical yet. The point of positions like this would be that if black is in time to play bishop b6, black is more or less completely fine. There are sometimes minor pressures available to right. white, but as a general rule of thumb, if black lands bishop b6 here, black will be completely fine. But this particular position after d3, d4 could be a bit annoying because you completely rule out bishop b6 because of the very simple fork in the center. Right. And uh, it becomes a bit difficult to make moves. Uh, in, in particular, if white can preserve the bishop on this diagonal. Specifically here, b7, b5 might actually be not such a bad idea because the bishop can no longer stay on the uh, a2, g8 diagonal, which is a best diagonal for that piece because after bishop b3, I think we will quite happily start chasing it with knight a5 at some point. Uh, but if you, if you add two more moves here, like you play rook e8, I play maybe a3, the e4 pawn isn't really hanging because f7 will be very, very vulnerable. If you try taking everything, you, you run into bishop f7, Ouch. and this is a problem. Uh, and why just wants to continue developing, perhaps queen d3, perhaps even queen d2, and then rook a1, doubling on the f file with rook f2, and then rook f1 is very topical. Whereas for black, you suddenly find yourself in this strange situation where it's very unclear where your next move is coming from mm -hmm. if you cannot challenge this bishop on c4. Uh, another thing that black players do after bishop b3 quite often is, is they say, Take my bishop. slightly spoiling our structure in the center is still better than giving you the semi-open f-file. Mm -hmm. So they just play d6 and tell you, uh, you want to take on c5, be my guest. I'm not that bothered uh, about that. Uh, we'll, we'll see what transpires here. I'm a bit curious as to why this is not happening faster, because as I said, this is a very central line these days, which people are discussing a great deal. But we heard sometimes they play 95. Maybe he's choosing between bishop 3 and 95. Very, very nice. Yeah. How do they match up uh, in their yeah, games, Yeah, let's check out the stats. And here they are. Well, in terms wow. of uh, well, classical chess, we see you, Anish Giri definitely very has a head start. <laughs> yes. Zero to four. Six draws. They haven't played each other that much. Yeah, again, that's classical chess, probably a lot more in rapids and blitz, but that is 
pretty lopsided. I remember at one moment Magnus having perhaps the most lopsided score against Hikaru of all play players. It was some, yeah. Seriously, it was really it was awful. Really big, yeah. Like 11-0 with 20 draws, doesn't matter. I think it went out to, fif to 15 until, uh, until he lost the game. Yeah, yeah and, and I, I congratulated Hikaru. I said, Hikaru, you know that uh, Magnus is the number one player by 50 rating points. He goes, yeah, I know that. He said, if it wasn't for you, he wouldn't have that 50 rating point gap. <laughs> like, yes, and I know that too. What else don't I know? <laughs> Tell that me more. That is brutal. <laughs> hey, look, I'm a, I'm a professional commentator. I, you know, don't shoot the message. <laughs> uh, 92. Uh, yeah, returning, no, returning to yeah. our pianissimo. Uh, Rickard actually, yeah, no, actually <laughs> went with a4. Right. Mainly, I think, keeping the bishop on this diagonal rather than stopping b5. I don't think b5 is a massive, massive threat. Right. And d6, 92. So this is actually uh, an attempt to drive the position towards your normal Jokopianos because if you if you continue kind of quietly and you get and you get some kind of position like this, it starts looking a little bit like the main lines of uh, yes, yes of our standard uh, Italian where you know you, you, you can you can you can imagine you can imagine something like this happening followed by rookie bishop b6 and the knight very often is aimed by plays white plays rookie one and then tries doing this right uh, the one important thing and this is another speech I very much like to give uh, this particular position differs from from the positions we, we would be discussing uh, here because here very often bishop will go to a7, it will either get chased to a7 or it will go to a7 voluntarily. Whereas here it's still on c5, which gives black a very, very useful option of playing d5, which is normal, but after b4 it should go to f8. Right. Which seems a bit strange because on a7 it's on this very beautiful long diagonal and mm -hmm. on f8 it seemingly does nothing. But the fact that this bishop is on f8, it allows black a lot more stability on the king side. Now white pretty much never has any initiative on the king side at all because it just protects the whole, the whole flank. And it just does better on f8 than it does on a, on a7. And mm -hmm. uh, I came to this conclusion, I think, for the first time in my life. I was playing in the London Candidates and there was this game, I think, Rajabov uh, played white against Livon Aronian. And there was some kind of a classical Italian where the bishop was on a7. And then at some point Livon took two tempi to play bishop c5, bishop f8. Mm -hmm. And I looked at this and I thought, this is something I've never seen before and it makes a great deal of sense. Mm -hmm. I was very impressed and I, it kind of was a core memory for me because I, it taught me something about the structure I thought I have, I've, I've seen for forever. And right. There was nothing new to be learned about that particular position. Yeah, and just uh, thinking about the World Championships, uh, the World Championship match, between Magnus and Nepo, as my, Magnus was hugging the bishop on f8 and many of these rural peasants saying, try to break me, and yeah. Nepo could not in that match. By the way, knight e2, bishop e6, are you gonna go knight g3 and I'm invite not sure. and the capture on c4? In more concrete terms, apart from rook e8, which I'm sure is completely playable, there is right. also the question, can't we just go d5, e5, knight d5 here and go for this structure immediately? Right. It also frankly looks completely uh, completely safe. Playable, like, yeah, yeah. I wanna play, play rook e8, I wanna put the bishop on e6. Once again, this bishop probably drops back to f8 because white sometimes has tempi against it, so it just right. should just belong on f8 in these types of positions. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very valid option, as is playing bishop e6 without wasting a tempo on rook e8. I think white takes probably goes in some order, knight g3 and then c2, c3. And we get the kind of a structure we discussed on these shows before, where I think black probably should at some point play c6, a5 <laughs> to stop white from expanding right. on the king side. It's nothing very much. I don't think Richard came today uh, with the intention of achieving an opening advantage. Right. He just wants to get a playable position right. played, uh, and he will get it here. And is White's plan, you know, just to go bishop e3, trade off the dark square yeah, bishops, think, and then... Yeah, we play c3, rook e1, bishop e3, we trade, and then we pretend at some point that our d4, d4, or d3, d4 break does something, or we try to achieve something on the king side. But it's Generally speaking, I think the understanding is it's fine for black, but it's a long game with a lot of intricacies, and uh, you can definitely there's scope for outplaying your opponent from here. Okay. All right, thank you for that, Sophisticated uh, Peter. chess. De definitely, and some accurate chess. Um, 
Let's, uh, I'm go I seeing down. an archangel. Am I seeing a Joko piano? I think I'm seeing an archangel. You are seeing an archangel. And it's not archangel. Fabi at the board. No. <laughs> uh, MVL versus Nepo. We'll uh, we'll go to what I think is going to be a marquee uh, game. Uh, the standard Morphe defense mm. uh, with Knight F6, uh, uh, Bishop C5, C3, Bishop. Bishop A. There was a there was a quirk there. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, I, I wanted what? to I wanted to address this. First Please. of all, this is not the pure archangel. It's a uh, it's bishop c5 on move 5, not on move 6. Instead of the inclusion yeah. b5 yeah. first. So, yeah, the, the, the classical, uh, uh, and I was, honestly, I was taught that the archangel is specifically this, and mm -hmm. that bishop c5 has all kinds of names, you know, Muller, and also mm -hmm. your Taev did a lot to, to, to develop this uh, uh, Uzbeki uh, grandmaster of uh, times gone by. So I've been calling it the Yurtaev and... <laughs> And I've seen it called in your type in publications, but this is a, easy an, for you to say. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but this particular move order is very interesting because you play bishop c5, white plays c3, and normally there is a very binary choice here. You can go b5, uh, which allows white to play d2, d4, uh, which is a, its own you know suite of variations, or the bishop drops back to either c2 or b3. Mm -hmm. If it drops back to b3, we get. You transpose. Your, your, normal, uh, your normal main line, which can be arrived at here. But in this position, c3 is not the main move. Right. You normally a4. start with a4. Right. So what you've gained, if the bishop drops to b3, is you gave yourself an option of replying to a4 with bishop g4, right. which otherwise wouldn't have been available. Right. Uh, so bishop c2, I think, is the main move. And there has been, for, for I think, three decades now, and a very important discussion about this position and whether this holds for black or not. Right. So this is one choice. And the other choice is something that Magnus played with black. I actually played with black a couple of times. Castling and going bishop a7 without playing d6, without playing b5. Mm -hmm. uh, which, once again, splits it to, into two halves. You can go d5, knight e4. And there are some positions here which look, at first glance, like they're slightly better for white. But they all, in, in particular, there's this queen endgame, d5. queen d5. You go bishop c2, black goes knight e7, you drop the queen back, and black goes d5 and takes with the queen. In this endgame, at first glance, you might think, you know, this is this isolated pawn, I will now finish development and I will be solidly better for the rest of the game. But if you look at this with engines, they will suggest that there is a lot of very concrete counterplay, very often starting with move bishop f5, uh, trading this bishop for this bishop, creating this d3 square to uh, start aiming jump set. And I think the current understanding is, if you know what you're doing here with black, you will equalize. Wow. Uh, so this is one way, and the other way is to play bishop g5. And these positions are incredibly sharp. These positions, uh, after, let's say, h6, bishop h4, black very often will be obliged to play g7, g5, allowing all these sacrifices. Okay. It's very easy to go wrong and be completely busted by move 15 here. <laughs> there is a lot of very, very uh, tricky theory starting from here. What Jan does, though, is a kind of a r weird combination of the two. He goes he to a7. With a7. He goes to a7. First of all, maybe MVL just thought, okay, I'm being tricked. I'm, he wants to steal three minutes of my time <laughs> when I, you know, during which I will be trying to figure out what the what, what the, the idea difference, is. yeah, what the difference is, and then he will castle anyway. <laughs> right. So MVL plays d4, and now Jan plays b5. And MVL, after some thought, chooses b3. Black plays d6. And we are now back to, once again, if we compare this to the classical archangels, yeah, we, we have this position okay. in which, but there's one difference. Because if you go if you go via this move order, bishop pretty much always goes to b6, b6 not, not a7. A7. Because on a7, it provides additional slight problems for black. Uh, but on the other hand, why generally doesn't play c3 and d4 so quickly? Because now when the bishop comes to g4, this entire center comes under intense pressure. And you have to have a, a tactical justification for doing this. So I'm, I'm very interested in this. I think uh, uh, Jan, judging by the clock uh, situation, Jan clearly won the opening skirmish here because he, I think he dragged MVL out of the positions. MVL would be very comfortable knowing what he's doing. Of course, White is still, like White is never in trouble, but he will have to play on his own. He will have to try and figure out what the difference is Mm -hmm. uh, with bishop on a7 being on a7 and not on b6, b6. and so on. So. Yeah, and, uh, and let's check out the lifetime. Sure. It's a very interesting position, and uh, we'll see how Maxim copes with that. 
Uh, well, another one-sided uh, encounter. Maxime Rashid-Legraf with seven wins to Napomayashi's one and ten draws between the pair. So definitely a bit of a kind of And this man is twice, twice challenger to the world champion. So it goes to show that MVL can uh, bounce with the best yeah. of them. I have to say, first of all, thank you, Peter. That was an incredible exposition about this opening and I just ha I have this horrible image in my mind of spending three lifetimes <laughs> trying to understand the nuances and the subtle subtle differences between having my bishop on b6 having my bishop on c2 having my bishop on a7 for both sides and finally they do reach a theoretical position Peter and what's the outcome of uh, this discussion that the players are having I'm not entirely sure I think what you would like to do here with white, and the ideal setup if you can achieve it, looks something along these lines. You want to put the bishop on e3 because, as I said, you can expect your center to come under very, Pressure. very direct fire. Let's say black castles, and you probably, like in some order, you want to put the knight on g2 and you want to play h2, h3 because you really would like to stop both bishop g4 and knight g4. Because once once you put the knight on g2, the bishop on e3 kind of needs to survive, so you, you, you don't want to be even... Harassed. Calculating mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the, the Niger So you go H3. H3. Let's say yeah, you go H3. Yeah. And, and the big point, knight takes pawn. Not possible because of bishop d5. I, I've <laughs> fallen for those traps, I, I, I promise you. Vladimir Pafnudi of 1974 Washington State Championship. I took the pawn on e4. <laughs> he looked at me, young man. <laughs> yeah. So something like this, something like this is a normal position. And Returning to our discussion about whether b6 or a7 is a better square, I think I would still argue for b6 being the more comfortable, but one difference I can definitely name is that, let's say we go rook e1, black goes bishop b7. Now if white goes d5, uh, and the knight jumps away because bishop takes e3 actually loses this material, a... the excelsior reaches a8, and <laughs> right. white collects more pieces than black does. Right. Uh, so after knight e7, had the bishop been on b6, you would have to somewhat spoil your structure by taking away from the center. Got Here, camps, it's on a7. Got a Kamsky Viswanathan Anand, the mm. candidates match where, where, where mm -hmm. that happened. Please continue. Yeah. Uh, Peter, and, and, and here, yes, the rook will be a bit dis uh, misplaced on, on a7, but generally speaking, I think you would much rather preserve the option of That's undermining C6. the white center with c7, c6, so that the, the pawn is not on b6. Yeah, but you know, one time I had a very similar position with the black pieces, believe yeah. it or not, I, I played wow. the archangel, and I, I found that white just simply went a4, and then... There was a chop, sore chop, thumb chop, on chop, b5. Chop, and exactly, the bishop on b7 was mm. such a bad piece. Yeah, and the pawn no. on b5 stands out. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but specifically here, I think we will be in time we, to play c7, c6. c6. Very much revo reviving the bishop on b7. If it stays locked down like this, you will not enjoy it. You're absolutely correct. But if you do get to play c6 and trade away the pawn on d5, I think it should be it should be manageable. Mm -hmm. There is still a, a lot of other options available. You can definitely think about playing bishop g5. Uh, you, you can probably think about playing a4 as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, well I was going to ask in a more kind of practical question. In terms of the tournament situation, tomorrow is a free day. No right. one wants to lose before the free day. Do you think right. the players will perhaps not take those risks and go for something a little bit more comfortable? I think that's already beyond, past them. I think the decision by Jan of playing such a double-edged risky uh, defense has basically said, I'm going to drag you into a very sharp game whether you like it or not and MBL is one of those people who play ball and say okay if you're going to force me to play very sharply mm -hmm. I'll gladly oblige. Um, give me some statistics. Uh, tell me what's going on in this opening. How, what are the outcomes Jovi? Who does well? Who does well here? Yeah. Uh, it's quite balanced actually. Uh, so I'm just looking at the main line which is actually A4. A4 and, is the main line? Uh, not, not unexpected yeah. Seems and very logical. There it actually seems that black does better than white. There's 60% draws, but 27% victories for black. And um, actually, black is scoring very well in this which, line. Which uh, begs the question of uh, black is scoring very well. 
Peter, why isn't this the most popular defense of all time? Because <laughs> it's hot stuff, you know. I, I, you got, you got, you got, I got my prep, fingers <laughs> trapped in the cookie jar playing this, and I thought, never again. Never again. <laughs> Have you gotten your fingers trapped in uh, the cookie jar? Yeah, I've, one, I've, uh, I've lost some Peter? games playing. I, I, I at some point recorded the course on the on the Archangels and uh, played it a, a bit afterwards. and. I drew MVL with black, but then I lost a very painful game to Sergei Karakin in the super final. Did you get your money back from the course <laughs> <laughs> author? <laughs> yeah. I don't think authors get money, money, money back, sadly. No refunds. <laughs> no, no refunds, no. Uh, it's a very sharp line. You need to remember a lot of stuff. And as usual, uh, again, somebody playing correctly from the white side, it's uh, not always as much fun as it, as it looks. But it's very playable. And, well, I was always very drawn to it because I think, in terms of somewhat mainstream options Black has in the Rui Lopez, uh, this group of openings, five bishop c5, six bishop c5, all of these lines, they provide you with arguably maybe the best fighting chance of getting a position where white will not have an easy way to get an absolutely free advantage with no mm -hmm. risk. Uh, and this is, you know, this is what always attracted me to Grunfeld, and this is what always drew me to uh, to these positions. But of course, at the very, very top level, you make one mistake here, it probably costs you more than it does in, let's say, the Berlin. Yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say that Jan appears, to my eyes, to have won the opening battle because MVL, uh, spending close to 25 minutes uh, trying to uh, sift his way through these various uh, nuances oh, that... Uh, do you see his uh, fingers no, there? Can it. you see it? There's like a... A little twitching going little on? twitching going on. It's almost yeah. like he's in full on calculation mode. Right. Tuck, 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 tuck. tuck, tuck. Yeah. Uh, D7, D6, and uh, a stop. Uh, let's go back to our tournament leader. Uh, we do, after all, have a uh, leader in the event. Let's give Wesley So uh, some credit. Uh, when we have left it, they just got to the ending. And H2, H3. Um, Think of the old days, knight c3 was by far the most traditional move, but h2, h3 for various and subtle reasons uh, replaced it all. And b7, b6. Again, it, it's one of those defenses that it just seems to give uh, black all kinds of options, including the move a7, a5, as played by Duda against Anish earlier. I think h7, h5. Uh, the was the uh, right? main line for gosh knows how many years. And now, B I think Levon Aronian played this uh, against Gada Komsky in a game that just really was a stunningly awesome game, uh, like a, a poster game for mm. the black side of the Berlin, the two bishops. Rook D1, bishop B4. This, uh, this we... whole idea has fallen out of fashion. Has it? Yeah. I'm just t taking a look and Tell seeing, you know, last pedigree. game was like 2016, 2018. 2016. 20. Which feels like yesterday to me, but really, <laughs> <laughs> it's five years ago. <laughs> and Rook G8, maybe this is a good, and we do have a move after Rook G8. It's a good time to stop. Rook G8, uh, I understand prophylaxis and uh, stopping your opponent from doing something. But rook g eight all standard, Peter. Yeah, I think it's maybe even still theory. But uh, yeah. even if it isn't, you, it's very easy to explain Please. because you, you would like at some point to chase this knight away, and maybe even more importantly, it pretty much always is aiming to land on a five. Clear. And you want to be able to immediately start chasing it away. Go away. Yeah. Right away. Yeah. So. Since you, you you're, don't really want to be playing g6 pretty much anywhere in these types of positions, because that would create uh, perfect uh, outposts yeah, for the black, of real problems for you bishop. on the dark squares. Uh, and bishop c8 immediately isn't really very playable because c6 is hanging. So you, you do make this move just to make sure that you're as equipped to deal with the eventual knight f5 as possible. And then you can continue developing after bishop f4. Currently, rook d8 seems to be completely fine. If five v6 doesn't appear to scare the uh, the black players here all that much. Let's take a look as to why. Why is e6 here not right. so good? Bishop d6. This is a bit, yeah, this is a bit surprising to me because it just plays bishop d6. And my point here would be 
we were brought up with the understanding <laughs> that, and right. it, takes with, it takes with the rook as well. Oh, that, that I'm a pawn up. <laughs> yes, that we're, basically, we're basically winning here, right? Right. Because we have three, they have two, and this doesn't count. Right. <laughs> but uh, this understanding has been uh, shifted right. over, over the, 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 engines, the, the yeah. recent years. Yeah. And also after Bishop IV, uh, Wesley, our tempo goes G7, G5, which was the, the other option. The other idea behind the move rook to e8 is inviting bishop f4. G5. Wow. Very committal. And, and uh, this is, of course, a huge game for Wesley in the ratings watch. Yes. Because there we can see Lali Reza Faruja. He is so far in the lead, 2761. But just five points behind him is Wesley So. And so a fantastic tournament for Wesley. We'll put him in contention for that rating spot for the candidates tournament. Any single victory by any of these players is worth five and uh, they could easily uh, bounce on the trampoline. Bishop f4, g5 on the board. Bishop g3 also played also already. very quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, just not necessarily an alert, but uh, just keeping an eye on the clocks. Wesley has more time than he started with. A clear <laughs> indication that he had this in his prep uh, coming into today's game, uh, Yeah, Jovi. absolutely. But I'm still a little bit surprised by G5. Me too. I mean, I've sat next to grandmasters for so long now, and right. the, every single one of them are very cautious about pushing pawns, whereas I'm normally quite gung-ho, and they're like, right. steady on, Yovi. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Rain it in. <laughs> you leave weak squares behind. And here, no, you know... No running of the balls <laughs> for you. <laughs> Bishop to G3. Okay, so... Uh, if I'm tr channeling my uh, inner uh, Wesley so there, uh, the line that... Um, rook d8 seems very logical here. Uh, right? Peter just gave, rook d8, and so I get in the, the, the tempo but now we of no, g5. Now we no longer play bishop d6. Though. We don't no. play bishop there d6. Is, there is a difference. I'm not entirely sure why we weren't doing it with the pawn on g7 and the bishop on f4, but in this position I think bishop c5 is stronger than bishop d6. Okay, okay, just a oh. second. And yeah. then... Uh, so C7... Uh, not, so not, hanging, not hanging... Not hanging... Knight B3? Though. Yeah, Knight B3 though. I guess maybe after Knight B3 we finally will play Bishop D6 because we did you create chased. a weakness... Yeah, we did create a weakness on a 5 for ourselves. Right. So driving the Knight away from the F5 square... It makes perfect be sense. ...before we uh, uh, trade the Bishops does seem, does seem to make sense. And this is manageable, mm -hmm. I, I would I would assume. And somehow the pawn on g5 gaining some space in these endings, the king might be perfectly happy mm -hmm. on f6. Uh, just mm -hmm. impressive, impressive. Just uh, th this position, rook d8. <sighs> Jeez, am I going to get one of those bishops of opposite color? Positions if it's, I play c3? It's possible. Yeah. I think we, once again we go bishop c5, we wait for you to decide whether you want to allow us to take on d4 or if, not. If I go b4? Yeah, that's I, the I'm bishops actually... of opposite color. Right. Uh, I think I am reasonably happily taking on d4 there. Yeah, that's that's what I think so too. Uh, question knight f5, bishop f8, or bishop c8, pardon me. Maybe take Bec on d1 first and then bishop c8. I don't know which you, one is cleaner. Yeah. yeah, you can decide it in a moment. Mm -hmm. Let's just say I'll, I'll go knight h6 and maybe I, I'm trying to head. Uh, okay, you can take on d1, let's say in this case, because f7 is yeah. also hanging. Takes, and takes. It's, it we will... attack the knight, it goes to g4. Right. And then I think black has two reasonably. I'm not even sure we're doing so poorly after bishop takes g4, but I'm a bit worried about that. But I don't have bishop e7. Bishop e7, with just covering. Yeah, with the intention of following it up with h5 and saying... Uh, go I'm away. going to f6 and we're going to go into another one of those yeah. bishops of opposite color ending and mm. uh, the Berlin Wall hold yet again. But I'm actually not convinced of what? by the opposite color bishop ending. That somebody that, that has That results something? if the knight were still on d4. Oh, you because mean I, back here? Yeah. So you, we're going to leave the knight on d4. We're going to do something. Some, something. Rook so d2. I, well, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't thinking that. I was thinking a b4 and then a4. Let's, let's try b4, yeah. Before, okay. Because it stops c65 as well. Yeah. So it does we'll, an additional job. We'll, we'll, we'll fall for whatever position yeah, you want. Just, I, I'm going to With the pawn? Yep. Keep, keep all the rooks on the board, please. <laughs> okay. Rook d5. Okay, uh, and I'll play on the light squares. a4. And, and I'll play king d7. 
and I wanted to go A5. I wanted you to take to feel the decision. Your wrath. <laughs> yeah. To feel the wrath. You see, this, <laughs> you see, <laughs> I haven't, haven't learned my lesson. You know, I'm still pushing pawns. Those, <laughs> the, 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 those uh, bishops of opposite color, uh, round, round one, was it? Round one games uh, weren't convincing. I will uh, say enough. that. King d7 looks very natural, but there was an option of playing a5 ourselves with black after a4. I, I wanted to encourage her to invest some time <laughs> in the, uh, you know, the advance. Uh, so, okay, I do have a dream. i uh, warn you in advance yeah, that my yeah. dream is I, to play I, with I, d8 I, and c5. You did make it very clear. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here I was thinking about, obviously, I have to defend the weak point, so I have to go f3. And I, I, I don't know. Well, I felt like here this are was... Are you happy, though, Joey? I'm very... Well, c5 is coming, so That's, probably I should have been a bit more yeah, careful. Yeah, you have to be a little... So maybe a, a4, a5 is a little but bit too quick. But I appreciated the passion. <laughs> I told you. Want to, you want to kill me. <laughs> like an idiot, These I keep falling <laughs> into the but, whole trap of pushing pawns. That, but by the way, that's the thing that's so insidious about the Berlin. You think you're chasing this initiative. You think you're pushing your pawns. And then at the end of these long variations, you suddenly have a weakness that you had to deal with. And it's sort of like, where did I go wrong? It's mm -hmm. very... It, 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 it's, it's a very, um, I want to say, spicy uh, uh, defense. Uh, and things can go wrong. I mean, uh, we see black winning these on those occasions when white overpresses, Peter. Absolutely. And yeah. uh, uh, things could, could actually get off the rails here for a falling year. But I don't think it's extremely likely from here. I think you do need to overpress. Hard. <laughs> Hard further down the line. Yeah. One thing that uh, interests me is uh, why is Wesley thinking? Because he clearly, well, up to g5, he was very much in book. And bishop g3 is by, Definitely far, book. <laughs> by far the most natural response to right. g5. M my feeling is he is trying to choose between the immediate bishop c5 and then uh, rook d8, yeah. or rook d8 followed by bishop c5, which are very similar in, uh, in spirit. Right. Uh, but yeah, let's let's leave this uh, sure. on, on simmer yeah. because okay, it's it's still a reasonably dry position, and we have uh, and leave it on simmer. <laughs> <laughs> Can we go and uh, check out the game between Levon Aronian and Ali this Reza? Was the because queen this was three. your yeah, I, I, I'm, specialty. I'm really curious what the modern engines uh, uh, and guess what? A7, A5, and G2, G3. So. A kind of a combination of a Catalan uh, mixed with a uh, Nimzo, queen b3, a7, a5. I always try to get in the move a2, a3 against uh, these, uh, because like I said, I, I enjoyed these positions where I felt it was nice to lure my opponent into putting his pawn on a4. A completely different approach by Lavon, I want to emphasize. G3, bishop b7, bishop g2, d7, d6. Uh, when I see that move, I see that as a clear intention of giving away the two bishops. Because, you know, you, the bishop is no longer going back to e7. Castles, knight d7, queen c2. Okay. Taking uh, the square e4 under control, I think we please? can infer from this that Levon probably disagrees with you about how good it is to allow but, the a3 yeah, a3. for locking down. Because for you sure. you already, after uh, knight bd7, have a very clear cut option of playing uh, a3, forcing this trade. Right. And the engine does suggest that a5, a4 is by far the best, best move in, position. in this position. Honestly, yeah. I'm a bit surprised you're a very sound positional player. <laughs> Thank <yesterday>. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and why, why are you so happy uh, leaving yourself with this structure on the queen side? is not immediately obvious to me. I would have thought this is not great, to be honest. Yeah, well, I was actually thinking that in these positions where I have the double pawns on on uh, c3 mm -hmm. and c4, so let's say queen c2, bishop c3, yeah. uh, bc3. You, I mean, you, in you, this case, you could take, you could play bishop e4, but yeah. Uh, so a4, sorry, mm -hmm. you could throw an a4, queen c2, even, even if oh, you So like. you were aiming for this structure? I was aiming for this structure where the pawn maybe would be happier on a uh, Yeah, uh, I, can, a I, can, seven, I can see, I can see the know. argument for that. Yeah. Uh, sometimes my opponents castle long, 
And when you put your pawn on a4, yeah, you're okay, not castling okay, long yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah, um, that, is, that is fair. But Levon clearly is uh, intending to uh, to shuffle for now. One thing that you need to sort of consider for black, I think, is I'm not sure it's a threat, but you do need to keep in mind that if you don't take on c3 for long enough, right, the knight might move yeah. away. You yeah, know? You, you might have to start calculating moves like knight a4, creating right. a threat of a2 and 3, and, and just capturing that bishop on b4. It generally, like if you play queen e7 here, we go knight a4. I'm pretty sure that uh, c5. Although d5, c5 is, is tricky, yeah. Uh, it plays bishop e4 first and then goes d5 and says this is completely fine though. Right. Because now after c5, black will have the option of playing c5, c5, yes. c4 here and then Rescuing the retreating bishop. with the bishop. Yeah. But it's, it's at least something that you need to be uh, on the lookout for. Exactly. And also, Levon perhaps is intending to play b3 first, and then he will play a3, because the, obviously the difference is uh, we no longer are uh, yeah, running into a4. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah mm -hmm. we, we, we don't have a straggler on b2 here, and this is a very pleasant structure on the queen side. Many, exactly. Uh, I would name, uh, in my mind, this structure and white winning is very much associated with the name of Vladimir Kramnik. But yes. Karpov also played a number of very, very nice games from the white side, but Kramnik beat Karpov in this structure <laughs> with white, which I think gives him the the, the supremacy. I, I beat Karpov this, this structure with white mm. as well in the yeah. Melody Amber uh, tournaments uh, uh, back in the day. Queen c2, b3, a3, bishop b2, very quiet play mm -hmm. by both sides, actually. Yeah, queen e7 already on the board, and we'll see if Levon agrees with this uh, uh, slow idea of b3, or if he perhaps has something else Hold in on, mind. Hold on, just a second. Ah, uh, knight b5, double threat of taking on c7 and a3, but bishop... Oh. And then I guess we go to 6d5 and we say this is now a pretty decent Catalan because you've been faffing about and I've been developing pieces <laughs> properly. I've been huffing and puffing, but there is knight c7, uh, rook goes, knight takes e6, and I get to play a3 trapping your bishop. So I've traded, what have I traded? I've traded off my a pawn for your f pawn. Mm -hmm. I and think uh, I think if we had better control of the central squares, I would like this quite a bit for white. For white? But the way it is, uh, bishop e4 is annoying, d6, d5 is an annoying threat. Annoying. And it feels like the problems we might have on the queen side here, C4 where black has a massive four. majority and also d6, d5 yeah. might increase that majority even further, uh, probably give black a comfortable position here. But yeah, yeah, it's yeah. A, I'm trading white's not quite pounds. ready with d5, right? Yeah. That's but the right. This, is, this, is a, this is a very cute idea, though, so we, I'm happy we've shown it on screen. Right. It's, it's kind of a desperado raid by exactly. the knight, followed, <laughs> followed by a2, a3. I'm but I sure. was always under the opinion, I'm trading my a pawn for the f7 pawn. Mm -hmm. It just so happens that's one of those rare cases where the open, uh, half open c-file gives you a And to, great and to play. Further, further justify your idea, after queen takes c6, a3, black is in trouble. Yeah, it's yeah. very important that f takes c6. Because right. here, if you play c5, everything gets low. First no, of all, I've got a dream. Yeah, yeah first of all, knight g5 wins on the spot. But even if it didn't, yes. locking this bishop down is, is hugely yeah, important. Yeah. yeah. So it's very specifically f takes c6. And then I think very, very specifically c5 and take with the c pawn. That nice. sort of refutes your idea. Otherwise, it would have been very interesting. And I bring you uh, less than glad tidings from our archangels. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when we left it, we did the leave MVL. MVL pondering. And wow. then, wow, like what's happened here? They just what happened hit, to the pieces? They just hit the vacuum clean button. And, and uh, Jan sighing. Dejectedly like, like, there at the board because I, I thought, mean, can how, I did, do? how did we get here? Let's, well, let's deal it was with bishop b3, it was d7, d6, and right here, mm -hmm. um, Peter has given us a very nice exposition of why we want to play h3, why we want to play bishop e3, what kind of setups are ideal for white. Uh, one thing we didn't look at is the most forcing series of captures, and this is actually, I've seen this. Uh, in, I, in multiple I, games. Exactly. I didn't even want to mention it because this entire sequence is extremely well known. Right. And I think it's extremely well known to give white absolutely nothing. And, right. Uh, MVL is one of the more ambitious players I know. Exactly. So I was discounting this completely. completely. I thought right. that no, there's no chance. almost no chance he ever does that. Right. But I guess he felt caught out enough in the opening. He felt he burned enough time to move nine. Well that he, he is gone for this endgame, which really is nothing at all. 
And once again, if you look at the clocks, it's a, a telltale. I mean, it's as big a red flag as you could possibly imagine. An hour 33 minutes for Jan, meaning he's gained three minutes on his clock with the 30 second increment for each movie he's made. He knows this backwards and forwards and for MVL. Something you just kind of, since he spent 30 minutes on a double-edged position, he wasn't ready to play those that, double-edged that, that, positions. That's how it feels. And perhaps this is yeah. also an opportunity for us to uh, sh show our viewers the curse graphic of their decisive result percentages. <laughs> uh, because... Uh, yeah, that one's been lost, I, uh, I Peter. I think we tore it up, <laughs> threw it in the rubbish. Yeah. We had enough of jinxing. <laughs> well, well, what happened for those of you who haven't joined us throughout our shows? As we started our Sync Phil Cup, boy, we came prepared. We had all of these marvelous stats explaining that what were the most decisive rounds of the nine rounds of the Sync Phil Cup in the past? Well. Funny, uh, surprisingly for me, it was rounds one and two. It was like 48% of yeah. uh, rounds one were decisive. And then decisive. round two was down to 39. Right, and then, and then, then it got know, progressive. And then it slowly got worse. Right. And then at the end, like round eight, which was our pick for the most decisive round, <laughs> right. it was 23 <laughs> like percent. And, it was way down. And, and the other stat, which we found uh, quite intriguing, and, uh, and here it we is. This is it out from the bin. This yeah. is uh, this is what we've been talking about, Jovi. This yeah. is because we said uh, sight unseen. We both picked round eight as the most decisive Absolutely. round, and we were so close. <laughs> <laughs> as you can see, yeah, we got it completely wrong. Completely. You know, with twenty three point seven percent, but it's absolutely staggering that. It, in previous Sinkfield Cup editions, 48.8% of round one games have finished decisively. I mean, that was just and then absolutely the, jaw-dropping. Then the uh, other uh, hand in glove with that was that seven of the nine winners of the Sinkfield Cup won their first round game. So winning the first round, so we were all ready to go. You know, round one, winners, look, looks what, draw, draw, draw. <laughs> Three rounds of and draws. <laughs> one thing that I wanted to bring up, though, and, uh, you, uh, you know, insight. For <laughs> way. Here to far unavailable to, 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 to anyone anywhere. Right. I, as a kind of an excuse for our tournament this year, yeah. we are playing four games instead of five per round. That's true. We so percentages should probably be lower, right? Because there's just a oh. smaller, smaller sample. So right. we, 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 have, we have excuses ready for players here. Outstanding. We need those excuses uh, in the bin. Uh, unfortunately, as we see MVL and Jan, uh, what I thought was going to be a marquee matchup is turning into uh, a fizzle. We can expect that game to uh, be drawn. I mean, the... okay, it's an Please. in game. It looks drawn. But it is, you know, there is an imbalance, the bishop against the knight, right. which should favor the bishop. Yep. I mean, can Nepom Niyashi play for more? Um, it's not inconceivable. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nicely done. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'm just not doesn't sure feel you like understand that, that word. <laughs> uh, it just doesn't feel like that one slight imbalance is going to be enough to make for uh, something serious, though, that's yeah. the problem. You're still smiling about the inconceivable. <laughs> Just we, an in joke. An insider's <laughs> joke. Uh, e e three, uh, e four. Well, weigh in on it. Uh, what yeah, do you think let's about take this a look. ending? Let's uh, take a look. Please, Honestly, please. I don't think black is even better uh, because uh, I think if we had the pawns on b six and a five, you, you could some. maybe make a bit more of an argument. But with these two pawns being uh, occupying the squares, uh, the color of your bishop, right. some potential play against them is possible. Oft also after e4, it, I think it's pretty much dead equal, but I, I want to say that long term, I think it's easier for black to make a mistake than it is to, uh, for, for white, because if we make a number of like really, really inaccurate moves, like we get here and then we continue doing nothing, okay, and we like, let's continue doing nothing, yeah, and and Whoop, we get here, and it, no. land, and it lands on c5. This is this is going to be really, really unpleasant. I wouldn't Borderline say loss. Yeah, loss. I wouldn't say loss, but it's really, really unpleasant for Black. True. Whereas, uh, 
I would struggle, in particular, now that MBL played e3, e4, which I think is completely correct, because you want your king on e3, you want the pawn on e5 to be slightly targetable. Okay. Because the bishop can't protect it, so you, you have to pay attention that you don't allow white to attack it with two pieces. Obviously, knight on f3 is easily balanced by the king on e6, but if white somehow attacks it with a rook, that could be mm. awkward. <laughs> yeah. So we've constructed this scenario. Yes, I made a bunch of really poor moves for black, but still, it's five moves down the line. And it shows what white can aspire mm -hmm. towards. Whereas, uh, if I wanted to construct a scenario like this, but in the other direction, right. I am not sure where do I start. Like, I'm pretty sure, first of all, the bishop goes along this diagonal yeah, sure. to be able to snap the knight on b3 if it lands there. Right. So I guess if we want to improve here, we play a5 and white doesn't play a4. So white, once again, starts making really questionable decisions, more questionable decisions. And we get to play c5. <sighs> yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. But, but still... I'm not so sure it's how... It's not a border, borderline yeah, yeah, losing yeah, like I, the I, other I, one. I, I'm not sure how I'm losing this with white still. Right. Yeah. I, un I understand it might become a bit... Like a4, a3 becomes playable with the intention of meeting ba with rook a8, and you are actually going to be uh, struggling, but you're not obliged to take. You can play b3. And yes, the pawn on a2 is vulnerable, but imagining the scenario where the black rook actually lands on the second rank is quite difficult. So I think... We begin by saying this is very, very uh, level, but we also say that it's, it's sort of easier to misplay with black. Mm. But I'm not expe expecting anyone to misplay anything, frankly, here. Uh, I think it's just going to be... <laughs> Uh, I, I, I like I, the I, fact that you pointed out the knight c5, the, the right, good knight, knight versus the bad bishop is a, bad bishop, is a, is a uh, good scenario. square for the knight. Brilliant. But I mean, the target on e5 is something that white can already start to do something. So for instance, you went king e2, but what happens if you were to go knight f3? Yeah, we can play king, king f6. f6. I don't think it's that much of a deal, yeah. We, we're still not in time for king e2 and rook no, f1. No, I was thinking move the king, move the king, and then f I. Worse comes to worse, Jovi. Yeah. I mean, rook f1, rook f1 becomes a threat, but much, much later on. So black uh, has, has the, the luxury of even spending two tempi on a5, a4, because I think... <laughs> Critically, after rook f1, we aren't actually threatening any particularly strong <laughs> discovered checks. So you can even munch on a2 and say, do your worst, you yeah. know. It's, uh, yeah, because after knight d4, the knight can munch on b5, d5, but, <laughs> but it's, it comes at the but cost of the beast. Yeah, right. It's not very much. Yeah. And another thing I will note is that very often I, I see how the engine plays this position. It does play a4 as yeah. white. And very often in reply, it actually just ruins, sort of, quote unquote, ruins your own structure by playing B A wow. and A five. Very wow. important that we have rook f eight check here because otherwise right. B four would be my, very strong. Right. But we have the unpinning check and then A takes B four. And the Draw. more pawns come off the board, the more we, the closer we get to absolute equality. Right. And the idea of B A and A five is very simply to play either bishop D seven followed by A five A four, or very simply rook A eight B eight and trade this one for this one. Once again, reducing mm -hmm. the material on the queen side. So not really expecting fireworks here. Bishop okay. B six king E two on the board in the meantime. I uh, didn't want to be a party pooper there with the uh, pawn structure, but with the king on f1, the last move, e4, it, it even crossed my mind that the move bishop c4 check is yeah, playable. I think it's playable, yeah. If you take on c4, okay. I don't think, we're, I don't think we're touching yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, because otherwise the rook goes to b8, and this rook ending doesn't feel mm. uh, dangerous <laughs> either. At this point, you pick up the king on f1 and abracadabra it to c1. The yeah. rook comes to d1. Long Castle. castles. <laughs> <laughs> right. Would be a legal move in Fisher. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Uh, thank you, Peter, thank for you. that. And we do have, after king e2, a5, a mm -hmm. move that you kind of just th threw out there flippantly, you know, knight f3, king f6, and you go a5, and... A4. We'll yeah. keep an eye on that one. I wanted to go back to uh, Wesley So for just a moment because I was more than curious. And he did come up with that whole scheme uh, of rook d8 and bishop c5. Uh, but in this particular case, Jovi, you were trying to play with the bishops of opposite color. Lanier did toss an e6 um, and mm -hmm. playing for that and line. Bishop c5 indeed played. Y yes. I mean, there is a lot of danger actually for Lanier in the sense that if he doesn't do something now. Concrete, yeah. Uh, and for instance, he plays like some careless moves like pawn takes pawn. The knight on d4 could find itself not doing a single thing on, on a exactly. bad circuit, no posts. And the bishops could just suddenly spring to life and 
Let's think about this for just a second, though. Okay, because I'm trying to upend Wesley's strategy with his move G5, and the only way I, I don't think the knight really does anything on B3, Jovi. No, I didn't so, think it did either. So with the knight coming to F3, at least in this case, um, yeah. rook takes D8 and knight takes G5 is a conceivable threat. And also bishop takes pawn, as you've highlighted. Exactly. So the only way to deal with all those is to play three, bishop, to D6. bishop to d6. Yeah, bishop to d6. And here is where I was having, you know, a conversation with myself about your bishops of opposite color. 95 check, right? Yeah, if you're if you have a quest <laughs> to play a bishops of opposite color position, maybe this yeah. could be something. But I mean, w is black obliged to go bishop no, takes knight? No, no, so no. for instance, I could go king after. <clears throat> I'm walking into it, yeah, but uh, okay, yeah. King F6 this is not my pieces. Right, very no good, attachment. very well said. I mean, importantly, uh, chess commentators, we always get the right to take our moves back, exactly. not like the players. Uh, King, King F6 is fine, G7 I think is a bit cleaner. There's no real reason for us to provide white with uh, uh, free Ideas checks. of Knight G4 check yeah. or something like King that. King G7 followed by C6, C5 is I think yeah. the first order of the day. And then, yes, optically, maybe it looks a bit better for white, but the bishop pair, okay. we have plenty of uh, files for the rooks. It Let, doesn't, uh, doesn't really strike me as something black will be very Let, worried about. C5. Let's have, let's have some fun. King okay. h2, c5, knight goes away. Give me your bishop pair. If you take on g3, I was planning to take with the king. And like seems, we said, you know, logical, those, yeah. uh, I'm a pawn up. <laughs> yeah. be, be proud of myself. Although I must admit, bishop g3, king g3 isn't by any means terrible or anything like that. No, I, th I think it's no. fine. I'm looking for better. Of I'm, course. I'm wondering if... Uh, king h2 ideas. I still like to... I don't, I don't think rook g8, knight c4 improves my situation a great deal. So I do want the bishop on b7 to be playing. So okay. let's go c5. Anyway. Once again, c5, uh, yeah. knight c4. I'm wondering if bishop f4 is anything I should be happy Ooh. about or not. Offering the same Ooh. trade, but on sort of on my terms. Yeah, but is the F pawn going to be a weakness? Exactly. This is what I couldn't decide in time. Yeah, I, I just want to, at the moment. Yeah, I did want to mention that this the, this option exists. Okay. Um, F3. Let me just ask you what you're doing, and I, I can take and play knight e5 on my next turn. I'm hoping. Yeah, king f6. King f6. For king now, F6. yeah, I want to deny you as many squares yes. as possible. And eventually I will be playing bishop d5, or perhaps even rook d4, yes. asking you to undouble more points. <laughs> and that actually is a very nice point, that uh, you're trading on your terms. Mm -hmm. uh, bringing my king into the g3 square would seem like a favorable market transaction for myself. Taking on f4, giving your pawn a little bit more dynamism, you're taking away the e3 square from my knight. And also, I am very much uh, fixing the structure on the king side. So as long as I don't lose this pawn on the four, you will, you will struggle to comfortably yeah. create a okay. passer on the king side. Well, this is quite far in. Please. But can mm -hmm. we go back to the game position? Okay. Because what happens if white tries to be incredibly forcing and actually plays pawn takes pawn first? Mm -hmm. uh, has that okay? And now mm -hmm. instead of king knight takes. f3, yes. I want to go knight f5, and I'm and, going uh, for four. the very simple knight uh, to h6 check. Fork and give and me your rook. Give me the rook, and I'm also King, looking... King G6, I think. King G6, King G6. G6. okay, yeah. I just wanted to make check, that point. D double check that that's the... You know, it was a game uh, yesterday, I think it was Ali Reza's uh, game against Lanier, where there was a knight on H5, and nerves of steel in the corner. <laughs> he yeah. went King G6, King takes H5, and said, you know, make my king, uh, and, and Peter... <laughs> Peter was very, very impressive. King g6 is a, is a move that he will uh, easily spot so long as there's no knight e7 yeah. check. This solves every single problem immediately Bishop because Sopopo's your only problem. real move here is knight e3, after which I will quite happily start simplifying. Even though c7 is sometimes weak in these positions, but... Bishops of opposite color yeah, positions. Takes, takes. Are, oh, but hang on a second. I have a pass pawn in the center. Don't be yeah. proud. No, I am going to be, be proud. Don't no. take away the small things in life. The little things <laughs> Don't in life. Don't kill the yeah. dream. Yeah. Right. And just go, just go rook g7 here, c5, bishop b4. And I don't know if I'm going to stop you. I'm going to go b4. 
B4. Yeah, I don't want you to play C5. You don't want me to play C5. Okay, so we'll go. Just because rook. you announced it, I'm I know. Sure I, exactly. I am not sure I would actually play B4 uh, in real life. But. I'm probably going to reroute the bishop mm -hmm. to D5, nonetheless, uh, with bishop to A6. I but concur. First, <laughs> <laughs> uh, spoken. I can no, catch does, me it, if you can. It does feel like white is. Well, again, the, the bishop. Better. Yeah, but the bishops about you. You you can give yourself solace that you do have a. Uh, morally speaking, a better structure. But those bishops of opposite color, I have seen black drawing positions where you're two pawns up on the yeah. king's side and you just can't break a blockade. So uh, this is the current position. We'll, uh, by the way, uh, Lanier, okay, Lanier, 51 minutes. Um, when we had let it, I think Wesley actually gained time on his clock. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is to say, he was above 130. He's now 123. Um, as we get ready for our very first break, uh, let's remind our viewers of our standings. And uh, yep. we're going to go on break and, soon. And uh, let's take a look at the standings after we round have a four. leader. We do have a leader. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday, Wesley So did defeat Richard Report. So that means he's now in the lead with two and a half points out of four. But there are a bunch of players there who have drawn all their games, so everything is completely even between them all. And uh, just to make a point that Jan Christoph Duda did withdraw after yes. round two, so that is why there is an imbalance of games. And also uh, today, we know that Bobby has a free day, but just because of that imbalance of the, you, you have a, in a nine round tournament, five whites, five, uh, four blacks, but it actually is turning out that Fabi, who is free today, is going to be playing three blacks in a row. That's quite a challenge when you have a field like this. It's like you're begging for a white yes. Jesus after three blacks in a row. We reached that point in our uh, broadcast where we have to check in our, our friends at QBoutiqueSTL.com. And we want to stay warm on the holidays, don't we? Who doesn't? Well, check it out. 2023 Singfield Cup socks. Socks, yes, sir, socks. We are proud to announce our new Singfield Cup socks. Sock up, get yours now. No, that's not what it says, by the way. I'm uh, ad-libbing as we go. Stay on the move with these custom logoed Singfield Cup socks. These full calf length polyester blood socks are comfortable and sporty. Great for the gym or the chessboard. One size fits most. <laughs> it's most <laughs> holiday discounts as well. It's unbelievable. I mean, yeah. this is this is unprecedented. Absolutely. It's inconceivable that we would offer a twenty percent holiday but yet shopping. We are twenty percent discount, which is available in store and online. So go to qbtstl.com and uh, get shopping for all your chess shopping needs. We're going to see you on the other side of the break. Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Lenya, welcome back to Grand Chess Tour. Thank uh, you. This time you are with the wild card uh, again for Singfield Cup. Uh, how does it feel to play in such a strong tournament? Yeah, it's always nice. I mean, I'm I'm always uh, happy to to be part of such a strong event, uh, especially the classical format, uh, which is my favorite. <laughs> it's a lot, it just allows me to to think, which is what I like. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it feels good to be here, even um, if not as a uh, main um, the participant, but uh, but to get the wild card, especially here in St. Louis, which is where I live for several years now, it's it's uh, definitely quite nice. Last year you made actually eight draws in the tournament. Yes. All the games finished in a draw, and it was absolutely unique result, I think, for you. Well, what do you think will happen this year? What are your expectations? Yeah, I'm hoping to have at least one decision. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, let's see how it goes. I mean, it's. Uh, it's super strong, obviously, and I consider my last year result to be good. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, in terms of the games, uh, I try to fight always. Uh, uh, doesn't matter so much the, the result, but uh, I was happy that I was 
uh, fighting and playing long games. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I hope this year it will it will be kind of better. Who do you think will be fighting for the top places in this tournament? Who is in the good shape? I think you were also following this whole, this rapid and blitz event. I really hope it's me. I don't know. <laughs> That's a good call. Yes. Who, who who will be your uh, competi competitors? Yeah, hard to say. I mean, um, Fabiano obviously. Uh, came on top after the Rabbit and Blitz. I mean, he was playing uh, really strong uh, the, the last few months, uh, but then he had a kind of like not such a strong finish at the Eyes of Man. Of course, you could think that he was playing lots of games and, and maybe he was a bit tired, but uh, he came back. So you never know. You have players like uh, Firuj and Nebo who are always uh, supposed to be on the top. So. Uh, yeah, very hard. I don't like to predict such things. I just like to try to use my chances and, and, and play my best. For sure. And actually, lately you showed really good performance in World Cup. Maybe you could even show a better one, but also second, tied for second place in US Chess Championship. Are you happy in general with how your career is developing at the moment? Yeah, I'm pretty happy. I mean, uh, of course, you always feel that you can do things better and that uh, and that you miss chances and so on but um, generally speaking I'm quite happy that I'm still able to play at this level uh, at my age I'm not uh, that young anymore uh, but I feel I feel good and um, happy that uh, I can still compete I feel as I said quite uh, quite good I'm uh, really hoping that I can uh, keep playing at this level for for I mean, for a long time, that's uh, in general my goal. So uh, let's see how it goes. Yeah. What about the preparation for this event? Who is helping you these days? Yeah, well, uh, uh, I'm working with uh, Vladimir Chuchelov for already a long time. Uh, uh, so he's helping me uh, for this event as well. Um, we did quite well, I think, in the last few tournaments. I mean, he was helping me also in the, in the World Cup and and uh, in the US Championship. Uh, so, yeah, I hope uh, uh, we can continue the, and even improve our, our results. Uh, you also live not far away from St. Louis Chess Club, as you mentioned before, that you live in St. Louis. Do you think this closeness to the chess club and also the fact that you live in the capital of American chess and now international even chess, I mean, makes it, I mean, has some impact on your chess life, chess career? Do you meet with people, chess players here? Yeah, well, it's definitely um, uh, nice to, to be here in St. Louis in general because you have a lot of uh, chess players, uh, all kind of things related to chess. It's a nice atmosphere for, for a chess player. Uh, so uh, the club has been very helpful, of course, uh, to have the support of uh, the club. It's, uh, it's been quite important in my career. And, uh, and that's probably one of the reasons that I was able to keep myself playing at a decent level in the last several years. Uh, but yeah, as I said before, it's also nice in general to be here because you uh, meet friends all the time, you get together, play uh, not, ch not only chess, but maybe some other sports, uh, do some other things. And, uh, and in terms of playing here, I think it has some pluses and minuses, obviously, like when you go away from home, you're I don't know, kind of more focus, less distractions. When you play in your home and uh, town, then it's, uh, of course, uh, you can have your, your friends and stuff uh, come in to cheer you up or uh, just to watch you play or give, uh, give some, uh, some confidence. But at the same time, it can be uh, an extra, uh, let's say, weight on your energy and, 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 and sometimes not good. But, I have played well in St. Louis traditionally, so um, yeah, I'm hoping that uh, I can keep doing. I remember your son was visiting the, yes. the playing hall last year. Actually, how is he doing? And he played also in the simultaneous exhibition. So yes. how is he, he doing? Is, is he still playing chess? Not so much. He kind of uh, <laughs> chose a different path for the moment, but he likes sports very much. He's playing tennis. And, but he follows chess uh, 100%. I mean, he knows all what's going on. Uh, he even uh, tried to tries to give me advice uh, all the time. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, as he's uh, uh, older, as he gets older, he uh, he understands uh, uh, better and better what's happening, and and that's also nice. That's great. Thank you so much for for the interview and all the best of luck for you in the tournament. Thank yeah. you.
Hello, I'm Women's Grandmaster Brigham Tokharjanova. I will be creating content for Grand Chess Tour. Follow us on social media and catch more behind the scenes content. The St. Louis Chess Club is the premier chess facility in the United States. We bring the educational benefits of chess to thousands of students across the St. Louis area. We also promote chess at the highest levels, hosting all levels of the U.S. championships as well as high-profile tournaments that attract the world's best players. Become a member and enjoy perks such as free classes and lectures, weekly tournaments, and so much more. Visit stlouischessclub.org to claim your membership today. Yeah, um, it's amazing what the club has done for chess in general because, I mean, it's already been 15 years and they've done countless uh, national championships, tournaments for juniors, helping around schools, and they've just grown the game so much across the United States. I think if I look at my own career and I look at American chess in general, we're in a much better place than we were 15 years ago. And so uh, the contributions have been immense. And of course, it's all thanks to uh, Dr. Gene Singfield and Rex Singfield. I would say that St. Louis Chess Club is like a rock in the ocean of chess. And we know that it's, uh, it's there. It is there, it will be there. I think it sends a hope that the game of chess will always stay afloat. By the mere fact of its, of its existence, I think it, 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 it sends positive waves across the globe. The World Chess Hall of Fame, located in the heart of St. Louis's historic Central West End. Want to know why chess has intrigued people around the world for nearly 1,500 years? Stop by and learn about the impact of chess from our three floors showcasing the art, culture, and history of the game. The World Chess Hall of Fame has something for everyone to enjoy. For more information on current exhibits, please visit worldchesshof.org. We are back with all of the chess action of round five in the Sinkfield Cup. And uh, well, let's remind ourselves of the standings so far after round four. And we do have a sole leader, Wesley So, with his victory over Richard Report yesterday, now jumps into the lead with two and a half points out of four. But half a point behind him, well, there are a cluster of players. And again, for those of you who've just joined us, let's remind ourselves of the round five pairings. Right. Dominguez faces off against Wesley So, Levon Aronian plays Ferrugia, Report Geary, and of course, Bakshi Lagrave against Jan Nepomniachtchi, and well, it's uh, always an action-filled round at the Singfield Cup. Of course. And we have talking about action, even more uh, exciting news because I'm very pleased to announce that we will be joined by the one and only former world champion Gary Kasparov. And, and that will be absolutely wonderful. I'm still fighting over the Cinco socks here. It's a <laughs> it's a battle for for equality on set. And trust me, Jovi is a is a fierce <laughs> competitor <laughs> where it's concerned. Let's jump into the chess. We have accusing me of stealing your socks. <laughs> no, no, no. I would never, never uh, venture that far. Uh, jump right in and tell us what where the action is, Peter. Uh, everywhere. Everywhere. Or, oh, Excellent. This position is, uh, differs from all the other positions of the rounds in that no pieces have been traded Everything's yet. on the board. <laughs> yeah, p p people, people are still fighting for, uh, sort of to determine what the structure will look like. This bishop probably will get traded for this knight sooner rather than later, I would assume, because uh, eventually you do have to start worrying about knight b5 knight or jumping. knight a4 followed by a2, a3. Uh, and this, the more the more we watch this game, the more it reminds me of all those uh, old Kramnik games. Although I think uh, Vladimir, his choice in this structure, I think very often was not g3 but e3 bishop e. So I think he mm -hmm. played them more often with the bishop developed towards this square. Right. But it, the, the one we have right now uh, is it's a very complicated line. position, uh, which I think promises a, a, a long fight. Our Berlin is... I just wanted to say, if yep. you don't mind, uh, for the current position, mm -hmm. uh, to my way of thinking, if, <clears throat> if it was my move as white, I see d4, d5 as a serious threat. Absolutely. If you put d5 on the board, and if you take uh, uh, 
on D5 with the pawn, let's just say, yeah. I have H4. knight H4. Yeah. Very, common, very, very important. Common idea, but exactly. very dangerous. Very effective. Using the spin also, it lands on a five right. with great force. And this is why I think it's important here for black to start with rook well, FE8. Well, that was what my question. If my move D4, D5 mm -hmm. is a threat, is d6, d5 a possible uh, way of meeting? I think it is, not? yeah. I, I think it's playable even though this might not be the structure that you're necessarily uh, so much Aspire. in favor of. Because you will have to also uh, I give, give up this bishop. Yeah, I want to recapture with the pawn though. Yeah, you, if, if you do this, you're opening yourself up potentially to some shenanigans to do with this bishop. I think we probably start with dc5. Yeah, I'll take that also with, with the hanging pawn. And if then, I can get yeah, away with yeah. it. Ah, knight a4, knight a, in particular knight a4 knight here a4 might be very, very unpleasant because a2, a3 already is a, My is a is, massive uh, threat. And you, you, and you, the bishop. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like my bishops. I know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very so, good. And an another thing to say about this, obviously knight takes d5 is completely unplayable because you do lose mm -hmm. your piece. Right. But the more interesting thing is bishop takes e3 right. would perhaps be somewhat playable if not for the fact that d5, d6. Nice also lures there. your queen to d6, which is not the best square in the world. And I wouldn't say this is so bad, but it's definitely a pleasant little edge for why these types of positions, I think, light square. Yeah. Yeah. they are almost the absolute most you get very often. The, the type of a structure where you have the two bishops, you have a very solid structure, some potential targets in the end games on the queen side. Fair. So you were about to say, instead of the move d5... I like rook f e8, specifically so that in this position, uh, we will have bishop takes e3 followed by queen takes queen e2. Takes so e2. it gives us a, a, an additional source but of play. rook f e8 is a very concealed idea. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the most easiest thing to spot. Not at all. And can we play that whole variation with knight b5 again and try to suggest the bishop on b4 is about to get tagged? Queen yeah, this is actually, knight b5 is a very serious move and I think uh, this might be a very valid reason not to play rook f8 because uh, on queen my screen C1. here we force queen c1 and then we just go c5 takes d4 no. and we say, you want this exchange? I be my guest. I was going to say yes, Jeffy. and then I, then I thought no. And, 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 and this is a very, very solid structure in the center. The bishop will quite safely drop back to c5. And even visually, it does look like you have enough compensation here. And in the meantime, yes, sir. Yes. You're, you're a mind reader. Uh-oh. D6, D5 has been played by Lireza specifically for those reasons. I'm pretty sure exa right. exactly the reasons Yasser was right. describing. Lireza was worried about the knight a4, about the d4, d5 threat. And he didn't like all the other ways of meeting those threats. So he goes with d5. But after she takes d5, he has... To answer the question, mm -hmm. what's your intention here? Yeah. Yeah. By the way, not that I'm proud of the move d5, because yes, you know what I do is after the show is I go over the games with an engine just to see how close my understanding was. And yesterday there was this game that was a very confounding game, Wesley So versus Richie Report. It was this King's Indian defense where there was a certain moment where both players were going back and forth. And I was saying, the one thing Wesley shouldn't do is play A4 to allow A5, B5, Knight B4. So, of course, I look at it with an engine, and the first move of the engine was A4. <laughs> the one move I said, don't play A4. The engine says, top move. Very good. D5, but that move D7, D5, D6, pardon me, yeah. that was really uh, annoying. It's, uh, uh, queen takes you 3 knight takes D5, and something like queen D2 is also actually a bit better for white, but I think D6 is slightly more precise. Right. But th the issue for Lereza here is annoying as those positions are, they might by this point be his best choice. Because if you go for this, whichever uh, mm -hmm. capture on c5 you choose, let's say you take on c5 with, the bishop. with the bishop, and then yeah. e3 followed by knight e2 f4, mm -hmm. there's also knight h4 f5 ideas here. This is, I think, quite clearly uh, not the best version of this type of position because uh, uh, white, I think, gets to make all the comfortable moves here unchallenged. Right. And if you if you take on c5 with the knight, you're also opening yourself up to uh, all kinds of things. Knight h4 knight here is, is quite uh, unpleasant and after queen e6. I mean, I'd be looking at knight f5. I would also be wondering if maybe I can bring the other one yeah. to d4, continuing to create the threat of uh, a3. Yeah. 
Seemingly, once again, uh, the, the, the heartless uh, <laughs> silicon suggests this is not entirely unplayable, but I would be very, very worried with black here. Uh, so maybe eventually you settle with bishop takes e3, but uh, Alireza is a very dynamic, uh, aggressive player in general, and for him, the idea of having, having to play this position will probably not bring a smile right. to his uh, face. Tears of joy. All right, we'll keep, uh, uh, keep that on the boil. In the meanwhile, I want to go to MVL versus Jan. That was an ending. Uh, the players are actually still kind of slow playing it. In my mind, I had already resolved that this game was going to be a draw. When we left it, we included the move A5 for Jan, A4 for MVL. Takes, takes. And the players have reached this position. You had shown... Uh, uh, Peter, a very nice this. idea for white to get a knight to c5. Why isn't black with his bishop happy? I think he is. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm also a bit interested in the decision to play c7, c6 here. Right. Because as I mentioned, this, was uh, this idea with, with the follow-up of a5, a4 and fixing the pawn on b2 seemed Not like bad. it would solve every single even it, potential issue on the spot. And I'm pretty sure Jan is aware of this. So I'm wondering if he thinks he can be better here. That was my I'm question. wondering if he, if he feels that uh, this is alive enough to actually try and ask some questions because mm -hmm. he feels that there's zero risk. And perhaps in this position in particular after A, B, C, B, you can play A5, A4, leaving white with this pawn on B2. Right. It's very unclear how, if ever, we will be able to attack, <laughs> to attack it with, with any piece. That's but, a different issue. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah. We, we, it, 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 it seemed curious to me that he didn't go BA4 here because I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely certain mm -hmm. he is aware that he could have basically equalized on the spot by playing BA, BA4, Bishop D7, A4, Rook B8. Mm -hmm. The entire queen side comes off and everybody is sort of satisfied. Maybe not happy, but satisfied. But uh, seriously speaking, I grew up uh, with the age of Bobby Fischer, uh, 1972 world champion, a lot of... Uh, people got caught up in the whole hoopla of chess. And this became known as the Fisher ending. Literally, Rook and Bishop versus Rook and Knight, probably because of the Mark Taimanov ma match, yeah. where he famously won with the Rook and Bishop against uh, Taimanov. And coaches in America, and probably for that matter around the world, have been saying for generations that a Rook and Knight are better than a Rook and Bishop when all the pawns you know, are on one side of the board. But when we have pawns on both flanks, the bishop is supposed to out uh, maneuver the knight. So after c6, after you get to this position, yeah. according to the coaches of America, black's for choice. I <laughs> That's all you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> but I just right, feel Jody? like white, black is the one that can press, right? Until you ask yourself the question exactly where you're supposed to press here. I think. Like, in, in more general terms, I absolutely agree with you. I, I agree with, with every word wholeheartedly. But uh, I think the white structure, we are, we are going to play 5 a oh, 4 because we need to free up the rook on a8. It needs to be doing something. So there will be this structure on the board, right? right. Well, and it's only I, black I, who can progress. Like, for instance, every, if you take it on a piece by piece kind of thing, the, the king can find itself on c5. That's keep not the, that. Keep the rook Sorry, the knight on d2 at bay. So rook you know, can also find itself on an open line. Rook f8 or rook d8. It, it, it feels like we, we are always going to have enough, uh, enough counterplay here with white. I mean, it, it plays a4, a3 here, and that does ask a question because I managed to put my pieces on such squares <laughs> yeah. that protecting c, c3 is <laughs> it might be awkward. More <laughs> awkward, more awkward than it, I would yeah. ideally wish. And even this position, uh, and this is what I wanted to bring up, is that the Weirdly, the pawn on e5, I think, is more vulnerable than the pawn on e4 with the bishop on e6, needing a lot of time to attack it, and the knight on f3 uh, occupying a very, very good square. And even, even a position like this, uh, with, the, with the active pieces for white, uh, seems, to be, seems to be fine. So I think a combination of it being very, very difficult for black to make progress in general, mm -hmm. and plus the fact that the pawn on e5, I think, is somewhat more vulnerable than the pawn on e4, 
I think you have to work here with white to be worse. Mm -hmm. It's not impossible. Everything is possible in life, but That's sure. True. I think you have to try but hard for white to, right. to, to go. And by try go. hard, do you mean like do nothing? Do like nothing for, for 10 moves, yeah. For, because, you know, I had a situation in my mind where if the Black King were allowed to get to C5, right. you know, you could actually sacrifice the pawn on E5 as, oh, as long as you're coming in. To... Exactly. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. So some line like this, you, you, yeah. can, you can very, very easily imagine. You see? Yeah, yeah, yeah Winning yeah. for black. Right, just winning. But, but yeah, not, not, going to happen, not going to happen. Not going to happen. MBL is not going to pass for five moves here. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not. Uh, a game we haven't really taken that uh, uh, deep a look at. Let's jump to uh, Richie and Anish Gary because I'm just seeing a move that I have to say um, is very confounding to my eyes. When we left it, uh, we left it in a position where d65 was played. Remember back here early and after 92 d5, yeah? So Richie got in this move a5, which is coming up right here. And the whole purpose behind this move a5 is literally to prevent b5 as well as b6. You never really want to uh, create a, a weakness. So I kind of mentally had put that aside. Like black is not yeah. playing b6. And knight, knight f6 is forced because queen b3 was a big idea. Uh, and knight f6, as you're saying, uh, another idea behind the move a5 is not to allow knight to c6 to a5, so as you were saying, Jovi, queen b3, nice, nice press, right? A nice press. So knight here takes, takes, queen a5, and I'm thinking to myself, the one thing black isn't supposed to do is to play the move b7, b6, because, you know, I, I'm trading on b6, and I'm opening up the a file for my rook, and woohoo, look at me go. And Peter, no. I mean, Anish, one of the world's top grandmasters, saying, I'm perfectly happy to, to uh, allow the pawn structure to change. It's, it's an interesting one. Uh, I, my initial reaction was similar, but for more concrete reasons even, because sure. I think if you allow black to play b6, b5 here, yes, there is a somewhat backward pawn on a6, but what b6 does is that it it completely removes the question of how we're going to for the rest of the game because the queen b3 is probably going to stay on b3 for a while. And be annoying. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we no longer have to worry about having the pawn <laughs> on b7, which we will have to dedicate a full piece to protecting. Because, right. I mean, yes, you can probably protect it with tactical means. I'm, I'm assuming that after queen d7 taking on b7, although it does take on b7, I was wondering if maybe we can play against the queen here somehow with some ideas of like Beautiful. removing removing all of our pieces yeah, from the sixth e rank and, yeah, yeah, and then bishop g3. attacking attacking it with a jump. Yes. but it seems to be working out for white. Okay, uh, but still, this very very deeply rooted idea that trading towards the center is good. Yeah, trading away from the center bad. Right, very bad. Right, <laughs> uh, but also uh, on a very very specific uh, specific note, I was worried about d3 d4. Right. Because the, the current setup with the rook on a6 being vulnerable to uh, uh, the rook on the, and the queen on b3, I thought e takes d4 is very obviously bad. Qu quite, quite bad. Yeah, There's <laughs> a lot of very vulnerable pieces along the, the sixth rank. We are threatening d4, d5. And currently, with the pawn still on b6, not on b5, and the pawn on a6 constantly, sorry, that's not the move I wanted to make, and the pawn on the six still uh, hanging. No, 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 no. We don't have very many pieces that can move, so without dropping something on the queen side. Right. And I thought, how are we meeting this with black? But both e5, e4, and even more upsettingly, a, a quiet move like bishop d6, c7, appear to be entirely playable. We've side, not sidestep, but we've created... Prevented d4 yeah. or d5 and covered pawn on b6. Covered the pawn on b6, we probably want to play something like queen d7 next, and then we will start threatening it, it takes d4. E5, e4 is something that is always in the air. Uh, and there's so, no kind of uh, point to like putting the knight on f5 in these type of positions? It gets, yes, it gets eventually kicked away, I think. We, it's, the knight on f5 in uh, Spanish slash Italian positions needs to be supported by having more pieces on the king side. Mm -hmm. And if your follow-up is something like knight h2, there's really nobody there. We can just kick it away quite comfortably. With the queen on f3 and the second knight on g3, right. we, yeah. would, we would be yeah. very happy here. Yeah, you but, know but, your but, classics, Jeremy. <laughs> but, but on its own, it doesn't seem to be generating enough of a, 
enough of a threat. I'm also, the, the more this position is on my screen, the more I am curious about the question of what is the other option? Why hasn't 8th XBC been played? Been played uh, it's hanging with a I think it has. It has. I, I, I think it I has. I think it will actually. be played. Uh, just uh, just a, now. Just yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now. And, and now since d4 is in a point, and you, as you highlighted, mm -hmm. that if you do go d4 and then knight f5, the knight is just hitting it mm -hmm. thinner. Well, but what, go happens, b3. what happens if you just jump in now? So, uh, you know, I have my idea of going queen a4. Swing the queen over yeah, to h4. It once again kicks it away immediately, but I wonder what happens if I... Ah, okay, here I, I blundered something. You blundered? You With the inclusion of b5 and d4, this is suddenly very, very dangerous for very specific reasons, though, because e5, e4 now loses the bishop takes h6, yeah. which is why we... And this, wow. it's very beautiful because we sacrifice one and then we uh, pile wow. on pile on the, the, the pawn on f7, and this is very, very dangerous for black. That was and a sudden even, attack. even more interestingly, after bishop c7, there's Same. this fantastic tactical blow of bishop f4. Once again, using the fact that there's a lot of pieces very on. loose on the sixth, uh, and e4, rook takes six is with curtains. queen takes and taking on c6 to come is very, very bad. So this is dangerous for black. But b5 is... I'll oh, pretend I saw all of that <laughs> when yeah. I suggested knight f5. Knight f5 is, is the linchpin of the entire combination. <laughs> yeah. Without it, it never would have it's, worked. Uh, <laughs> does, does look a bit like black is asleep on uh, uh, on the job there if you play b5 here. So knight e7 is, uh, is better. And, and, and there's no knight to d4 ideas? The mm. other one, the other one. Maybe we take on d4. That was a nice and, move, wasn't it? It is, it is. Oh, it is <laughs> but take on d4 and well, take then on f5. Right. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. I just want it to be flashy. Yeah. It, is, it is a very flashy idea. And if knight e7, I assume we have to take a slightly awkwardly with the rook. Oh, no, maybe we don't. I think we can maybe take with the queen because queen takes b6. I can finally lend my lend ah, my tactic. You can go e4. Yeah, I can bishop lend h2. my tactic with the idea of bishop h2 and rook takes b6. So you were waiting for that one. Mm, very much so. So this seems playable for black. My having exhausted the immediate tactical ideas, I want to say that maybe my dream transformation of this position for white would involve something like bishop b3, b5, and maybe knight e4. And in this dream world, black is somehow obliged to take. Right. And then maybe eventually I'll get the knight over to d5, or, or at least a rook. An abracadabra. And then maybe I will have some pressure even though uh, black probably gets starts first by bringing the knight over to c4, and it's not very clear. But another thing mm -hmm. to say here is that knight takes c4 is by no means forced. Mm -hmm. I think you can very easily just ignore my knight exactly. for quite some time. Exactly. A uh, quick question for you, Peter. In that line where you went d4, mm -hmm. bishop c7, mm -hmm. pause here for just a moment, because sure. we can capture a couple of times on e5 and try to make, like, say, d4 takes e5, knight mm -hmm. takes e5, knight takes e5. Or so knight d4. Or yeah. so knight d4. And then the idea was, is, isn't a6 of b6 a little bit vulnerable not, in this ending? Not particularly. Okay, not, you can, uh, after bishop takes, you can always yeah, yeah, f, bishop e3. What about f4? Yeah. Let's get rookie one. Hunting. Rookie one is oh, hanging. Oh, gosh. Hated it. Yeah, hated it, yeah. <laughs> but bishop e3... B5, oh, just simple chess. Yeah. And now a6 is doubly protected. This is a very nice rook on a6. Oh, but right. you still, now you can go bishop d4. Yeah, that, I'm obsessed with obsessed. that rook on e6. Yes. yes. Yeah. Hunt it down, Joby. <laughs> you can do it. The huntress. Well, okay, yeah. but this is this more is or less where I was aiming mm. for. The rook on a I'll throw in bishop takes f2 and claim that even this is maybe not very much. Really? But, uh, yeah, I, I understand where you're leading this towards. Yeah. Maybe, maybe b5 is a little bit well, less I, safe air. I we was thinking the rook things. on a1 gets into into play much more rapidly than the rook on a8, and then knight f5, and uh, who's cooking uh, on the king side. But, all right, uh, this is a little bit maybe better for uh, Richie. Let's... Uh, just jump around a little bit more as we, again, we're going to have a mm. very, very special guest. And Oh, please. We guessed it D6. correctly. We guessed yeah. it correctly. The whole line is on the board now after... Between uh, Levon after and, after and Reza. Yeah. Levon, Levon correctly played C takes D5 here. Bishop sure. takes C3 was the choice. I think a wise choice by Reza. But he will now have to defend this position, which is not bad by any stretch, but mm. is definitely much, much, much more pleasant to play for white.
the two bishops after bishop takes c3 mm -hmm. and, to, and break that down for us a little bit more because if I'm black and if I go bishop e4 and queen c6, I'm supposed to have, uh, you know, the light mm -hmm. square diagonal, you know, shutting down the bishop no. a little bit. Let's say I take. I have to take. Now, because of this battery, we have to take, take with the queen. queen yeah. It has to drop back to e7, I assume. Right. And it's now. Just the, I'm pretty sure Vlad. I'm bishop. pretty sure Vlad will play would play bishop one here, right? right? You, you, because honestly, I have a feeling I'm at least slightly better, even if I play knight d4. But I want to play for more. I want to play bishop f1. Right. Then I want to play knight d4. Then I want to play f3 and e4. And if the bishop returns to b7, it will be completely cut off by that uh, wall of pawns. And these positions, once again, it's. I'm not claiming this is panic stations, but right. this is so pleasant to play for white. The and for black, bishop, yeah. and for black, you are resigning yourself to a long defense where you really need to control all of the squares. You need to make sure that the knight never lands on c6. Exactly. You very much need to be mindful of this idea of f3 and b4 once the knight comes from, uh, from the f3 square. This is very, very pleasant for white. Absolutely. So Levon is going to be pleased with his uh, Sarawan attack. Yeah. And guess what? He took with the queen. Queen takes c3, not yeah, bishop takes also, c3. Yeah, also playable. I was wondering if, uh, if that made any I particular think, sense. I yeah. think you have it on move 14. Queen I know, but it's oh, uh, currently refusing to click on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. refusing. Yes, sir. It's refusing to pay attention to it. Yes, you, uh, you, you called this the Sarawan attack. Yeah. And, uh, well, according to this database, Don't du tell me. Duchamp. Variation. Duchamp? Yeah. The Marcel Duchamp, the artist. Yes. He played it. I should have studied his games as a kid. I knew. <laughs> I mean, I just studied his artwork. I didn't study his games. No, I, I, I'm sure it is more commonly known as this. <laughs> Thank you. That was very kind of you to say. Uh, we did have uh, a Bishops of Opposite Color outing uh, Jody yeah. in the Lanier Wesley game as uh, we've caught up with the players. Um, I would. Pardon? Yeah, you know, I, you know something. I once attended a lecture yes. by the Norwegian Grandmaster Jon Ludwig Hammer yes. on rooks and opposite color bishops. Yes. And he was entirely obsessed with them. And he kind of said one thing that's most important is if you're trying to eke out an advantage, right. what you've got to do is you've got to control the counterplay of your opponent. So, for instance, in this particular position, mm -hmm. um, you've got to stop this bishop on b7 from activating itself, even at the cost of uh, a pawns or something. So, for With instance, c6, c5. So, like c6, c5 is yeah. black's uh, attempts. And, yeah. and if you're on the side of the aggressor, he was saying that the most important thing is, first of all, don't think about the result, but instead construct the end game in terms of mini plans. Mm -hmm. So he said, you know, step one would be maybe improve the king, then improve the rooks, and then bearing in mind you've always got to lock down your opponent's activity and then break out. So, and ever since then, I've always been quite enthusiastic about rooks and opposite color bishops and in games. And mini plans. And uh, mini plans, and, I, and I feel like, okay, th this is something that one can play. And when I look at this position, I see a tail of two bishops. Yes. The bishop on e5, fantastic piece. And already, right. like, I'm jumping ahead in my mind. Roaring. And I'm like, look at what could happen if white were to get f4 and it was backed up by a rook and, you know, it would the be... The king on an open uh, exactly. highway. Exactly. And if you manage to contain black's activity, like, stop the rook coming to d d2 and stop the bishop from opening up, then it's like it feels like a serious advantage. No question about it. If uh, Wesley just sits still and allows the rooks to to aggress and the bishop on b7 to remain passive. Conversely, much to uh, uh, Jan's point, if you abracadabra, magically, transfer the bishop to d5, and then it's sort of like that bishop has a, its own wonderful vista of the board, you could imagine that equality isn't that far away. It's, it, but it really is white making something with his initiative here and now. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't do it really like in the immediacy, I think slowly, slowly, mm -hmm. they'll be uh, equalizing. I, I just have this uh, great story with uh, uh, Jan. Um, I was doing, a, with chess.com, we were doing the commentary and Danny Ranch uh, shouts down, so what is the Norwegian public thinking about 
this match? And, and Ludwig answers, well, I'll tell you what they're thinking because I told them what to think. It was me. <laughs> I've been telling the public, and this is what they think because I, they think whatever I think. And I thought it was just brilliant the way he said. I mean, not just an influencer, the entire Norwegian public was spoon-fed this, <laughs> this opinion of uh, Ludwig. And it just tickled my funny bone. I just thought it was so funny. I'll tell you what they think. <laughs> Rook E1. And, well, here he is. Um, well, it's my pleasure to introduce former world champion Gary Kasparov to the show. Hello, Gary. Gary, welcome. Hello, hi. Hi. What? Well, what's up today, Yasser? Yes, I wanted to ask you the same thing. How are you, Gary? What is up with you? What have you been doing? I'm, no, I'm fine. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm counting, counting decisive games <laughs> in the tournament. <laughs> So, you need so, one hand. Try, <laughs> try, tr trying to reach high five. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> nice. Uh, but, Gary, it's not through lack of effort. It's just no, that absolutely the, play not. the players actually, actually, are accurate. This is a very important point, you know. This is, the, this is what people very often don't understand. That it's, you know, it's, uh, it just shows that opponents are just, you know, are... Um, you know, deserve each other. So that's the, you look at the, at the computer score, so it's very often 98, 99, so that's, it's the, the precision. Yeah. Which means, you know, that's, they play good chess. They do. You know, and a lot, a lot of, actually, a lot of, it's, 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 it's bad, it's bad luck for, 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 um, for viewers, for, for the, for the audience. Right. Uh, because it ends up with, with, with draws and, and, and no blood is spilled. But again, you can't, you can't blame them for not trying. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, I've heard uh, the, some people on Twitter saying that it's, it's to do with a risk aversion, that the top players these days are just not inclined to take risks. Um, do you agree with that opinion? No. Now, can you be more specific? Because, again, t Twitter audience, you know, often, you know, just, you know, um, uh, it's comprised of chess fans and they're just looking for, you know, all romantic chess, you know, this fight blood all over the board now but could be more specific what kind of risk mm. so yes you can probably blame them for not you know playing um, very sharp openings uh okay uh, the only decisive game so far you know report play king's indian that's why in 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 a computer era that's already a decisive mistake <laughs> 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 so uh, uh but otherwise, again, they they try. They're trying. They're trying. Um, yeah, I again, how you can force players to do moves that are not recommended by the computer because they all prepare for machines, right. and um, it's you should blame probably the development of machines as much as the players' unwillingness to go against machines' advice. Right. Yeah. Well, today, for example, to the point that you were making, uh, Gary, uh, the game between MVL and Nepo, Nepo came and he played a very challenging, uh, risky defense with bishop c5, bishop a7, and tried to engage some sharp lines with his opponent, and the MVL just shut it down on move nine yeah, yes, yes, with sir, this d takes e5. Yes, 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 again, I, I'm... I'm, I'm out of professional chess, but I think I could recognize that eventually with uh, reverse moves order, they reached a famous theoretical position that was black bishop on a7. Yes. I mean, that was a very interesting idea because I think it just, you know, it neutralizes a4, white's main idea. It's the same position, but he, 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 he changed the move order and, and he got a bishop on a7 instead of b6. Right. That's yeah, and, and I think M MVL couldn't find any... Um, any uh, uh, anything wrong with this new um, structure? And he just took only five, which is totally you know it's uh, it's it's very innocuous. So you don't do it with bishop on b6. Right. Exactly. And so that's uh, that should be give credit. And Napo, you know, came up with a relatively simple idea. It's not that he's invented you know in a bicycle, <laughs> but still playing bishop c5 and then bishop c and then b5. Right. That's an interesting move order. Exactly. Uh, and it's, it's confused them with MVL. Gary, this is the uh, Synchro Cup. Obviously, it's the end of the 2023 tour. We'll be crowning a champion. It seems like one 
Fabiano Caruana has taken all of the mystery out of who's going to be the Grand Chess Tour champion. Your perspective as the organizer, it's your brainchild. How do you see this year? Are you satisfied with the Grand Chess Tour and uh, what it has evolved into? Look, I'm very happy with, with the fact that we're already here for so many years. Yeah. So when it started in 2015, it was, yes, you know, it's, uh, it's another try. And as we know, many tries in the world of chess, they just, you know, they show up a lot of promise uh, and then just, you know, lost, uh, lost all, um, all the excitement, you know, all the steam and run out. Right. Uh, um, uh, and... Uh, um, as of today, you know, I think the, that's um, we we could see that this is the most prestigious classical event in the world. So now we, we see even chess.com is covering it. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So and and uh, um, again, it's it's very important element now of the modern chess world because it's so easy to lose the connection between professional chess, uh, um, professional chess players, and classical chess. And I think uh, Singfield Cup and the whole Grand Chess Tour keeps it keeps this connection, mm -hmm. where we have classical, rapid, blitz, and um, and we have huge interest. So everybody wants to play. And um, um, okay, Magnus doesn't play the whole cycle, but he plays rapid, you know, right. and, and 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 blitz. So it's a, it's a major event, yeah. and uh, it has it has very two very strong sponsors on both sides of Atlantic, and and we will continue. And again, I think. Um, it's very promising given FIDE now recognize the importance because it's being included right. in, 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 in their very, very complex, com complex system of qualification. I still couldn't figure it out. But I know, <laughs> <laughs> but I know somehow this, this results are being, being, being counted. But as you said, you know, it's, um, it's unfortunate for, for chess fans, but it's, um, it's a very natural development of this year events because Fabiano was the, he was the most stable has more stable performance. Yeah. yeah, just every year, very, very solid. You know, just it's very impressive. Yeah. Because now it's just so easy to play one tournament well and then just, you know, you, you, you lose your interest or concentration. And again, he's no longer that young. So, we you know, by, 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 even by standards of this tournament. So, uh, but uh, his performance is, is quite impressive. And that's why, I mean, unless something very dramatic and negative to him happens mm -hmm. in the next few days, so we know the outcome. Exactly. And, uh, well, looking to the future, I mean, what do you hope to see for the next Grand Chess Tour in 2024? Look, I don't think we have to invent, you know, just something, something brand new. It's the model, if, if you know, if, it's, if, if, if the tap is, is, uh, ain't leaking, you know, you, should, you shouldn't <laughs> fix it. It's, it's, no. I think it's, 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 it's a working model, and um, I think that we will... Um, um, just you know, keep keep up with with what we already you know uh, developed. Uh, um, ideally, we would like probably to add one more event, so one more uh, a rapid rapid event, but it, it just to to increase number of players who could, who can participate. Right. The, the problem is that the FIDE calendar is so messy, and there's so many events. So that's why, you know, you don't want to over um, over to make players overwork. Exactly. So, uh, but. I would say that one more event, rapid, you know, it's event in somewhere in Europe, in Western Europe, probably, would be a good idea because you see now we have, you know, we have kind of a gap because we have uh, Eastern Europe and and the United States. So right. it's amazing that you know nothing happens, you know, between between Warsaw and, uh, and, and London. Right. Uh, I remember we had a wonderful event in Africa. I think it was a rapid and blitz event there, Gary. That. That extra event. That was a long, long time ago. Yeah, I mean, but it was, it was really, yeah, really nice. <laughs> it was really nice if you could revive that, Gary. Uh. Yeah, look, African <laughs> continent is a little bit now just, you know, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's a risky place for organizers because, uh, and sponsors because it's, uh, let's say, politically unstable. Um, uh, I think it will be difficult, right? I just have to be honest. But again, my first interest would be to do something in, in Western Europe. Gotcha. Still, you know, we have, you know, this this huge um, portion of the world of chess with so many registered players. Probably one, probably the highest number of registered players per, probably, but per per per, per capita. Right. So it's not having any any grand chess tour events. 
We had we had was a period we had events in in, in Paris. Yes. Now it's Leuven. it's no longer there. Yeah. London, Paris, and now Leuven. it's 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 a big empty spot on 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 our map. Exactly. Peter, join in the conversation. I know that you and Gary enjoy your Fisher Random Chess uh, <laughs> games together. Well, Gary tends to enjoy them more than I do. I, I don't think I've ever, I've ever achieved 50% in our training. So, uh, Yeah. So well, what's, what's happening today? Yes, exactly. Well, we unfortunately, MBL and Nepo... They have a very balanced position, this balanced ending, Rook and Bishop. I think this one is about to... even end as a, we speak, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In, a, in a repetition. So nothing's happening there. We think Levant... Oh, pardon me. Let's just uh, go to the game of Richie versus Anish. Again, pretty Pretty balanced. balanced. I, I wanted to ask Gary because I think uh, his opinion will be the definitive one on, on this as on many other positions. Just how much better does Gary think uh, Levon is? Yes, this is uh, that was also that 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 wasn't uh, the position. It was this one, uh, Gary. Uh, Bishop now on the board. Dark dark squared bishop for Levon against Ali Reza's knight on ah, c5. The, 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 the problem is, you know, the problem is since I'm watching it online, ah. so I'm, I'm few moves, I'm, I'm few I moves behind. I got you, there's a delay for you. Unless you're willing to, 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 to reveal the mystery, I think it's, just, it's, a, it's a problem. Because Sorry, I'm, Gary, we don't, I'm, if I'm, we're I'm, talking I'm fair move, play. I'm on move 12, I'm on move 12. You're, you're some way behind then. And yeah, yes, perhaps. I'm, I'm behind, I, I, I suspect I know what's happened. Probably, you know, was this is he took on C3 eventually, and it's. Uh, but again, I, I I can hardly you know give my um, my uh, my opinion because it's um you definitely have position probably at move 16 or 17 now. Okay, so uh, indeed you're right. Bishop B2 for White on move 12. D5. Yes. C takes D5. Bishop takes C3. C3. Bishop takes C3. No. D6. 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 Ah, D6. Ah, D6, yes. Into mezzo. Queen takes yeah. D6. Queen takes C3. Queen E7. D takes C5. Knight takes C5. So it's two bishops, but the bishop on B2 is, it's, it's, it's very nice diagonal. We like white, and, and since you've played so many matches with Karpov, you would have a, a very good feel for the advantage for white. How big is it this advantage in your in your mind? Yeah, but black black is very solid and uh, um, um, I'm thinking specifically of game twenty four in Spain, the one you had to win. Yes, but it's yes, but uh, it's uh, it's it was more about psychology than about the call of the position. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not, yeah. Um, keeping the pieces alive, yeah, keeping um, the position alive. I'm um, thinking now, um, maybe White should play something Queen E5. Me too. So shockingly, Levant's choice was Knight F3 to E5. Uh, but I agree, Queen E5 just keeping... Queen E5 was interesting because it keeps, you know, just black under pressure. And potentially you have something like knight h4 and knight f5, as I don't know if it works or not. Right. Because, for instance, my, after queen e5, if it's my move, I saw playing knight h4, bishop g2, knight f5. Probably and, winning. And knight takes g7 or knight h6. No, no, knight h6, queen, no, knight h6, queen takes f6. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Queen e5. <laughs> Let me just show uh, to, to our audience yes, how, we could, how we yes. could lose this in abracadabra in just a few moves with the black side. Uh, yeah, bishop d2 takes, knight f5. Knight f5, queen yes. b7, defending the bishop. Seven, knight, knight, eight, 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 six check. Oh, very nice. You know this one, Jovi. <laughs> yeah. You studied this as a young lady. <laughs> 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 and uh, there you go. So yeah, queen e5, a little bit surprising for us was the choice of Levon, which was knight e5. It's probably still better for white because, you know, it's the, then eventually pawn comes on their free and black is under pressure. But it's, uh, it's, it's unpleasant. But uh, I think queen e5 could be even more, more ambitious. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, more ambitious. 
Gary, uh, I, we, we, we talked a little bit uh, about the grand chess tour, the history, the future, but more specifically, your history. I saw you did a video series, uh, uh, Chess 24 with Gary uh, on the YouTube. It, it looks like a, a really marvelous interview that you had with Levitov. What uh, projects, chess projects, are you working on? Look, it's it's you know we finished the recording now, so that's just, I don't it's I think as the uh, the 17th or 18th, 18th series been released, um, and it was very it was memorable because I had to go throughout my early years and uh, and that's that all his suggestion. So we started it's just you know, the idea came up early, but eventually it's 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 you know it's happened after my mother passed away. So that's it's for her memory. So that's mm -hmm. because there's so many. Yeah, and events there are connected directly and indirectly to, to 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 the role she played in my life. Um, and uh, that's you know that's uh, that took almost two years of recording, wow. Um, wow. Uh, because he kept cutting it. So that's, otherwise it would be probably not 24, but it's just <laughs> 100, 100 hours. And the series, the the, the uh, um, and it's they they kept you know growing. And and every time you know I recorded something, I thought oh, I forgot this, I forgot that. So this is it's if I. If I uh, had to do it again now, so it would be probably again quite different because it's the um, there's still so many events that um, that I, I I wanted to include, but then just you think about it after after aftermath so that you already recorded this. Ah, yeah, I just forgot this one. For me, it's such a wonderful personal memoir, and it's just sort of like I would have loved every world champion from Alexander Alekine <laughs> to Manuel Lasker to uh, Bobby Fischer to have such uh, a personal uh, trip down your memory la lane as your career. Because personally, uh, uh, congratulations. I, I, I found thank it you. to be outstanding. And thank uh, you. Uh, no, just I, as you can thank guess, you. Now I, I'm doing much less chess than other things you know, mm -hmm. these days. So I. Um, yeah, I, I wish I had more time, uh, but I, it's, it's, we have different war games now in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gary, thank you so much for uh, joining you. us. And, uh, so I'll be back uh, at, at the, the last round, and of course I will be at the opening ceremony, at uh, the closing ceremony. Oh. Very good. Very we good. will. We we'll look be, forward yeah. to uh, seeing you then, and thank you. Very Thank much, you. Gary, for joining us. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. For those of you, again, who uh, just didn't understand the inner exchange I was having with Gary, on YouTube, there's a marvelous, marvelous series where Gary just talks in a very personal, easy, relaxed way about you know his whole career and his advancements. And as he just explained, the role that his mother played in his life and Fantastic. many, many people. And it's just a... It's such a personal accounting. It's just like an autobiography with video and audio and pictures. It's yeah. just fantastic. No, I, I love it when uh, the top players Do just that. easily just c convey what they're thinking and what right. they're feeling at the time. Because often we have this assumption that everything comes easily to them, but absolutely it's not the case whatsoever. <laughs> no. And I'm glad that you mentioned it because I had no. Yeah, uh, it was. It. So it, it, it's I, marvelous. Must, Do look it up. It's uh, must it's watch. definitely worthwhile, uh, Peter. Uh, Pick up the action, if you don't mind, please. Well, action for, for a given value of the word. Action, <laughs> when, when this game uh, is concerned, where uh, we left it somewhere here, and after knight of three, knight, uh, king of six, uh, rook f1, bishop c2, rook f4, as we mentioned, uh, yeah. MVL is reminding that the black, that he also has his own threats, and eventually Jan did choose a4, uh, a3, a3, which is very logical, but white has a number of ways to make pretty much an, an immediate draw here. Uh, shockingly, even this is completely, maybe not shockingly, but even this is completely fine, giving up the rule, the pawn c3 was check, but because pick, the picking, e5, up, draw picking draw. up the e5 pawn next. But what MVL did is even more practical. You play king d2, you say, if you want to give me an opportunity to give a discovered check, I'll put, a knight, I'll, I'll, I'll put a knight on a better square eventually, right. or you can repeat and we can uh, make a draw. We can make a draw. And for now, I think uh, Jan is still thinking. Uh, I think the current position is... Uh, rook, a, rook a to king e3, and he is wondering if maybe there's a better square on the a-file, which is gives it him something. something to just wait? Like, for instance, just to move the 
You can't really move so the king. So h6. Uh, h6. Yeah, I'm just thinking h6. If the rooks come off, it's just completely equal. You, you, without yeah. the rooks, and in particular without the backward pawn on b2, you, you, your plan of go, abandoning, <laughs> abandoning e5 <laughs> no. and charging towards b2, there's, no, there's nothing to charge towards anymore. So, Pull in a tiger it's, shop. Yeah, in, in, it's not there. <laughs> yeah. In this position, nobody really is going anywhere. No. The, right. the, the, the pieces will be tied to the protection of the e4 and the e5 pawns. Fair. It's just completely, completely equal. Okay. So, yeah. Jan is doing sort of due diligence here, checking if maybe rook a1 does something, but I think it's extremely unlikely that it does. Exactly. But there is plenty of play elsewhere. Uh, queen, queen e5 uh, is a very nice variation there shown by Gary, queen e5 with this uh, trick of knight h4, knight f5. But knight e5 is also extremely logical. As I said, black will need to control the c6. This is a very kind of a Catalan idea of just pushing for this dream of landing our knight on c6 eventually. Mm. Or even c4, considering the fact that the pawns oh, are not on b6 and uh, b7 and a7, yeah. uh, they are on these squares. If this knight goes to c4, there is a lot of pressure against the black structure. And uh, it's, it's actually quite, if we ask the, 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 the I, I would, this is somewhere where I feel very confident saying that I would assess this position even without the agent sort of correctly. But it feels that you have to play very, very precisely here not to be in trouble. After queen b7 check, which is probably the most natural move in the position, there's even a comfortable choice between king g1 and queen f3. Queen yeah. f3 would be mm -hmm. Ulf Anderson's uh, Absolutely, choice. Yeah. And uh, he he tortured many a grandmaster mm. on the white side of Absolutely. these cattle hands. Yeah. This, this really is quite quite unpleasant. Let's say you go knight d5, we go rook ac1, we follow it up with knight c4. Eventually, 2e4 will start becoming a threat. And of course, if you, uh, if you take on f3 first, yes. This is a very, very yeah. big target, and rook a c1, knight c4, knight c6, bishop d4 will become an issue. You pretty much never want to play a5, a4, because your knight gets kicked away. This is already potentially a, mm -hmm. a, a, a game-winning advantage. Yeah. Uh, so, Livon is enjoying himself here, clearly. In our Italian game between Richard Rapport and Anish Giri, after the trade on b6, bishop b3 was replied to with b5. Uh, Richard played rook e d1, which is a bit of a kind of a slow move. Soft. And bishop f8 is a very logical uh, mm -hmm. reply by Anish. And now he plays the move that I was advocating for this move, knight e4. Uh, as mentioned, black is pretty much never taking here. You don't right. actually have to react to this. Uh, you might think knight c5 is a threat, but I suspect that trade is not in white's favor at all. Right. So to a degree, I would maybe even be welcoming it. I can see on my screen that the top move currently, not by much, but the top move currently is knight d7, but I think that's more to do with the fact that you just want to uh, you know, play something, because black doesn't have very many options, but... Queen um, c7, queen, yeah, queen c7, queen, queen c8, but right. uh, the, the point I was kind of awkwardly thought, trying to make is that if you do play, if you pass, if you, you, complete, if you, if pass. you completely pass, I'm pretty sure knight c5 is just not a good move. Because in this position, suddenly this knight can come to g5, it can start aiming at the f4 square, the rook might suddenly uh, become shift. an attacking yeah. piece. So I, I would not be playing knight c5 anyway, uh, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever black chooses to do here. Seems like a reasonably balanced position, but there's plenty of play left, of course. Lots of pieces yeah. left on the board. Very good. I uh, wanted to jump in, uh, get your opinion, if you don't mind, on the game between Lanier and Wesley. Actually, nothing's happened. Oh, when we left it, yes, uh, uh, Am I wrong? It was a rookie <laughs> the one? The rook is on e3. It's coming to f3. This is like the mini plan in action. <laughs> the mini plan in action. It has, you're right. It, it, there, there is a, a rook lift, and yeah, I guess it. Wesley has gone into a deep tank. Okay, if I consider the move rook f3 a threat, then I have to say to myself, well, how do I stop the threat? Should I Actually, play king? Please. What I really, really want to play is the rook on a1 is not working. I need to bring it into the game. So Clear. I would want to play, be playing moves like f4 first. F4. Yes. And then rook I, I, there's F1. no subtlety with my play. And then, <laughs> then rook f1, uh, and then... <laughs> charge and uh, 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 hack, a, hack attack, <laughs> yes. if we will. Uh, I was looking, I thought your, I thought uh, Lanier's idea might have been to play uh, rook f3 check. So where I would be looking at as black is just to take away that possibility. Now here, uh, it, there's some little risks, some risks I'm taking by uh, creating a weakness on the C file. I, I don't really 
feel it, though. I, I, I do see the move rook d5. Now, shall we take a look at your f4? Yeah, okay, let's, let's, Let, let's have try. A look. Let's try it. Although I've, I've lost my enthusiasm for it once you've activated the bishop because, because of, of that f3. Move, yeah, because of that move rook d2, and it's sort of like, you know, I, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of like it's an no, awkward no, no, I, question. I, 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 yeah, F4 yeah. was very <laughs> specific to right. the bishop being trapped. Exactly, in. exactly. Um, Again, we, 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 we're learning that bishop endings, uh, b b opposite color bishops are, are, are too balanced. Uh, is this one of those cases, Peter? Okay. Well, you can go rook c1, right? Rook c1, yeah. Yeah, uh, interestingly, uh, c5 is currently machine's best choice because it feels that if you don't do it immediately, you might actually start running into some trouble on the yeah, king side. Yeah, see, see. Rook I a 3 check is a, is a viable <laughs> threat. And after, after king g6, there is also this very annoying idea of rook g3 followed by f4. And oh. you are, considering how poorly placed the black pieces are, you can actually safely place it on g4. Mm -hmm. Because the f4. bishop cannot attack it quickly enough to stop f4, f4. from happening. Gotcha. And this is starting to enter territory where you will be worried. Right. So c5 is the suggestion. But interestingly, after d takes c5, uh, the engine says, I'm sort of better off not even creating those weaknesses and accepting I will be a pawn down and playing some position like CBAB and uh, now I want to play rook, rook GE7 yeah. and start trading everything Every, down, right. down the E-file. And that seems manageable, but that already I think is an indication that something has gone somewhat wrong. Because sour, if we yeah. go back, if, if we go back here and we look at this position after C3, uh, bishop takes EF, king F7, and C takes D4, I was sort of fully expecting uh, a draw. Uh, Wesley to no, not, 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 not a draw as such, but th that Wesley will not have any issues at all equalizing. Uh, but he probably missed, missed the boat somewhere because uh, it seems that the engine, uh, somewhere on this position, it plays much more actively for the C6, C65 break. For instance, it starts with rook e8, and immediately move. creating the idea of C65. Mm -hmm. right. If you play rook e1 as you've done in the game, I have the move rook d5. And again, Once again, re-establishing the idea of 65 prior to you being able to play f4. And this seems completely fine for, for, for black because right. you, there's really no good way of stopping c5 from happening. And Wesley burned only one tempo on a move that seems very logical, improving your position here a little bit, you know, connecting, mm -hmm. you know, getting your pawns slightly more, slightly more together. But now, you just missed now you're not in time with your counterplay, and mm -hmm. the bishop remains rooted uh, to oh, the pawn on d4 five. for long enough for Wesley now to have to play c5, and c5, d5 is now on the board. Right. In a, in a way that definitely gives white chances. I suspect draw is still massively favored. Right. But this is definitely no longer a, a, a foregone conclusion. Can we play rook d5, by the way? For a second yes. there, I thought I found a very good, good version of this, but very importantly, there's rook f3 check. My plan was to meet this with rook d2 and claim that I am immediate, no problem. immediately completely but fine. You, you can also play rook c1 in this one. I know. Uh, rook, rook, or, rook, or even rook c5, rook c2, frankly, but I liked immediately attacking stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and uh, if you go rook a1, of course, I will take on c5 and I will be uh, instantly completely fine. There's but no longer rook this f3 check. check is very yeah. serious. But rook f3 check is uh, is a very very serious possibility. You have to right. go to g8 because otherwise rook f6 will also come in. Right. And now the machine goes bishop c3, and if you take with the rook, it goes rook f6, and this is what you want to avoid. Right. Mm -hmm. Because your king is so unsafe here compared to the very, very snug king on, uh, on g1 right. that you will have significant problems equalizing this. Perhaps you just don't equalize anymore. Right. Well, yeah. We have a move. Uh, yeah, he played c5 and then he played king, he g6, played king g6, interestingly. Somewhat similar. If you're going to mm -hmm. go rook c1, I may play rook e6 and I just stopping c6. Mm -hmm. and, uh, basically, I'm playing a pawn down, but very much uh, Wesley just wants to trade the rooks on the e file. But and uh, well, your extra pawn is the pawn on f2. But it it is. Is. is it so easy? I mean, no. It's not an easy rook draw. Rook c1 is coming. Not right? anymore. Rook c1 is rook a very C1, decent move. The machine rook also C6. goes rook a1 with the intention, once again, Ivanka's uh, Yvon favorite bishop on c3, <laughs> yeah. which is very, very strong here, right. by the way, covering many, many important things. <laughs> right. Uh, so, no, this is now, uh, this will be a, a lot of suffering, it feels, for Wesley, because I think Linier is also exactly the person to give this. As, uh, as why suffering, uh, yeah, out of this field, I think uh, Linier is one of the joy. least 
least pleasant opponents in this particular scenario. I think the least fav favorite opponent, if I had to pick somebody I would absolutely not want to play this with black against, that would actually be Wesley. Wesley. <laughs> but he's playing black he's himself. Playing black. So, so uh, that's not available. But uh, outside of Wesley specifically, I think Linier is very near the top of the list. So our tournament leader suffering at the moment, a pawn down and a bishops of opposite oh. uh, color uh, ending, late middle game. King g6 on the board, and you were about to say whoop. I we just went whoop because I, I went and turned my attention and to the, the game between Maxime Vachelagraf and Johanna Pomerashi, and I'm thinking... Who is right? <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Somebody uh, left the peshki hanging. Uh, let's see, we left it at King d2. There was a, an expectation of a repetition with rook, rook a2. Would continue either checking or attacking the pawn King on c3. e6. Uh, Jan saying, I'm sorry, I would like to continue the game. And what is his idea? B4 and rook d3 check? Mm -hmm. King c5, b4? I think, sadly, sadly for Jan, I mean, he's still not risking anything whatsoever. The same repetition is very much still on tap. White has no, no way to avoid repeating the moves if you go rook a2, rook a3 forever. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't see how you make improvements. I think... Uh, like, once again, an ideal scenario here, if we want to paint a picture, we go king c5, white right. does something completely irrelevant. We go b4, yes. c4, king and d4. And this was the picture. Yeah, yeah, this is the picture. And we claim this is made. We're but not the sure. But, but the thing, <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, as I now realize, this is the perfect defense against Rook and Bishop. Rook and Bishop, Bishop the, the, the second rank defense. We have the setup. Yes. We have oh, no, 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 but wait one second. We have the technology. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. That yes. defense is very much based on a stalemate. On a stalemate, right. And you ain't going to get a stalemate here. Well, no, that's because I got a knight. But, but, but I have more, more people coming in, you know. Right. We have friends coming in to, to help out. Right. And the, the defense we're talking about here is uh, we, we, keep, uh, we keep our pieces in this shape. And it seems like we're being driven to the back rank and then getting mated with something like king e3. But, but in fact, we're, immedi we're immediately attacking the rook on a2. Of course, black having sacrificed two pawns cannot afford to trade rooks, so check. And we go back, and once again, the black king cannot enter. Right. And knight a3 is coming very quickly, so it seems like it's time to take a perpetual once again. Right. So I think Jan is sort of has to be applauded for trying to you know, scare MVL into some <laughs> indiscretions. But this setup is so sturdy that uh, eventually he will just nod to himself and just go rook a2, rook a3. And, right. and uh, the uh, point is that MVL himself cannot become too ambitious. After the move, knight takes h7, rook a2 check, king e3. Rook, rook a3. a3. You can't be ambitious with white by playing rook c2. That would Aren't be... I pawn up? Well, that after would be b4, a bit of a, yeah. king d2. King d2. B3, B3. Uh -huh. this is the Not most dangerous. This one, yeah, so. No, no, this is a very, very dangerous pawn, this uh, passer on B3. So there's no way MVL is going to uh, push yeah. his and luck in this Rook A2 line. check is on the board, so perhaps we could switch to that camera because I think that, that We're might about to be... see a repetition. Yeah, yeah that might be an indication that the game is coming to a close. And, yep, wow. King D2 played without hesitation. What can I tell you guys? My, my pick was a pawn up and he couldn't win. <laughs> you were very fortunate uh, with your pick that uh, yes, we, you were we, a pawn we, behind. And, uh, yeah, Jan, Jan saved this game by the skin of his, his teeth. teeth. Yeah, yes. absolutely by the skin of his teeth here. Yeah. Exactly. Only repeats once for now, I guess he... Well, Feels he's got like, 52 minutes. Yeah. He's built up quite a margin. And the Blues, I don't think, are playing today. So there's, no. there's nowhere he needs to be. Exactly. Although, I mean, this is college football game in America. I mean, not uh, necessarily ice hockey. No, ice hockey is very big in uh, Russia. But, uh, yeah, this position looks like it's heading for a draw. I guess we'll just keep uh, a close watch on that one because that will be our first result of the day, uh, going to the game of Richie Rapport and mm -hmm. Anish Giri because it just seems, sorry, uh, we, but we, Richie's we, making some backwards looking Are we moves. losing this game as well? That would no, be very unfortunate. No, 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 I think we just, with the move knight f6, we've seen a draw offer actually. It is, yeah, and yeah. they've already done this twice. With if he goes e3, bishop e3, uh, that will be a third. Uh, uh, Anish can claim, 
And there really isn't a better move than Bishop e3 in this position, sadly. We might be losing, well, D3 we might be losing on, another board. Yes. And again, uh, we're keeping a very careful eye on Anish Giri, Wesley So, and Ali Reza, because those three players are in a hotly contested fight for the top rating spot. And let's just jump to the game of Levon and Ali Reza for a moment, because mm -hmm. we did have pretty much the queen b7 check, queen f3 variation you mm -hmm. were mentioning, Peter, but not after knight queen d5. Of, yeah, after queen f3, Ali Reza made a kind of a optically uh, aggressive move, knight f6, c4, but I like, I like the response of bishop d4. And now, there are very serious issues for black because I think there's a, it, it might sound strange, but there's a very strong positional threat of just taking on c5 and taking on h7. h6, show us. Yeah, let's say h6, we just, I think we can go in already. Yeah. Okay. Knight c5, queen b7, knight b7. And this is just a Catalan endgame, which I think is universally, first of all, we're losing a pawn by force. Oops. But even if we weren't, even if, if let's say I make a slightly softer move here, like rook c1. Not bad. People have won so many of these, <laughs> and, and Ulf, uh, Ulf Andersen specifically, oh the name that uh, Yasser has already mentioned during this broadcast, he's won so many of these. Uh, this is just very, very dangerous for black because uh, mm. the, the weaknesses are uh, very vulnerable and you're losing control of so many squares. Mm. Uh, and the, the same applies, just, just for relevance, the same applies even to this position, and this is obviously a much stronger move than h6. And yet still, you can go knight d7 here, provoke b5, go rook a c1. Yeah. If rook c8, we will uh, knight e5 immediately or knight b6. Knight e5 is the strongest here, according to the engine. And you start losing control of your queen side. The, totally. rooks, the rooks start actually uh, in uh, penetrating into the black position. And this is very often just completely unholdable. By the right? way, sorry to interrupt, it is a repetition of moves mm. in the Nepomniachtchi Maximiliachtchi-Grav game. Uh, ah, a little shaky because he played king c5 there, so I thought maybe he wasn't repeating, but he is repeating again. Mm -hmm. I think we might have a... They're racing, they're racing to be the first game to finish, I think, the, the rapport Giri game in this one. It's are. close. It is very close. It's <laughs> going to be a photo finish. Yeah. <laughs> All right, but uh, specifically what you're saying about the Levon Aronian game, uh, if you're telling me this ending is, you know, all play on one goal after bishop d4, what on earth is Ali Reza going to do to prevent uh, what looks to be a disastrous I'm not ending? I'm not sure. I think very, very disappointingly for, for Ali Reza and his uh, many, yeah. many Legions. fans, yeah. rook fd8 is maybe the best option I, here, I, and it really isn't very attractive at all. I, I mean, could you be looking at doing, after rook to fd8, bishop takes knight, rather than stepping back with the knight, upon which you said, yeah, I'm thinking you, t you capture with the b pawn, right. and at least you have ideas of a5, a4 in the position, you know, once you've <laughs> solidified I everything. The, 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 the small problem is this, there's this pin on this. This um, often diagonal. returns to g3, this rook lifts to c4. This yeah, is also so going easy. to be... I understand that, but is but there any way... But it's better than losing an ending that's right. I mean, is there, goal. I, mean, I mean, I was just looking at Whoa, ways to generate agreed. activity and... F5 on the board. Wow. Which uh, uh, might, just be, might just be losing now, because after bishop takes c5, you now absolutely have to take with the pawn, knight c5, just straight up loses the pawn mm -hmm. on b6, just as, as we're, we're showing, the, takes, the, takes, this fork. takes, takes, and knight g7, and this is just over. Yeah. Yeah, it's only one pawn, but also white is better everywhere. It's not, <laughs> right. it's not just... <laughs> pawn <it's> not <laughs> just <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, so And uh, sorry to yeah. interrupt you, but uh, there draw. we do see the game finish in a it, draw between Maxime Vasher de Graaf and Jan Napomniachtchi. So both players now move on to the free day. Yeah. Uh, so you, you have to take the b pawn, and then the rook uh, comes in, and and this is now uh, absolutely terrifying. Yeah, terrifying. You have to probably play something like queen b8 to at least try and kick away the knight from e5. Rook? It goes it goes to c4, and then like if if white establishes the rook on if if the rook on d7 is not immediately chased away, you will probably having having played f7 f5 as well, you'll just get mated on the king side. And uh, I, I don't know, this it looks horrible. It looks, hor it looks horrible. Like rook a7, for instance, uh, we can take and then play queen e3, and the threat of f2, f3, you've created so many weaknesses in your position that honestly, this feels like white will have a choice of which one to win. Exactly. a5 is hanging in every single variation, e6 is now a very, very big 
uh, weakness as well. C5 is constantly weak. Uh, it's an equal material position in which the engine currently says plus 2.5. Uh, rook a7 is a mistake, but comp like best move is a4, but then we will double on the d file, and eventually I will start playing queen e3 and f3, and even though we've you know traded off one weakness, mm -hmm. the difference in king safety, the difference in peace activity, the difference in just about everything else mm -hmm. makes this, I would assume, an indefensible position against good play. As I, well, as yeah, my I trainer Nikolai uh, Minev would say, complete ca catastrophe. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I love the idea of Queen E3. And, and the race was close, but in not the too end, far behind no. was uh, Also Richie a draw between Richard Rapport and Anish. But this is a disaster. F5, Bishop take... Uh, pardon me, Peter, just to really put the mm -hmm. mood in. Bishop takes E5, B takes E5, Rook to D7, as we see the two players there... Uh, Kings are in the center, yes. I just wanted to, yeah, to make sure, sure that the diagram is on the screen, yeah. Exactly. So, so and rook, rook d7, queen c8, or what did you play last I played time? queen b8, I yeah, think. Yeah, that's, that's fine, queen mm -hmm. b8. Knight c6? Also pretty good, but... Queen e8, rook d1, oh, there's, queen there's, b5. There's queen b5, and Sorry. you're forced to put the knight on that the 7. That was not the intention. And that's no. really not what you wanted. No, I think that, c4 that's is just harmony. such a beautiful square. Yeah, that's not the uh, harmony you wanted. I mean, Livon understandably is now pausing because the position now looks so beautiful that he's it's, probably asking himself, do I have better? Yeah. Because he will be aware of bishop c5, rook d7. It's yeah. not really a difficult idea to find. No. But he's asking himself, will black have... An like a, a, move. a good thing to do in response to rook ac1, right. maybe I can improve it. But the thing is, in the lines we were discussing, it really isn't going to c1 anyway, it goes to Double d1. So rooks. there's no particular reason, I don't think, to give black a tempo to play something, okay. even though I don't know what that something is. Right. This is still very, very good for white. And in terms of something that we were discussing before we had all these breaking news, uh, the rating spot. Yes. Alirez is ahead. Yes. But Not he, but, anymore. But, but he is struggling. But the right. person person chasing him the closest Wesley. is also not having a particularly good day. Which means so a the, niche. Mm, the two remaining games are uh, both of our rating spot leaders are in str trouble. struggling with black pieces. So we, we could have a really strange situation where both of them actually lose rating points. Right. And it becomes... The distance between them stays the same, but they both get a lot closer to an ish. <laughs> so it, it, it very much becomes a three-horse race in that case. And if Linier wins, we keep on not mentioning Linier in that context, right. but if we imagine Linier winning this game and also Lev winning this game, Linier gets very close to this group. How he, close is Linier? Well, he was around 46.5, I was told. 46.5. So he'll and be on 51. Okay, he needs to get to the mid 50s, though. Yeah, but he'll be on he'll be on 51. Right. Uh, Ali Reza will be on 56, and Wesley will drop back to 51 as well. So it will mm -hmm. be Ali Reza, Anish, and then Linier and Wesley tied or almost yeah. tied on wow. on third. The plot uh, sickens, and uh, in the meanwhile, let's just take a look at the results yes, thus far. Yes, we have uh, had two games finish. It was a draw between Richard Rapport, Anish Giri, and Maxime Vashilagrov against Jan Napomniachi. And just to remind everyone that because Jan Krzysztof Duda well, withdrew from the event in round two, Fabiana Caruana does get a bye. But still, very much everything to play for in the games mm -hmm. between Dominguez and So and an exercise in suffering, I would say, for Ali Reza Faruja in his game against Levon Aronian. Exactly. Well, uh, I, again, just looking at the positions that we saw with Ali Reza's uh, F7, F5, uh, trying to understand what um, precipitated that uh, decision. It was just that he felt that these endings must have been absolutely dreadful. That must have, I, that's the only thing I can Well, imagine. sometimes, you know, you consider all the alternatives, you think, you think, and you just can't see anything satisfactory. Mm -hmm. And then you lash out and play a random move. And mm -hmm. perhaps this is F5, because it does seem very weakening. And indeed, Levon does have a forcing line at his disposal. Bishop takes knight. Bishop takes c5. Again, we're talking about these endings, and in this particular case, it's simply a fork. Uh, cost you a pawn. It's not just that you lose a pawn, it's that you get no compensation for it, and this loss of this pawn on b6 gives white an extra pawn as well 
as the attack compensation. So mm -hmm. we've been looking at B takes. Rook to D7, thank you for the support of the knight. Rook to D7, Queen B8, attacking the knight. I guess the one trap in the position you don't want to fall for is white. Defend the knight and allow G5. That's not good. But you play knight to C4, and this position is just so bad on so many levels. You've got weaknesses galore, and white's play is so simple. Rook to D1, and just start exploiting the weaknesses. I Queen, Queen E3, F3. E3. I was... Also going to ask the question, I mean, how critical is queen e3 and f3 to white's attack? It's, I think there's just too many good ways of playing the position. In fact, I think queen e3 and f3 is probably uh, the best way of playing the position. But if you, want, if you wanted me to play queen f4 and try to trade queens, I wouldn't be averse to that one either. So, so long as I keep a rook yeah, on no, the Yeah, no, because I'm just trying to think of what yeah. Ali Reza could have missed. That's what I'm trying to understand. It came earlier. It yeah. came earlier. This oh, is terrible. Uh, my guess is a five is, is not a blunder as such. It's just a decision of somebody who is desperately unhappy with his position and sort of flailing for something to disbalance it, for something to kind of make Lev deviate from a very kind of a straightforward conversion. Mm -hmm. uh, the position wasn't yet, I think knight f4 is really where it started going mm -hmm. wrong. I think the engine says after knight d5, yes, it's still very unpleasant, but it's manageable to a mm -hmm. degree. And knight f4 was a kind of a lure. It, it looks optically like a more active move. It looks also uh, like a good Cutting idea to scores. connect your knight so that against bishop d4 you have things protected. But in fact, the point that now you are constantly having to calculate these endgames where bishop c5 followed by queen b7 misplaces your very active knight on the four completely on the b7 square. That, well, Lev didn't, didn't do any of the two things we were expecting. He just played knight c4 here, which is still giving him a reasonably big advantage, but that's a... Shocking. That's a, yeah, a odd choice. Staying um, as we mull it over. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's go over to Anastasia, who's right by the playing hall and there with a special guest. Yes, I have Maxim with me. Welcome, Maxim. You just uh, finished your game in the draw. These days, it's so difficult to win a game, to lose a game. Like, how can you explain what's happening? Five draws, right, so far? I mean, yesterday I missed an opportunity, but basically an opportunity that I didn't expect. Um, but okay, so Anish plays this powerful preparation. Then I understand that he missed uh, first move, knight f5. But later on he was uh, avoiding draws <laughs> and, uh, you know, getting things very crazy. And I, basically what he told me after the game is that he missed one move after another. Yeah, can, and, maybe and you so can show at, a little bit, yes, this one. No, it just at the critical moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it went in a second because, um, I mean, I still didn't expect to have such such an attack. So I thought uh, if he takes on a6, I take on b2. And anyway, bishop d5 is my next move. I didn't see at all this mm -hmm. idea with a5. Um, yeah, but, but actually uh, speaking about this game... I should game, have paused, but... But, uh, it was crazy. but before that, it was mm -hmm. a very good game, that's why, uh, for me at least. Uh, How difficult it was to play this game for you? I mean, you had to find so many defensive moves, like this knight f5, the only move in the no, position. No, but uh, the thing is, uh, here I was posing because rook c8 is the obvious move, but I was very scared of rook c5. <laughs> and at the end I thought, okay, let, uh, let him, uh, is a finder, remember the move rook c5, and play rook c8, and well, uh, unfortunately he played f4 because he thought that yes. it was part of his preparation. That, that's what happened because he had mm -hmm. f4 somewhere and he thought here it's good, he blunt the knight f5. Yes. Uh, and for today uh, it's a bit uh, shameful, but... Why? No, but <laughs> basically it comes down... First of all, I mean, the, the consequences of moves were to quite this interesting. Yes. So, mm -hmm. of course, I mean, move order, like move order. Jan just wanted me to, to think a bit more than I should, <laughs> which he managed, but... So with the bishop on a7 instead of b6, I was thinking for so much time uh, to try to figure out the difference between mm -hmm. the bishop and b6. First of all, after bishop e3, which I wanted, I was not sure about bishop g4 already, knight d2 and castle. 
but of course probably this is just good um, for me so probably it's what I should have gone with and also actually what I spent a lot of time was knight d2 king e7 knight f3 bishop b7 and here some after knight e5 knight e4 I was not even sure that I'm not getting worse because I cannot take this pawn this is what I because was is and king e8 and yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it's still within drawing margin, but here maybe I should have paused. I, I thought about bishop c2, but I just assumed it's nothing, which is probably true. But I thought it might be uh, a bit of a difference compared to the bishop on b6, and that's why I set up for d takes e5, but in the end, I, I was just scared of this position for, like, somehow you get scared for, for no, no reason. reason. <laughs> yeah, and... Yeah, I just thought I was forcing a draw, uh, and you know, come another day. Of course, yeah, I should have gone a four right away. Um, what do you think about the sending? There was a big discussion. Rook and bishop or knight and oh, sorry, rook and bishop or knight no. and bishop. What? I mean, rook and bishop, of course, is better in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, here I was getting a bit scared about g six. I thought g six was the, the way to to try to keep the game going and rook a one. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course it shouldn't be anything, but some ideas with rook c1, with rook d1. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I wanted, I wanted knight g5 actually, and king e7. This is where I wasn't sure, maybe I, yeah, I wanted to take actually, and probably this is holding. Okay. I mean, it takes a lot to do this game with white, so I, <laughs> I, I didn't manage, but... Um, but you felt that it's no, too possible, but, what? I mean... If I regret something, it's either to play bishop e3, because a4, I didn't feel like, I mean, first of all, there's b4, but I thought even castle, no, with a rook still on a8. So, I mean, it's just a miss on my part. Like, I mean, probably I checked this bishop a7 a long time ago, but uh, it was just uh, bishop b6 is such uh, <laughs> the automatic move, so. Yeah. Gary Gasparo was today in the studio, I mean, through Zoom call, and he said that uh, this was the interesting consequences of moves which uh, Nepo, sh Nepo chose today. So he was maybe also puzzled with the difference where, yeah, <laughs> where oh, to move same. the bishop is. So and maybe bishop is here and move nine, maybe, maybe knight d2. Maybe the, because this is what I spend the most time on, so this position. Mm -hmm. Maybe here there's... Uh, no need to panic uh, like I did because, of course, the bishop on i7 is very active, but my king is safer, so mm -hmm. uh, I shouldn't be worse. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this might have been the way to, to try to, to keep playing a bit, but, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Tomorrow and, of course, is, yes. I mean, the thing is uh, you're playing Nepo, who is obviously in his prep, so you don't know how far. <laughs> What's so. going on, yes. So, uh, after a while, I just decided to play it safe and, yeah. well... Made it a bit tricky for myself, but draw yeah. is okay. So you finished the day in the office today. What is the plan for tomorrow? You have a rest day finally. Yeah, no, it's good. Uh, I'll be looking to prepare a bit for my for my last three games. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, also then I will get immediately a second free day after my game with Richard. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll have some time to prepare. I'll have some time to rest, of course, and. Uh, Maybe to enjoy some tennis, uh, you know, in the forest park. Ah, uh -huh, you will play, you mean? I uh, will yeah. try to find people to do, to do so. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sure. I'm not sure, like... Uh, I think Fabio be, was also... Before the talking. tournament, I was not very successful, but... Uh, in finding partners, but maybe maybe this time around it will work out. Okay, good luck with that, Maxim, <laughs> as well with with your games. Thank you, and and we go back to the studio. Thank you, Thank Anastasia. You. MVL, some advice. Ray Ray Robson is ready, willing, and able. He's a very good tennis partner. So uh, check in with Ray Ray. Uh, I'm I'm listening to uh, MVL there, Peter, and it just seemed like. He had an, a fantastic awareness of the position, just knew everything. It, it almost felt like it's impossible to beat these guys. They just know uh, everything. He, he, we were listening to different interviews. Obviously. Really? I, like, uh, I, I thought he, he, uh, he knew I was, the endings I very was, well. Honestly, and, the ending, yes, but the, the, thing, the things he was describing as the things he spent the most time in the opening, I was just sitting there kind of... Perplexed. Very perplexed, because... 
he knows this line. He is very good at this line. I played him with Black in this line. <laughs> and for him, once again, the game has disappeared. We can, we can by, through the magic of television, we can make the game reappear. By, well by, by naming it th th thrice, yeah, yeah, right. by, by calling for it thrice. Uh, the, the fact that he somehow thought that mm -hmm. uh, he needs to start here and look for an advantage from this position is just baffling to me. He knows it so Because, well. yes, I understand there's a, we were uh, explaining to our viewers that this is a whole new position, the bishop right. should be on b6, and any top player will be trying to work out what the differences are, mm -hmm. how, how to exploit it. But that his starting point seemed to be this position, and then the choice between bishop f7, which we all know is a draw, and he knows is a draw, and, mm -hmm. and this choice of knight g2, and then uh, king e7, knight f3, which yeah, bishop b7 is playable also. This is apparently completely fine. But just th the whole point of somebody who is extremely well prepared, who is very, very ambitious, one of the strongest Spanish players from the white side that I know, right. from personal experience, mm -hmm. just meeting a new idea and then saying, what I'll do here is, I will, is I will <laughs> basically create a symmetrical structure in the center and trade queens. Right. And that is a starting point for my calculations. I Honestly, I, I was in slight disbelief there because it's not the MVL that I know. I was, I was very, very puzzled by that. Yes, I understand that he doesn't exactly know what the difference is and he might feel that, mm -hmm. you know, world championship prep here from, from Nepo might be something that he, he will struggle to deal with. But still, right. I'm, I'm very unused to MVL not, not trying. All right, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Peter, for your thoughts. And uh, we're going to go straight back to Anastasia, who is with Richard, who is ready to share his thoughts on his draw against Anish Giri. Hello, Richard. Welcome to our studio. It's the first time that you're here with us. Uh, first of all, how do you feel? I mean, I know that you played in Budva and that you had to travel to come here. How is your jet lag? How are you? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I wish uh, I could, uh, you know, uh, claim jet lag as an excuse for my poor play. So I'm obviously as as well as I I could be considering uh, the results. But other, other than that, I'm doing very well. Of course, the uh, playing call is very nice. St. Louis is same as usual, so everything is fine. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So um, I know. I mean, okay. You you lost this game against Wesley, and uh, but I think you really tried to fight uh, on on this game, and you decided to choose Kings uh, Indian. Like, um, can you give some thoughts about it? Like, what did what went wrong? If you can, I don't know. I guess. Uh, I mean, it's not uh, in these months. I mean, I lost quite a few games. So I guess uh, you know when you're. Uh, and things are going um, fast, yeah, you should probably try to, you know, uh, be cautious and uh, not to push too much, especially, I mean, I mean especially who is a super solid player, so I kind of got punished for that. Um, yeah. <laughs> what to do? I mean, but today was a different game and you played against Anish. Uh, do you think you got pleasant position out of the openings? You know, always it's tricky with all these small moves like h6, a6 and the, and the consequences. Like, can, can you tell us a little bit about this opening battle? Yeah, I don't uh, really know much. I mean, about this. It's, to me, all these Italians are looking the same. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know. This is... A <laughs> I feel sometimes the same, and I'm like, I mean, so, now yeah. we play H6 or later, like, what's what's happening here and there? Yeah, it's very hard to do anything, so it's symmetrical position, yeah, and then... Uh, yeah, uh, he decided to go for this A6 plan and this yeah, A7. Yeah, I'm not so sure if I, I, I could so principled. I mean, I think it was a normal game, more or less. I felt like, okay, maybe here I could have played before. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't like Bishop of Faith, which might not be such a such an achievement for him after all. And after this uh, next critical moment was okay. I think moves were normal more or less until here. And then I played here a5, yeah, which is um, not probably one of my best moves. I wanted to play Queen B3, which I ended up doing during the game. But um, I thought that in this position or in similar position after B6. I uh, can go for, okay, it takes... Is it takes. typical, this B6? Because I was a bit surprised when I saw it uh, on the board. Well, I, I don't it know, I mean, mm -hmm. it's a matter of taste, I guess, no? Because black uh, has this option to keep the pawn on B7, where 
it's kind of a small weakness or play b6 try to play b okay he'll, he's going to play b5 basically I play b5 and then try to have this weird structure which is kind of like no one is really moving and i think this was critical moment like maybe i could have played here d4 i was calculating mm -hmm. you know. but e4 seemed like uh, d5 and mm -hmm. takes takes I really couldn't uh, make this line work for white. I mean, obviously not worth, but I couldn't make it work for for an advantage. So yeah, um, you decided just to. I decided to, to, to play bishop e three, and then after this, I mean, uh, okay, the position is about uh, equal, I guess. Um, yeah, repetition is kind of, uh, I mean, strange a little bit because, but I don't think black is. I mean, okay, for white, I feel like it's kind of normal. But also for black, I have this c4 counterplay every time. The only question was what he could go is b4 and b4 here mm -hmm. in this position. But uh, like strategically speaking, but I feel like it's kind of risky for him because I play c4 maybe and I could end up with having just very nice light squares. So it's very kind of normal, I mean, outcome. I think the critical moments were like kind of early on in the game and uh, I probably didn't um, yeah, seize the moment, so to speak. So kind of slipped, yeah. Yeah, I wonder how how much time it takes to understand all these consequences of this position. I mean, how how many hours did you spend understanding Italian and all the structures yeah, in you, your as life? You can see on this game, I don't really understand Italian. So. <laughs> Come on, so, <laughs> you always say you so. Ask, but uh, you should ask my opponents. Yeah, like uh, who knows all the all the moves. Okay, next time we will ask also Anish what he thinks about it. And um, thank you so much, Richard, and all the best for you tomorrow. It's a rest day, so recharge your batteries, come back and show uh, your always creative you know, spirit. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. And we're thank going you, back. Richard, yeah. and thank you, Anastasia, and the Richard at the end with a wry smile. And we're coming close to our second break of the day. So uh, let's take a look at the round five results so far. Two Drawing draws between <laughs> Richard Report <laughs> and Anish Giri. Maxim Vashilograf also finished in a draw against Ian Napomniachi. And we would like to encourage the people in Central West End to take a look at your jingle bar. Yes, go to the World Chess Hall of Fame org and uh, check out the uh, jingle bar uh, for uh, your holiday hot chocolates. It's running I say. right now, though. It is yeah. running right now. For some reason, I thought it was going. After the event, I'm mistaken. November 17th through December 30th. Check it out. It's uh, yeah. your, with your friends. It's yes. sure to be a lot of fun. And uh, we're going to take, we're going to go on our second break. But in the meantime, we do have a feature lined up for you on the community outreach program on Jazz in St. Louis. So please enjoy that. Don't go anywhere. So today's community day, all the participants of the U.S. Championship are going to schools around St. Louis and, you know, teaching kids um, openings, end games, uh, tactics, doing some fun stuff like hand and brain, some simuls, and uh, we just finished our first class and it was really fun. I see kids taking the um, skills that they're learning in chess, whether that be critical thinking, decision-making skills, planning skills, and I see them applying that throughout the rest of their school day, whether it's in classes or sports, or even just how they interact with one another and with their teachers. I play with my auntie, my mom, my sisters. Sometimes on the weekends, like, we go to the park and we play. They be begging me to teach them. I like show them like new stuff, like new openings. I show them that. And so I'm trying to see them get better and try to beat me. What I like about chess is just trying to have fun and learn new things and maybe I'll get more into it and it'll maybe be my full career. I heard that if you play chess, you make bad decisions in life. So I always want to make better decisions in life. I can tell you that they've engaged more in uh, critical thinking. They are looking analytically at moves and trying to think ahead. I like the um, complexity of chess, how you have to think about every single move you make, like every move you make, whether it's gonna put your king in check, whether it's gonna put, you, put your anything in danger, whether it's just a move that you make. Everything counts in the long run. I like um, 
how it makes me use my critical thinking, makes me look at the whole board. I think it's teaching them to be persistent. You know, we have a lot of students who it takes them like it may take a few weeks or even months in chess club to master a particular strategy or skill. Um, and what I think that teaches kids is even if they don't get it the first time around, or even if it's difficult the first time around, um, it's worth sticking to it. Well, one thing's for certain, without the St. Louis Chess Club, we would not have chess instructors because I don't know if you all know this, but there is a critical shortage of teachers and educators, and especially those in areas that are not core content area. And because of the St. Louis Chess Club collaboration, we have people who come in here working with students who want to work with them. Today with the experience of uh, the Grandmaster Community Outreach Day, I came up and I'm like, well, what's a Grandmaster? And they're like, oh, you don't know what a Grandmaster is? And they were able to explain that. And they recognize the importance and the seriousness. I mean, it's a sport, it's a profession. And so they're able to see things outside of the sports that we typically promote in school. It makes me feel good because like learning stuff like this will help me learn, help me build my problem solving skills, help me build strategy and like, you know, help my brain. Hello. I'm Women's Grandmaster Brigham Tokharjanova. I will be creating content for Grand Chess Tour. Follow us on social media and catch more behind the scenes content. The St. Louis Chess Club is the premier chess facility in the United States. We bring the educational benefits of chess to thousands of students across the St. Louis area. We also promote chess at the highest levels, hosting all levels of the U.S. championships as well as high-profile tournaments that attract the world's best players. Become a member and enjoy perks such as free classes and lectures, weekly tournaments, and so much more. Visit stlouischessclub.org to claim your membership today. Yeah, um, it's amazing what the club has done for chess in general because, I mean, it's already been 15 years and they've done countless uh, national championships, tournaments for juniors, helping around schools, and they've just grown the game so much across the United States. I think if I look at my own career and I look at American chess in general, we're in a much better place than we were 15 years ago. And so uh, the contributions have been immense. And of course, it's all thanks to uh, Dr. Gene Singfield and Rex Singfield. I would say that St. Louis Chess Club is like a rock in the ocean of chess. And we know that it's, uh, it's there. It is there, it will be there. I think it sends a hope that the game of chess will always stay afloat. By the mere fact of its, of its existence, I think it, 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 it sends positive waves across the globe. The World Chess Hall of Fame, located in the heart of St. Louis's historic Central West End. Want to know why chess has intrigued people around the world for nearly 1,500 years? Stop by and learn about the impact of chess from our three floors showcasing the art, culture, and history of the game. The World Chess Hall of Fame has something for everyone to enjoy. For more information on current exhibits, please visit worldchesshof.org. St. Louis, the chess capital of the United States. It also plays host to an award-winning shop dedicated to chess merchandise, all occasion gifts, and plenty more. At Q Boutique, you can shop both in-store and online. From quirky greeting cards to luxury chess sets, there is something for everyone at Q Boutique. Enjoy a shopping experience like no other. Make sure to check out QBoutiqueSTL.com for a wide variety of gifts for everyone to enjoy. The St. Louis Chess Club Scholastic Program brings the educational value of chess to kids and schools across the St. Louis area. Active in over 100 schools throughout the St. Louis city and county, the St. Louis Chess Club has been able to reach over 85,000 students in both in-school and after-school programs. We view chess as a valuable educational tool. Learn more about our scholastic programming by visiting stlouischessclub.org education. Hello, I'm Women's Grandmaster Brigham Tokharjanova. I will take you behind the scenes of the Grand Chess Tour. Follow us on social media and don't miss out on players' interviews and more content from the playing hall. The St. Louis Chess Club is the premier chess facility in the United States and is among the best in the world. 
thanks to co-founders Dr. Jeannie Cairn Sinkfield and Rex Sinkfield. The St. Louis Chess Club is a nonprofit organization committed to promoting the game of chess locally and internationally. We bring the educational benefits of chess to thousands of students across the St. Louis area, promoting cognitive development, critical thinking, concentration, and analytical skills. The St. Louis Chess Club welcomes chess lovers of any age and skill level to come and enjoy the game of chess. We also promote chess at the highest levels, hosting all levels of the U.S. Championships and the American Cup, as well as high-profile tournaments that attract the world's best players, including the prestigious Sinkfield Cup, Cairns Cup, and many more. All tournaments can be streamed via our YouTube and Twitch channels that also include over 2,000 chess lectures for anyone to enjoy. Become a member and enjoy perks such as free classes and lectures, weekly tournaments, merchandise discounts, and so much more. Visit stlouischessclub.org to claim your membership today. The World Chess Hall of Fame, located in the heart of St. Louis's historic Central West End. Want to know why chess has intrigued people around the world for nearly 1,500 years? Stop by and learn about the impact of chess from our three floors showcasing the art, culture, and history of the game. Landmarked by the world's largest chess piece sitting outside our front door, the World Chess Hall of Fame has something for everyone to enjoy, including various exhibitions, monthly concerts, and much more. Whether you are a beginner or a professional, there is something for everyone to learn here at the World Chess Hall of Fame. Enjoy free admission to our rotating exhibitions in our galleries and sign up for chess events, family-friendly programming, and art classes. And don't forget to stop by our award-winning gift shop, Q Boutique, and shop a wide selection of chess-related merchandise. For more information on current exhibits, please visit worldchesshof.org. St. Louis, the chess capital of the United States, boasts the world-class St. Louis Chess Club and the World Chess Hall of Fame. It also plays host to an award-winning shop dedicated to chess merchandise, all occasion gifts, and plenty more. At Q Boutique, you can shop both in-store and online for chess merchandise, autograph collectibles, chess campus souvenirs, and much, much more. From quirky greeting cards to luxury chess sets, there is something for everyone at Q Boutique. And all purchases go right to benefiting new exhibitions and programs at the World Chess Hall of Fame, dedicated to exploring chess and its immense impact on art and culture. Located on the first floor of the World Chess Hall of Fame, enjoy a shopping experience like no other and become everyone's favorite gift giver. If you can shop in store, make sure to check out QBoutiqueSTL.com for a wide variety of gifts for everyone to enjoy. Welcome back to round five of the Sinkfield Cup. And as we actually inch very close to the halfway mark, well, two games have already finished. And it was a, it's been a peaceful start to round five with Richard Report and Anish Giri agreeing a draw and also Maxime Vashilograf and Jan Pomiachi racing to an end game, which soon ended in a draw. But two games still remaining and well, both of those games, very good chances for, for the, the white, white pieces. Yeah, but the one that's really confounding us, Peter, it, it I mean, is, it's just terribly, is, yeah. is the Levon uh, versus her, because Ali Reza really badly bungled it, and how um, Levon didn't embrace bishop takes c5 yeah. is a question for the ages. I, I spent the, the, the vast majority of the previous break ranting about how I don't understand chess anymore because these are players who are very, do understand very, chess. very good at chess and <laughs> yes. doing things I cannot really explain. Starting with the move knight c4, it's a logical move, the knight sort of belongs there, but considering that the other option was planting a rook on d7 while also creating a bunch of weaknesses for black, seems like bishop c5 was the more logical choice. Right. Alireza actually spent a couple of moves making the absolutely best moves in the position, a4 was important to include to move the uh, weaknesses away from the dark square so that they are less attacked by the uh, white pieces. And then in this position, 
Uh, ideas of B6-B5 often are so useful for black that uh, the, the engine very often was actually spending a tempo on playing before B5 itself okay. just to make sure that we fix the weakness on B6 and also secure the position of the knight on C4. Or rook AC1, which is also logical. Instead of all that, Levon played king g2 g1, which is understandable because you do want to play queen e3 and f3. We discussed it before the break, and you cannot do that while there are still discovered checks available using the long diagonal. Right. But it's not very concrete specifically here, and rook ac8, I think a move Ali Reza would have made in a blitz game, gaining, gaining time on the clock. Right. Uh, with the idea of meeting rook ac1 with b5, knight a5, rook takes c1, important intermediate move forcing rook takes c1, and then putting the queen on d5. What's the you problem? Just, you look at this position and you think, how did we get from there to here? This is just such an obvious improvement for black. Oh, the pawns are now in light square, so they're much less of a target for white's pieces. There's a beautiful queen in the center of the board. The knight on e4 is still not chased away, might never get chased away. There's uh, no there, white rook on the seventh. <laughs> a2 eight, eight is hanging, so white actually right. now has to start thinking about maybe defending things, which really wasn't a topic at all. Right. Uh, instead of that, quite quickly, Alireza goes knight gf6, right. allowing uh, bishop uh -huh. takes f6. Uh, other, other moves were also very strong, but bishop 6 is a very good practical decision. Just maybe, bishop f6. Maybe this capture was and, what eluded uh, Ali Reza because, you know, he's thinking knight df6, if the queen goes to e3, knight g4. Absolutely, but also even something like this, which I assume was his intention, mm -hmm. like you continue the variation for one more move, then you go rook ab1. This is also very, very bad nice for black. For yeah, it's, very it's, nice. it's not like other options were not giving white a massive advantage. And once again, you can sort of, I can, you can sell me on knight gf6 being a move that occurs to you, but considering rook ac8 on b5 exists in the position, how do you end up playing knight gf6? I, do, so, I don't know. They're so forcing and moves, and by the way. to add to Perugia's woes, right? Right. The, the, look at the two, clock situation. Two minutes. two minutes. and the players are currently on move 26. Yeah. So queen e3 versus as, 25 for Levon on move as, 25. So that's Levon tees yeah. up for mm -hmm. f3, but rook c8 came rook, very rook quickly. Rook c8 played, and white is, is white is better if he does something like rook ac1, but there's absolutely no reason not to take on b6 here. Yeah. <laughs> is that a peshki? <laughs> I've never heard of that expression in my life, but I like it. I have to welcome him to studio. He's going to feel comfy. My, my feeling is uh, Alireza is pinning his hopes on taking and playing rook c2, but now after rook AC1. I, I had the feeling that? that this is just made, right? If, if, you, if you take on E2, you run into knight D7, <laughs> and you have to just leave it on F6. Because, uh, yeah, because, because yeah, C8 is putting it putting it on any, any other square, like here, knight E5 is already basically made, basically made because right. if rook F6 back, we can go rook C8, Check, rook F8, and, and the then the reinforce it a little bit Ooh, with the other ouch. one to D8, and game finishes. Over. Yeah. yeah, and if you have to trade on c1, it's yeah, you're gonna pretty, drop the pretty, a4 much, pretty much resigning. Yeah. Right. So if he's intending to do that, the game probably ends uh, more or less on the spot. I was wondering, like, if you play something like h5, how bad is it? But it is pretty bad because the b-pawn will start running. We don't really even care about the a-pawn a very much because this one just gets to b7 incredibly quickly. And you can easily quickly. defend the f2-pawn as well, mm -hmm. which yeah. could be another source of counter. Yeah, gf6. Back. First of all, rook c7, rook c7 is probably made, so <laughs> you, can't, you can't even do that. So, yeah. Uh, no running and hiding here. <laughs> so, so we're once again entering a situation where it would appear that uh, Levon is one precise calculation away from what will be an absolutely overwhelming advantage. I can't imagine that uh, Alireza is intending to play something like queen e7, which is the best move in the position, but you Why know did you're you losing. you yeah. aspire to this? Yeah. You know yeah. you're losing this one. Exactly. Uh, by the way, does knight take b6 have a clear-cut refutation? I didn't see it. Rook c3? Apparently. F4. 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 With some oh. rook g6 threats. And if queen d4, you get e5? hit by... You get no. hit by knight c3. Nice turnaround there. And now that I've taken the d5 square under control, creating this fork threat, after rook d2 I will play c5 <laughs> and pick up this knight. Now that you no longer have, you have any, queen d5 any, checks. any intermediate checks. Yeah. That, that's a funny move, that move f4, because I was mm -hmm. really not looking at that direction. And he's played rook c1. And now after b6, b5, there are drawing chances again. I give up. <laughs> no, don't give up, Peter. <laughs> Not quite. Not yet. It's called humans playing. Yes. This right. Is
But I've played those humans. Yeah, and they're really, really good. They and they me, me, they would be 10, 10, 10, 10 times out of 10 there. Yeah. That's such a really... life, isn't it? You know, against <laughs> you, they play like a god. Like a beast. Yeah. yeah. Queen takes B6, and away you go. Nervousness, uh, as well as, I, I don't know, sometimes you're sitting at the board and the tensions. You know, you start seeing ghosts. What Queen he, takes b6 is not a difficult move for it's, anybody it, it, in this This event. entire line we've showed with knight 7 there in the end, in the end game, I would back Livon to find an Oblitzkate. Of course. And so, maybe even a two-minute Blitzkate. Yeah, and and he, no. has a, he has 25 minutes and plenty right. of time to think. So it's, it's all very mystifying. Uh, we're flogging uh, a horse here, but what's happening in the Lanier game? Because, again, as we've been talking about uh, the race, to be number one, uh, one by ELO, uh, to be invited to the candidates by having the highest rating. It comes down to Wesley, Anish, uh, Ali Reza, and Lanier's trying to bring himself into the mix. We were When we left it, we looked at G4, and we were saying King H2, King G3, and the chances of winning are pretty handsome. It's... I don't, I don't think it's trending upwards here for, for it's Wesley. Not. It's still, I, I think, manageable, but yeah, the move to g5, g4 very specifically creates this very, very safe haven for, for the king on g3. You can include hg4, hg4 and bring it over. You can also keep the tension there, trying to provoke black eventually to take gh3, which would be a very, uh, very useful thing for us because we'll play f3, we'll limit the bishop on g5. There's the pawn h5 becomes a legitimate weakness. Right. And yeah, Wesley clearly isn't Happy. isn't enjoying things here very much. Yeah, he's down to 13 minutes. It's not a big deal in a position like this because moves are reasonably easy to come by. But still, uh, this will this will take some some holding. Yeah. What's Wesley's? Um, Maybe he I don't want to say trades. fortress. I mean, I'm just thinking first we'll make some trades. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, we, we want to get some pieces off the board, I'm pretty sure. So we go king f5, you probably play either the immediate bishop d4 or rook c1 followed by bishop d4 because you will have to shift the bishop away from the e5 right. square. So we get somewhere here. So I might as well do it immediately mm -hmm. and keep my rook on, let's say, the active open c5. Yeah. I, I would probably also choose this one. Yep. And then we want to play king g3. Perhaps, you know, we hope to get the king all the way over, over to h4. Also activating this rook. Like if, if we, if we, once again, if we make a couple of really okay, stupid breaking moves, moves, take on h. Right, rook c8, rook h8. Yeah. Yeah. And now we're talking. Yeah, now this is good. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you can take on h3. Oh, uh, where? What uh, after the trades. Mm -hmm. And I king guess king takes, takes king h3, takes, yeah. and then f3 is coming. And yeah, that's I, the idea. I would try yeah. not to do that unless absolutely forced, because I think this is a massive yeah. improvement. And what about if white. rook to g7? Here? No, no. Mm. Don't uh, in the previous line. In the line. previous yeah, line. The, yeah, that, that makes sense. I think after HG, you're probably going to have to play HG. I'm anyway. actually a little bit surprised by how much it prefers to play H3, H4 here. Wow. But this is maybe not such a bad idea because I want, once again, this will now be a completely, completely safe square for the king. And if you imagine. Uh, black allowing it because it's very possible the best move here yeah. is just to give up a second pawn but to establish this yeah. very rook very rook g6 mm -hmm. rook g6 c6 c2 yeah. is a plan right. or just rook e7 perhaps trying to land into on, on e2 this honestly despite this now being two pawns down looks more holdable than the previous one we were mm -hmm. discussing and, and we're, we're actually headed towards that way so let's take a look at what the players because bishop d4 feel. on the board by Lanier mm -hmm. and again that's like a very nice pocket uh, rook g8 that line that you just gave us I, I was surprised by your decision to play h4 there uh, so you would, you would be taking yeah I'm, I'm taking and if you take with a pawn mm -hmm. king g3 I'm hoping to play rook h1 h5 rook h1 h4 rook d1 d4 f4 something like this no this is yeah, still this is still I'm very very good. losable yeah, yeah. Can, the, can you play like rook h I mean rook h7 I'm gonna work my way <laughs> around the back <laughs> uh, getting <laughs> from behind yeah. uh, rook to d1 uh, to d4 rook, d1, rook c8 rook f8 check is also interesting one thing i wanted to in more general terms to yes. say yeah. that uh w one thing working perhaps in black's favor is that we you can even we can even maybe move away some pieces away from the g4 uh, pawn using the fact that if you pick it up with the king you will lose the g2 pawn so it's a uh, it's less of a bind. It's, Black isn't as obliged as it might seem to keep all of his forces protecting the pawn on g4. 
Uh, but yeah, it's one of those positions which, uh, once again, I think are, I'm pretty certain are completely defendable with best play. Mm -hmm. But only one side has any fun. Right. And, and that actually at some point starts impacting quality of play for very many people defending completely cheerless positions is something that they don't do well. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a skill that very few of us have. Exactly. Yeah. I, I know I was always horrible at it. And, Me too. Uh, Interestingly enough, mm -hmm. I heard that optimists are better defenders. Makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Pessimists are ready to throw in the towel at the, the slightest uh, marshmallow okay. attack. <laughs> okay, and uh, okay. We, you can see that from Peter's reaction that we should go to the Levonoronian Alvarezza game. He, he has very, very little time, so it's it's probably uh, completely unfair to criticize him for for the way he's playing. But Alvarezza is making. Uh, very uncharacteristic for him is calculations. Once again, doing this just seemed correct. We don't really have to worry about rook c8 because rook f8 rook covers f8, everything yeah. correctly. Okay, knight c6 creates some threats. Let's drop the rook back, cover, cover the e7 square. A2 is hanging everywhere. Are e4 knight still alive? We yeah, and we want to play h6, king h7 eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, this still looks kind of pleasant for white, but it looks like we've weathered the storm to a large degree. Right. Instead of which he goes rook f8 and now after rook takes c8, uh, queen takes c8, queen, queen b6, things just start falling apart because... That's not feeling It's not even good. the b5 pawn. I'm, I'm threatening rook d7 and attacking the b6 yeah. pawn. Yeah. yeah. And my, my, my feeling is that we shouldn't be so sharply critical because I suspect rook takes c8 loses to a one very specific thing. Rook d7. And it basically loses to it. Rook d7, queen b8, and now this very beautiful two-step. Knight c6, lure the rook away from the back rank. Queen d4. Queen d4, and there is no defense against rook d8. And then your queen side probably collapses and you lose. Uh, but Grim. if this is the only thing that really wins here, on two minutes you never see that. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, you're also in a lot of trouble after the very simple f3, rook d6. No, this is, this is mm -hmm. easier, understandable, mm -hmm. and the advantage is absolutely clear. Uh, uh, and, and, now, and now we can and uh, go back to the real played. world. <laughs> in, <laughs> F3, in yeah. which, yeah, f3 was played, he will play knight f6 very quickly. I don't with think, or in, with, with I don't think there is much point in including rook takes c1. I don't expect it to be included. I think knight f6 is more logical. Okay. But we'll ahead. see. Knight we'll f6, see. go ahead, put that on the board, Peter. How big. Uh, I mean, it's, time it's, advantage is huge, we understand, mm, but in terms of engine's it, advantage? It actually, once again, starts hinging on very concrete things, because the, the way the engine goes here is it, it goes into this position, yeah. and then it very, very specifically plays queen c5. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, of course, rook takes queen I mean, is not possible. Because yeah, because that, 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 is, that is mate in one, so black has to play something like h6, and then we have actually landed the, the condor, the condor <laughs> has landed on c6, and all kinds of tactics are important because of knight e7. Because my first reaction was, why can't I take? It's because it loses to knight mm -hmm. e7. Check. Nice uh, work. And e6 is hanging, and then the whole king side will start falls. collapsing. So it goes rook e8, and from here you can sort of see that like knight d4 is very strong, knight d8 even is very strong. Uh, once again, attacking, yeah, attacking the, the, the fabled base of the chain gets right. attacked here, uh, but. Having not really gone for the throat previously, Earlier, yeah. yeah, you feel like Levon might not even try to calculate all this. Maybe he'll go for, uh, in the current position after f3 and f6, like, a move like knight d3 looks very, very logical. Trying to reposition it on c5, reminding black that there's this pawn on e6, which needs protection. White is much better. Right. That's never but, been an issue. Yeah, but, but black definitely has chances of holding this mm -hmm. after something like rook f8. It's a lot more manageable for black compared to the very, very concrete line with a very beautiful queen c5 shot. But uh, I feel slightly fake pointing out these engine <laughs> lines because they've been passed by so many times in right. this particular game. But that particular ending with f3, what you just played, knight d3, it feels like white is trying to win it softly, not doing anything, you know, uh, very complicated, like the whole rook d7. Bishop takes c5, rook d7, which I thought was so concrete and clear. It's a very pleasant position uh, for Levon, and I guess he's just being tempted by too many 
good choices. Right. But, you know, I have noticed in this particular round that everyone has gone for the more sophisticated, subtle approach. I right. mean, there were many possibilities in all the games where someone could have played in a very direct way. Right. But they, everyone said no, they haven't gone for that. And mm -hmm. Levon just seems to be following that trend as well. Mm -hmm. Because to me, putting a rook onto d6 is just irresistible. I mean, I, I totally. would do it without or with little Let's give myself some credit. Uh, Calculation, yeah. yeah. Uh, rook c8, we may be heading towards rook the line. Rook c8 has been played, but just to address yes. another point Ivanka was making, I think it's sort of completely fair. But there is a very uh, important detail here, that if you make some kind of a normal move like queen g4, you are allowing queen e7, and then this rook gets chased away, also the pawn on b4 might fall. So th this is why queen c5 is so important, it's mm -hmm. that if, if you make a kind of an autopilot move, and those would be like queen g4, perhaps queen g5, all of those moves are being replied to with queen e7. And even, let's say, if uh, that queen trade costs black a, a full pawn, mm -hmm. this is now suddenly a position you can very easily not win. Like Rook a3, a3 goes, for instance, knight c3, knight c3, knight b1 takes on a3. This is a kind of a position where it's very often like the entire queen side will disappear and you will not win four against three. Mm -hmm. So playing rook d6, actually does involve calculation, but once again, we are but you know, uh, being I, dragged away from this because yeah. Ali Reza took on c8. I do think reaction. that after rook c8, rook d6, queen c5 is mm. very much findable, especially at is, this yeah. elite level. Right. I mean, it is. But queen c8 has been preferred, and, and now uh, a slightly different situation is uh, in front of us. I was just pausing for a moment because it just uh, the, the move knight d7 <laughs> it isn't does. visual until you see <laughs> rook f7. So the stop, whole point right? there, as yeah. Peter's indicating, whoops, whoops. Yeah. <laughs> rook f7 that way. suddenly defends everything. everything. Yeah. Doesn't doesn't quite work. No. Yeah, the way the way to go here, I think the way you control the most squares is first rook c1, drive the queen away, mm -hmm. put the rook on c6, and then start attacking everything. So, right. Uh, and that's what he, what Levon has done. Rook c1. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. That, that's a... Yeah. This that's is move 30. Uh, somewhat relevantly, this is move 30. Alirez is on two minutes. He's been very, very good keeping himself around two minutes, not allowing himself to go down to, let's say, below a minute, where it does start getting a bit nerve jangling. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but the position isn't really improving. Uh, the position will, I think, remain very, very difficult to, yeah. to hold for the rest of the game. Absolutely. Yeah. Rook c1 and rook c6 coming. I noticed that... Uh, Wesley has has led his his army into battle. His last move, King f five to e four. That's that's a kind of a, a fun move to play. Uh, we have a rook trade. King takes e four. We're anticipating Bishop e three, and uh, Peter was making this argument. You don't necessarily have to put all your defensive forces. Mm -hmm. uh, over behind that uh, g4 pawn because when you take it g2 is hanging now the my, question my suggestion is, would still be to uh watch the other one to the completion of the first time control because this okay. one is very defined and will go on forever i just wanted to ask a quick question about this one though mm -hmm. by the way because it's not usual that you would see <laughs> the king entering all the way into White's camp with the move king d3. Where I don't hate it, but don't hate I, don't, it. I don't think it does very much, though, because it's, the, the king on g3 will still be very, very safe. It's just there. Mm -hmm. I just brought it up as a visual. King mm -hmm. d3 is just very, <laughs> I mean, very nice. Should Whoa. it make his way all the way to, like, e2? <laughs> yeah, right? Why not? King you know, d3. <laughs> let, let's go. And I was just wondering if you guys felt did, that Did that way. happen? No, no, we, no, don't. no, no we no. do have bishop e3 and then Wesley to think. Uh, going back to the game, because I agree with you that uh, time control, uh, how many yeah, moves I think, have I think the other game yeah. is the one to watch. Yeah. And I now mean, Alireza 30, has gone. Right? <clears throat> yeah. It's not that many. They've got to make 10 moves. And, it's, and uh, are, Ali Reza now under the minute. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, rook c1 was met by knight d5. Interesting. Yeah, this does force pretty much force the queens off the board because you really don't want to abandon the very, very nice diagonal. So but okay. after rook c8, knight e3, rook c5 in particular is just very, very strong. And we once very again re-enter this territory very of, natural. you know, Ulf Andersen and games. Yeah. Rook b8 is more or less obligatory. Now you can spend the tempo on a very, very useful move a2, a3, so that b4 is not hanging because very importantly for white, we are controlling both the c2 and the c4 square, meaning right. that the knight will not be able to attack the pawn on a3. Right. And then we go king f2, we drive it away, 
we go 96, we go 94, and we start collecting. Yes, the harvest. So let's watch, let's watch how Livon uh, approaches it. Livon yeah. is a very, very accomplished Catalan player, by the way. So for him, this should be very much second nature. Uh, for Ace. me, I've always admired his technical as well as yeah, end game skills. I, so we, now, now we will see if the clinic is working. A2, A3, I like that move. I, I like that move and I was just going to say it's very much on point on how modern ch day chess at the top level mm -hmm. is. It's all about protecting your pieces and A3 works a treat there. Also, you know, black could be potentially threatening A3 themselves. Absolutely. And then to jump back to D5 and ask questions about the B4 pawn. And I would never want to see any of that kind of counterplay. Uh, therefore, A3, King F2 at once, I am not adverse, but A2, A3, to my mind, makes the most sense. Just uh, fixing, and what Peter said, you know, eventually this knight is gonna come to C6, and then it's gonna come to D4, and ask a very salient question. How are you defending pawn b5 as well as pawn e6? It's not going to be an easy answer to that uh, not question. A2, A3, 15 minutes for Levon, I can yeah. see from his clock there at the board, and only two minutes, less a minute and a half for Ali Reza. Yeah, not, not an easy defensive job for. I can imagine reason. a niche back in his hotel room, <laughs> cheering Lanier on, uh, cheering Levon on. Come on, guys, uh, help me out. I need uh, I need to qualify for the candidates by rating. Mm -hmm. Well, Anish has uh, two paths to qualification. He's at the top of the FIDE circuits board, and the person who finishes at the top there will get a circuit spot into the candidates. And of course, he's in contention for. The rating. Well, that's a question I would ask of you. I mean, I'm sure FIDE regulations would do that. Let's say I'm Ali Reza and I finish behind Anish in rating. And then Anish... Could Wins said, the FIDE circuit. That's what I wanted to so ask. Ali Reza is in use? I'm pretty sure Ali Reza is yeah, but, That was my but then question. Who does the sp but to who does the spot go to? Is it going to be like Gukash, who's in the second, well, he's in third place of the circuit? No, would, would, would which, Anish which spot? choose, I will take the rating spot or I will take exactly. the Grand Prix spot? Or is, is the choice is made for him? Yeah, I or think is the it choice like has some to lucky be made. dip or something? Right. I think <laughs> <laughs> because by that standard, um, uh, Fabi is the Grand winner, right? He's ahead of a niche, yeah, and he's... he qualified by the World Cup. Like he's in by the World Cup. End of story. That... I'm pretty sure there's a ranking between right, those that's what qualification I paths, to say. and it goes from from top to a bottom. To and I think I think if uh, probably the feeder circuit stands above rating. So if you if you if you take the feeder circuit spot, you're removed from the rating consideration, okay. and exactly. then the next one in line for that. Right. Uh, gets the spot. That would be my assumption, but obviously uh, chess players famously never read any regulations. <laughs> uh, Contracts? What are they? What are what they? Are they? <laughs> exactly. exactly. So I, I wouldn't know for sure, but that would be my assumption. That, uh, Mine too. Circuit, circuit trumps rating, so okay. uh, if, if Anish, uh, which is probably actually why both uh, Ali Reza and, uh, and Wesley are desperately willing him on to a degree because if he, if he takes the circuit spot, it's much easier for them to yes. qualify by rating. Exactly. Um, and, but, but having said that, I was very confused by the one rating list and not some wonderful mm. formula based on 12 different rating lists and what have you. Um, Peter, Levon versus Ali Reza. I mean, he's, still he's thinking. fighting for his life as Ali Reza. What does Ali Reza have to do after A3? I mean, it's not going to resign. It's very unclear. Yeah, the engine the playing? engine launches some kind of a desperate counterplay with this move rook d8. I where, wanted to ask, shouldn't uh, I get I'm, desperate? I'm not. I'm not sure we can even like. I, I don't. I don't know if rook b5 is badly wrong, but the engine also for now goes h2 h4, further pointing out the fact that rook d1 is really not a threat at all. In fact, here it loses on the spot because rook c8 threat is threatened. Is mate. Mate is threatened, and the knight is hanging. So it includes h4 and g6. Yeah. Just to improve slightly on, on the king side. And then calmly takes on b5. Black will be able to trade a3 and a4. Mm -hmm. But the resulting position remains, frankly, optically, this right. should not be defendable. And just to kind of 
verify? I mean, why was not taking the pawn immediately? Because to my eyes, that's irresistible. It, play, I saw it, it plays g5, uh -huh. and now there's a threat of rook g1 followed by f5, f4. So you have to worry a little bit more. Yeah. It's a similar position. You're still much, much better. But it, it just prefers adding mm. an additional layer of safety on the king side because this is just not running away. You can do it whatever, whenever yeah. you want. So it's, it's really the only reason it's not happening immediately. Which causes me to think from the current position, uh, after a3, I, put, I start with g5. Just yeah, but then, but then I'm not going to give you the g file at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just going to, I'm just going to do this immediately. <laughs> okay. Rook b6, knight d4, we'll take and, b5 next and move. There comes and things, the harvest, things will start collapsing. Yeah, so. Yikes. And I think this is the reason why it absolutely panics with rook d8. Oh, we have a move, and he hasn't played a3 instead of going He's gone knight 6 immediately. Taking away the d file. Yeah, still, still pretty good after rook b6. Uh, Playing knight d4 here, Ivanka actually pointed out a very, very important detail. A3. Allowing this would be a mistake. Right. This actually gives black legitimate drawing chances. Like, for instance, you can pretty much blunder into a draw by seemingly it's collecting right. everything, but no. Like, yeah. Knight c2, and then suddenly Everything's everything done. everything does come off, but not in the, even knight d5 actually. Knight c2 is very prosaic. I wanted to show this. I wanted right. to show you the position in which I actually also give up on a3 and then collect both. So after knight c6, rook b6, uh, you should not be playing knight d4. White is still better after knight d4, a3, but it becomes trickier because now you... And he has played knight d4. Okay. And he's done it, oh, giving oh, Ali Reza oh. maybe his window Ali Reza has a minute escape. and a half, and he should be spotting a3 I, here. I think he will be spotting I think, wow. I think he should be spotting a3. And, and there it is, almost instantly. 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 By the very, way, I very nicely done. I think he probably it. spent like six seconds. <laughs> I mean... He had it in the back of his mind. Yeah, he knew this was A3, potentially coming and he worked it A4, out. Yeah. A3. He worked it out. Wow. Uh, is Wesley losing a second pawn there? Hang on a second. What's going on? Uh, some slippage here by uh, Levon as uh, we uh, no, allowed no, this okay. technique. No. Yes, no. Ah, no. no yes. Wesley is doing something very clever here, by the way. Uh, and we, we will switch back to the other end game. But just briefly, if we can show this on a big diagram. Uh, some trades have happened after King G3 here. Wesley played Rook G3. Very, very concrete operation here. Started by him because it seems like this is just a blunder. Rook C7, Rook B3, Rook A7, Rook B2, and now Rook A6. And winning a pawn. And we're winning the pawn. But the problem for, for White here is that... You've won this, the pawn. In this position, yeah, you've won the pawn, but you've drawn the game completely. Right. <laughs> because the king will just go all the way to A8. One day yeah. you will play wait. f3. Yeah, eventually white will play f3. We will continue going into the corner. We will continue going to the corner, and then we will take on g4. Yeah. And, that's our and this is obviously a very, very basic draw with the a pawn being the wrong. And yet I so saw your engine going through the roof. <laughs> the engine I'm doesn't understand. Yeah. But you can win a lot of bets by saying that yes. you can queen the pawn. You can yes. win. <laughs> yes, you can, that's yeah. correct. You, yeah. can, you, can, you can actually win. You can actually win two separate bets with the same with the same wager. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know this, right? Yeah. That uh, in this position, let me let me scroll down. All yeah, that's a different game. Right. Because because Levon is thinking. Yeah, we can. Yeah. I can. I can provide some some hustlers with oh, ideas. Please, with please. Ideas. We, we we need to so, be well armed. Yeah. So we get here. We get yes. here, and we uh, wager that we can queen this pawn, yeah. right? And the person who is you know, well equipped with theoretical knowledge of basic endgames says, no, 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 you're not winning this pawn. Yeah. And there's, there's a wager being made, and then what happens is we get here, and then we play king h3 very proudly. Yeah. Right. And then we go a8, queen. Queen. Yeah. I'm queening the pawn. And we claim <laughs> the victory in yeah, that wager. Exactly. And then after our opponent is done shouting at us, and then pays up eventually, yeah. we say, I will give you a chance to win your money back. I am claiming that you will not, in this position, queen the pawn against me. And he says, well, it'd be easy money. I'm returning my yeah, you're giving well, earned, well earned bucks. Yeah. Right. So we get here, and he very proudly plays king h3. And you say, I resign. I resign. <laughs> <laughs> not allowing you to queen the pawn. <laughs> Peter, Beautiful. I didn't know you had that dark side to you. <laughs> you, you I mean, spoken like a true hustler. I, know. I, I really feel like he's pulled that off of, of these capers a couple of times. <laughs> I've, only, I, I, I've told that story many a time. I've never actually, I never actually so tried well. putting it into practice. But <laughs> yeah, and, and, and returning, returning here, king of two kind of needs yes. to be played. 
You can go 91, 93, but the engine doesn't like it very much. It likes 95 much more. Which is the intention yeah, of Yeah, you'll probably play 96, and then you play 2E4. Why this is still much better? But it feels like this Oof, is this is now a, a lot a lot less clean than yes. the conversion that was in front of Lev if he played A3 here of on the course. 33. This is now very easily not won by White. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lev uh, is getting down on uh, clock two. I think when he entered this ending, somewhere closer to 20 minutes than seven. And uh, the clock is ticking away as A4, A3, keeping the queen side. So, you know, it just felt so nice to have the A. Wow. Knight takes, Knight takes B5. Isn't it? I, I'm confused. It, once I am again. totally confused I'm here. I'm confused once he again. Is Inviting knight to d5? Yeah. I, I guess he actually preserves the pawn, because after knight d5 he'll take on a3. Okay. And if you take with the knight, we have knight c4. If but, I take with the knight, knight c4. Yeah, but you take that, with the rook here. Sure. And your pieces are so active that really this feels like this is probably a, a, a draw. Yeah, this knight is frankly. really, really nice. I'm threatening, actually, rook here. If we do play knight c4, I think I'm going to go check. King F. Yeah, knight d5 will be played. King F2. Knight d5 on the board. And I'll start harassing the pawns. Rook H1. Yeah, you could also just play rook A4, provoke A3, and then claim that white pretty much has no way to improve from there. Like rook A4, A3, king of 7 king of 6 And just keep the rook Yeah, and say that rook like, those A4. pieces are so completely uh, stuck on their squares, and the white king takes an age to get to b3, and in the meantime, we will find something to... And there's no checkmating ideas, or, <laughs> or like some kind of uncomfortable... Uh, in this position... Uh, yeah, no, I was, I was thinking, okay, he, so there we see knight the takes a3 on the board. And Lorenzo has, yeah, rook, of course, rook before. He's not going to take with the knight here. And we anticipate knight c4. Or Sorry. rook c2, yeah, I think only two moves really exist in this position. Rook c2 even. But I have a feeling rook c2, rook a4, we might be losing the a2 pawn, which is not a particularly cheerful thought. Not at all. That's the problem. We are facing knight to b4 after knight to c4, knight to b4, forks. Perhaps knight b5 here. Perhaps we can still keep the game afloat, but all of this now looks like it should just be holdable. Knight before rook c4 here is probably a, the issue. A, yep. a, a good position for white. But you can just once again play king of seven, king of six, I feel. Just improve our one final piece and then just start playing h5 and h4 and creating counterplay on the I'm other side. I'm just wondering of the board. whether there's any chance to kind of entomb the king. Like I'm thinking h4. Uh, for white or for black? Uh, Who, well, for whose tomb is. Whose king is. I'm, which I'm tomb because are you dressing? On, we, we saw this idea of, you know, white throwing in h4. Four. Yeah, that was and, when and we were trapping With a knight, a knight on e5, you know, okay. somehow just uh, caging in the black king. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether you could use those ideas. So, why not? We can put a pawn up, up, up here on mm -hmm. h4. Maybe. Okay, I agree. I'm a pawn up, but the uh, rook on a4 looks really uh, safe. Four mm -hmm. moves to time control, rook takes c4. Um, well, this is up to two minutes, and his position improved dramatically. So it certainly the... has. Um, rook to c2. It was our try. We also tried knight to c4. Uh, Jovi, you were talking about knight c4, maybe trying to set up some mating net with knight e5, right? Yes, I was right? thinking knight e5. Sorry, yes. I, and, and what was our, our sol solution to this? Maybe king f7, f6, yeah? Yeah, then, then I guess you We can go to... rook a4 and after knight e5 we can play king f8 or h6 or... Rook a4, knight e5, h6 or g6. You know, yeah. Even king f8, because you don't actually have a check from c8, c7, you only have the, the check from c8. So. Right, the knight does a good job. Yeah. I was just thinking like rook to b5, you know, try to hustle you that way. Hustle? Yeah. I think we're taking on a2 here reasonably comfortably. I don't think there is enough... And now rook to uh, b8. Yeah. And B7. No, no, first well, B8. We wanted to throw in the check first. Of course. I apologize. I apologize. That was a mouse slip. Just checking to make sure that you are <laughs> Very on your Very good. Toes. Yes, Thank sir. You. Uh, rook check. Yeah. And, and uh, if you go I, king f6, I'm going to go f4. Even that position. Yeah, even then. I'm not even 100% yeah. sure of that, but just uh, clear the cobwebs. How are you killing me here? 
Mm. I mean, uh, king f6, f4, maybe I feel a little bit of panic uh, welling nope. up inside. I'm not killing anyone here. Four versus four, it does look a little doubtful as time slipping away, but so is the advantage for Levon. And Levon is, is going to be so angry with himself, oh, like, yeah. what have I done? I mean, he could have grabbed that knight on c5. And very uncharacteristic, knight very. c2. Okay, continue not guessing uh, anything not, in this game. We're not doing good. No. But then again, neither is Levon. He's not doing good with his, uh, with his handiwork. Knight to c2, attacking the rook. Yeah, and once again, rook b2 looks very obvious, but rook a4 probably is stronger. Uh, because that's just a fantastic square. Pretty much every single position here, the rook on a4 is more or less unchallengeable. There is no way white can attack it. It we also controls control the... e4. Yeah, so exactly. No e4. And then we start playing g5, h5, h4, and just like minimizing the king side as much as we can. Okay. We gain some space. Okay, I'm going to bite. I'm going to say a3 forced. Yep. Okay. G5. G5. And I'm going to say at this point. I ignore. King F2. King F2. King F2 King fair, fair, fair. H5. H5. And what we're just trying to do is secure the knight and saying, you're a pawn up. But literally, you're going to need to play King D3. I am going to get my king to E1. Oh, yeah. You're going to. Oh, have, yeah. You, king walks. <laughs> I am going to do. You did a book on King walks. I did. And it was just so much fun. It's great. Okay. So I'm going to go H4. And I'm gonna not touch anything. You're gonna go king d2. Okay. Yeah. Now. And uh, again, I realize I'm playing with fire. I might get my fingers burnt. <laughs> not, not, not really, but G eventually, four? maybe maybe already here, but we can also include king f7, basically sure. to play king c1 even. King f7. Get it as far away as possible. King f7, king c1. And, and, then, and then we play g4, leaving the h pawns on the board. Correct. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking that I'm ready to sacrifice a piece. I'd like to see your king even skedaddle itself uh, to the b2 square. So if you play f4, I start thinking about knight takes f4. Very and your much king so, yeah. is way... And, and, and if I don't, don't touch anything? Everything? anything? I think the threat is hg3, hg3, f4. Actually Remember. creating a passer on the king side. We, yeah, I mean, but this, we is, this is nice to break, show on the board. Yeah, remember those pawn breakthroughs that we learned as... As, uh, as, a, as babies? Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to say as experts, those pawn breakthroughs, they were charming. So the idea is if you take, I want to play g3. Mm -hmm. Just something to keep in mind as we're going to return to the current position. Sorry, I'm just going to uh, refresh my board to get updated by keeping. And we do have rook a4. By the way, I think that that's an incredibly instructive moment by Ali Reza not to play rook b2, where optically you're thinking your, your, your rook's active, but it's actually a4 is a, a key square. Mm -hmm. a3 on the board. And I want to say this is just such a strange game because portions of it, both players are playing really well. Ali Reza, right? Ali Reza kind of combines Sequences of incredibly precise defense with really inexplicable sleep ups. Mm -hmm. And Levon also outplayed the Lereza very cleanly, mm -hmm. and then we think pretty much didn't win the game in three moves, and then outplayed him again. Right. And then once again just made a decision that, uh, you know, for, for, for as experienced a positional player as he is, I am very surprised mm -hmm. with what he's done. I once lost a game uh, to Anatoly Karpov in Brussels where I really felt like literally I lost the game three times. I was losing the game and he was playing magnificently. He allowed me back in. I had equalized the game. I played badly and then, you know, he was back in control and finally I lost. But it took like... <laughs> like Three, three turns of passing the whole point back and forth between <laughs> before he claimed it on move 80 or whatever it was. And it, uh, and those just, are the absolute wars. They, oh, those, thank you. Those feel so bad. And they were German. That, that game <laughs> had a German going yeah. for it as well. So I was losing it over yeah. the course of 
three days or whatever it I, was. I, I, I have a very oh. specific game in mind when, when something brings up these types of sequences. Like I, I lost a game to Boris Gelfand in a Huntiman Says Grand Prix once. And I generally don't do well in Grand Prix. I played in a bunch of cycles. I've never really been in contention. And that was the one year where I was on like plus three out of the first, I don't know, seven or eight games. I was very finally nice. feeling good about my game, yeah. And then I lost two games in a row, one to Linier and one to Boris. And the one to Boris, I actually blundered something in a Grunfeld, which was made by notes, I just forgot. <laughs> and I very seriously considered resigning on Move 20. The position was that bad. I, I'm also very famous for resigning in all kinds of weird spots, but in that particular case, it honestly- It was justified. <laughs> yeah, it, I think many people would have considered resigning in that position. I decided to play on, and then Boris let me completely back in. And by Move 40, I thought, okay, I'm actually not losing this one somehow. And it kind of kept going and going and going. I lost it in a move like 85, going, mm. you know, having completely equalized at some point. It was Painful. Like, it's why? Just so... Why didn't you finish me off by move 25? We could have had a dinner, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just... Uh, but tell you... us about uh, Lanier Wesley. Is They're Wesley... repeating. They've repeated. They're repeating. They've repeated. But I guess this is only reaching move 40 because it's difficult for me to imagine that, that, uh, that Lanier doesn't to... try for a little bit at least. Right. Uh, because... There's absolutely no risk, so why not shuffle for a little bit more? But in general, uh, this now seems very, very defendable because it's difficult to imagine how white will do you know, anything, un untangle, untangle themselves to avoid trading A4, B6, or winning B6 with the trade of rooks, which, as we've established, is an e even easier draw. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, it seems like the advantage is more or less gone. Wesley has somehow uh, defended very precisely, and maybe somewhere around here, uh, Linear didn't need to go for that forced line with rook c7, rook a7. Maybe there was something more precise slightly earlier, but looks honestly just like Wesley defended very, very solidly, didn't make any mistakes, didn't panic at any point around here, just played very, uh, very good, very good chess. Although I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, ah, it's, it's, the, it's this once again. The engine actually very Plays seriously H4. prefers h4. Mm -hmm. And if we consider why, uh, the very simple, like simplistic, maybe even reason you could say, of preserving as many pawns as possible. To begin with. Yeah, because in this position, if in this position you put the king back on g3 and imagine there are pawns on h5 and h4, white oh. might be winning by, by taking on b6. Right. Because it will not be two against one, it will, will be three against two. And I will probably be able h4. to create the passer without the entire king side disappearing. Right. And then all of your theoretical knowledge of this being a draw with the king on a8 will really not come into play at all. Mm. So I think we can actually pinpoint more or less the exact moment where uh, winning, ch winning chances for, for Linear went from significant to perhaps not realistic anymore. 32 h to h4. You know, the sad part is the way you've just described it, Peter, mm -hmm. uh, makes it so obvious to ourselves, our viewers, of course, keep, preserve the pawns. Keep as many pawns on the yeah. board as possible. Play h4. Maybe you get I'm, rook h8 in on a good day mm -hmm. and uh, snip the h pawn. Exactly. Once you've played hg, hg, the contours of the draw become very clear. Exactly. Actually, I'm forcibly reminded of the game six in the World Championship match between uh, Magnus Carlsen and Nepomniachtchi. Yes. And there, the drawing technique was actually for Nepomniachtchi to maintain the pawns. So that was something that White could always um, focus on uh, having. He couldn't just advance. He had a free hand to advance, remember, if once the pawns got exchanged. But with those pawns on the board, then okay. it was definitely something to tie. But OK. Um, uh, and then I can see that uh, Peter is move 40. <laughs> baffled the, by the moves. Yeah, the, 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 the Up to now, everything made sense. Move, move 40 strikes again here, because uh, very cleverly here, Levon, specifically on the last move over the time control, moves the rook from c5 to b5, Inviting. asking the question, are you worried about knight before here or not, I guess. Because otherwise, I don't really see why that would change Black's plans whatsoever. I think King f7 just is a very, very logical move. Yeah, four and, versus three. And, and Alireza, for some reason, blinks and goes to rook c4. And now, after knight b4, I mean, I would assume this rook ending is drawn. But with the pawns as advanced as they are, they will become targets. And this is maybe not as clean, not as, clean as, uh, as you would think. And also, this is a b pawn. And this is exactly the pawn that you want, I think, in this five Amazing. against four endgames. 
or four against threes with the extra pawn on the other side. Mm -hmm. This is exactly the one you, you want because it's not very close to the black king and it does provide cover for our king right. if we at some point initiate a race. Right. Uh, I still think this is probably a draw with precise defense. I shouldn't be listened to about this topic, so I have no <laughs> idea, but <laughs> I'm betting this is a draw. Right. But this is a, uh, this platonic ideal of a draw. It might be, might, might be a draw theoretically, but, but is, it, is it a draw in practice? Yeah. I'm, I'm probably misusing platonic ideal horribly. I <laughs> should, should never do that again. So, By the way, I, I'm just looking at the clock. Uh, check this out. I'm seeing 31 seconds, which means by definition, because he gets a 30-second bonus, he made the move with one second on his clock. Look at this. Are you kidding yeah, me? And two he, seconds. He actually spends, two seconds, spends a couple of seconds calmly shrugging. Oh, my. Oh, that was very close. I, uh, shocking. <laughs> look, look, at I mean, look at this. I mean, three. Two. 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 And he hasn't started making a move yet. It's amazing. And then he, he kind of holds it a little bit. Make he sure. came very close to losing on time there. He certainly did. <laughs> I mean, then that was the last move. I mean, wow. Uh, Mind-boggling. Stunning, in fact. I mean, but... but these uh, guys are very fast. <laughs> I, 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 I mean it, right? absolutely. I mean, they're the best, best, best blitz players in the world. So that was crazy, though, just to leave yourself one second in a position. By the way, the move rook c4 was probably not the best move. King f7 or g7, uh, or frankly, any square. H4. Uh, yeah. I'm thinking that you know this was a kind of a con man's trick. You know, like that. Oh. Go ahead and attack my knight uh, so that I can play knight b4. Mm -hmm. But if you, for example, if you did play king f7 and you did play knight b4, then we were in a rook knight and c3. Forward. No, but also knight c3 and take on a3 next Oh, move. that's even simpler. Yeah. That, that's end of story. Nothing to discuss. I'm, I was going to say the rook ending. This, yeah. yeah, the rook ending is nothing. Uh, but because of rook c4, knight d5, you're actually giving white a reasonable chance of winning this if you take pawn a, takes a b and okay let's uh, employ the rules first the king has to come up sure. you don't want to let your king get cut off onto okay. the a throw okay and now I will, uh, and now rook c oh hang on a second there's some something needs to be done with my no actually no no i don't need to do anything about that one rook c2 all right if you like um i'm pushing b uh rook. five B2, rooks yep. below, behind, past pawns. I'm pushing this, this them. This actually might be lost, right? Yeah, it start, it start because your king is going to end up stuck on G7. And then we will round and up then and I'll, win the pawn on the 6 I'm Exactly. Sure, yeah. so, so this might be lost. Yeah. That's, and so, go... for example, let me just make a move for you. Yeah. This is where, this is where I'm now threatening okay. the skewer. Yeah, so I have to put my king on G7. And then... The idea is my king is going to come for this pawn. Now, probably I should start with e4. Or I, I wouldn't touch anything on the king side. Here. You think just king e1 and just go yeah, immediately? I, I, I wouldn't touch anything. I, I, I go immediately racing. So this is the position you want to avoid, Jovi. Uh, and probably even when you're here, um, throw in h4, or g4, or maybe to give your king the e5 square when I play b7 eventually. Yep. You know what I like? h4. You know what I like? Just go ahead and play h4. Okay, so uh, b5. nothing gets touched. b5, right. yeah. Let's take this guy off the board. Take that. Yeah, go rook b4 and chill that way. And chill this way. And put our king on e5, mm -hmm. yes? Mm -hmm. I like this. This is, yeah. this is where we go. So we get our pawn to b7. Something similar, but in this case... The king isn't given a free hand uh, to go, uh, and you've got your own counterplay based on g4. Something of this nature should be drawing what has taken place. By the way, Levon Cajoli, the old veteran that he is, the wily veteran, has played knight before and is inviting this ending that uh, he has some chances. Yeah. By the way, 
Yes, uh, if everyone oh, at home is um, who miss missing Fabi, Fabi. <laughs> well, you need not worry because we do have him here on tape. Cheers. Fabiana, welcome back to St. Louis, your home. Uh, welcome back to Grunches Tour. Also, we started to speak about the candidates, about the, the main tournament, one of the main tournaments of 2024. So, so what do you think in general about the state of affairs in the chess world on the top? Let's say with Magnus, who is like dropped some points here, there's Dingley Ren, who is absent for, absent for so long. Like what's going on <laughs> in, the, yeah, in the last year? What, what are your thoughts here? Yes. Yeah, for sure. It's a very unusual situation. Uh, I think that Magnus, he achieved everything that he could want in chess, in general. Um, so he probably didn't see any more value in terms of playing. Of course, there's always money, but maybe he doesn't uh, worry so much about the money anymore. And he was more thinking, I don't need this. And I don't really want to go through this process, which I can understand on some level, of course, because the uh, stress and the pressure and all the everything that comes with playing a world championship match or a candidates tournament, it, it does of course take a, a lot of energy out of you. So uh, at some point we have to make these personal decisions. Do we want to pursue success uh, or do we want to take care of our personal uh, life more, let's say. So this is just a personal decision. decision. It seems like he uh, has less interest in classical chess as a whole. I think this is not a revelation. He said it himself that he wants to focus more on rapid, chess blitz chess, maybe some other forms of chess like uh, chess 960 or uh, or other things. Uh, in terms of Ding, I, I really can't say so much because he's less public than Magnus, so we, we don't know his thoughts as much. But he has been remarkably absent. I mean, he hasn't played anything or had like, let's say, a meaningful sort of um, role in the chess world since he became world champion. He played one event, the Grand Chess Tour event in Bucharest. It was... Yeah, it was very unsuccessful for him, and he didn't play any other events. He said that he will come back next year. That's what we can kind of... Maybe for the World Championship, right? So maybe for that, <laughs> but he, he said that he would come back in January to play an event. Uh, if so, that, that'll be interesting to see his return. I'm also very interested to see how he plays after a long break. Um, and yeah, in terms of the next match, of course, it'll be very interesting whoever he faces. Um, yeah, I, I think that we, we're seeing a little bit of a transition maybe in terms of other players who are getting more motivated, Magnus taking more of a step back from classical chess, Ding being a little bit of a wild card now. Actually, speaking about Magnus and the fact that he doesn't want to play classical chess that much, um, do you think it's a chance for you actually to be on top and now you're a second player in the in the world and so do you, this gap is not so big anymore. So would you try to actually to well, be on the top? I, I've always tried. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I've, I've always tried. Um, Magnus was always a, a huge obstacle, let's say, for every player who was trying to become uh, the best in the world. And uh, at some point we were close, but he always had that uh, bit of an edge on me in terms of results. And at some point I was catching up a bit, but then uh, also at some points falling behind because I didn't have the consistency that he has. And I lost my motivation during the COVID years completely. Uh, this was... I think uh, I wasted a lot of time during those years. So maybe it was my own fault, but also I think the world situation was a little bit difficult and confusing and uh, the chess world as well. It wasn't exactly clear what would happen uh, in the chess world to chess tournaments, to the future of chess or the world in general. So um, yeah, definitely lost a bit of time. And but I think- now? What, yeah. no, what about now? It's just 30 something points. <laughs> No, I, to me, it's it's less about the rating because I understand ratings go up and down, and um, uh, yeah, maybe Magnus lost a bit of rating recently. But um, I'm not thinking too much about the rating. For me, the main goal is really the candidates tournament and uh, do it performing well there and performing well in general. So um, I think that Magnus has always taken a pragmatic view of tournaments, as in he's he's trying to win the tournament. He's not trying to gain rating or anything. So uh, I also feel like this is the most important that. Um, yeah, it's it's all about the tournaments and playing well, and uh, and the results usually come if you're in good shape. 
Yes, so this is what I wish you. I mean, all the best of luck in this in this tournament. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Hello, I'm Women's Grandmaster Begim Tokharjanova. I will be creating content for Grand Chess Tour. Follow us on social media and catch more behind the scenes content. The St. Louis Chess Club is the premier chess facility in the United States. We bring the educational benefits of chess to thousands of students across the St. Louis area. We also promote chess at the highest levels, hosting all levels of the U.S. championships, as well as high-profile tournaments that attract the world's best players. Become a member and enjoy perks such as free classes and lectures, weekly tournaments, and so much more. Visit stlouischessclub.org to claim your membership today. The World Chess Hall of Fame, located in the heart of St. Louis's historic Central West End. Want to know why chess has intrigued people around the world for nearly 1,500 years? Stop by and learn about the impact of chess from our three floors showcasing the art, culture, and history of the game. The World Chess Hall of Fame has something for everyone to enjoy. For more information on current exhibits, please visit worldchesshof.org. St. Louis, the chess capital of the United States. It also plays host to an award-winning shop dedicated to chess merchandise, all occasion gifts, and plenty more. At Q Boutique, you can shop both in-store and online. From quirky greeting cards to luxury chess sets, there is something for everyone at Q Boutique. Enjoy a shopping experience like no other. Make sure to check out QBoutiqueSTL.com for a wide variety of gifts for everyone to enjoy. The St. Louis Chess Club Scholastic Program brings the educational value of chess to kids and schools across the St. Louis area. Active in over 100 schools throughout the St. Louis city and county, the St. Louis Chess Club has been able to reach over 85,000 students in both in-school and after-school programs. We view chess as a valuable educational tool. Learn more about our scholastic programming by visiting stlouischessclub.org education. Hello, I'm Women's Grandmaster Riem Tokharjanova. I will take you behind the scenes of the Grand Chess Tour. Follow us on social media and don't miss out on players' interviews and more content from the playing hall. The St. Louis Chess Club is the premier chess facility in the United States and is among the best in the world. Thanks to co-founders Dr. Jeannie Cairn Sinkfield and Rex Sinkfield, the St. Louis Chess Club is a non-profit organization committed to promoting the game of chess locally and internationally. We bring the educational benefits of chess to thousands of students across the St. Louis area, promoting cognitive development, critical thinking, concentration, and analytical skills. The St. Louis Chess Club welcomes chess lovers of any age and skill level to come and enjoy the game of chess. We also promote chess at the highest levels, hosting all levels of the U.S. Championships and the American Cup, as well as high-profile tournaments that attract the world's best players, including the prestigious Sinkfield Cup, Cairns Cup, and many more. All tournaments can be streamed via our YouTube and Twitch channels that also include over 2,000 chess lectures for anyone to enjoy. Become a member and enjoy perks such as free classes and lectures, weekly tournaments, merchandise discounts, and so much more. Visit stlouischessclub.org to claim your membership today. The World Chess Hall of Fame, located in the heart of St. Louis's historic Central West End. Want to know why chess has intrigued people around the world for nearly 1,500 years? Stop by and learn about the impact of chess from our three floors showcasing the art, culture, and history of the game. Landmarked by the world's largest chess piece sitting outside our front door, the World Chess Hall of Fame has something for everyone to enjoy, including various exhibitions, monthly concerts, and much more. Whether you are a beginner or a professional, there is something for everyone to learn here at the World Chess Hall of Fame. Enjoy free admission to our rotating exhibitions in our galleries and sign up for chess events, family-friendly programming, and art classes. And don't forget to stop by our award-winning gift shop, Q Boutique, and shop a wide selection of chess-related merchandise. 
For more information on current exhibits, please visit worldchesshof.org. St. Louis, the chess capital of the United States, boasts the world-class St. Louis Chess Club and the World Chess Hall of Fame. It also plays host to an award-winning shop dedicated to chess merchandise, all occasion gifts, and plenty more. At Q Boutique, you can shop both in-store and online for chess merchandise, autograph collectibles, chess campus souvenirs, and much, much more. From quirky greeting cards to luxury chess sets, there is something for everyone at Q Boutique. And all purchases go right to benefiting new exhibitions and programs at the World Chess Hall of Fame, dedicated to exploring chess and its immense impact on art and culture. Located on the first floor of the World Chess Hall of Fame, enjoy a shopping experience like no other and become everyone's favorite gift giver. If you can shop in store, make sure to check out QBoutiqueSTL.com for a wide variety of gifts for everyone to enjoy. Hello and uh, welcome back. And as the players have made the time control, well, we Barely. already have <laughs> two results. And uh, let's check them out. Was a draw between Richard Report against Anish Giri, whereas uh, it was also an in-game draw between Maxime Vachelagrave and Jan Pomniacci. But in the other two remaining games, it does seem like the players are. Some of the players are struggling. And uh, just to remind everyone of the schedule. So, round six will be played on Monday, November 27th. Tomorrow, it is a rest day for the players and for ourselves. It's a time for us to re-energize, recuperate and perhaps relax. And the players will be playing all the way through to November the 30th. And remember, there will, there will be playoffs if they are required. Absolutely. Thank you, Jovi. And in the ending between Levan and uh, Ali Reza during our break, uh, we're making a rather shocking discovery, uh, Peter. Levan might just simply be winning. It does appear so. And it's a kind of an endgame where I think I would know that this is trickier than normal. Right. Because very often uh, these types of endgames where one side has an extra pawn on the side and everything is symmetrical on, on the other side, it's normally three against three, these three, without, right. the, without the E pawns. Right. The addition of the E pawns pretty much always makes it a more difficult endgame to defend. For the but defender, I don't think, yeah. for, for, for the weaker side of course, but yeah. I don't think I would be instantly confident that we are winning here mm. with white. But Yes, it does feel like Black is in trouble, and the plan that we were discussing before we went on break, very specifically, very simple plan of just trying to put the rook on b8, driving the pawn all the way to b7, which normally in three, in three against three end games, just instantly ends the game in a draw. Correct. Yeah. But because there's, there will be this target on e6 for the white king to, to inch towards, this appears to just be a winning threat. So Black cannot really afford to... Uh, just kind of pass forever as you would have done in mm -hmm. uh, in a normal situation like without playing, the e pawn. Yeah, playing right. something like king g7, let's say b6, king f7, b7, king g7. Once again, if you push them a bit further up right. and remove the e pawns, this is a very very simple draw owing to the fact that once the king reaches the vicinity of the b7 pawn, we start giving checks from, from behind. From behind, and you can never actually stay close to the pawn for long enough to vacate the, the b8 square with the rook. So this would be just a very, very simple technical draw, once again, without these two. But with them on the board, why just goes king d6? Right. And says, gimme. Right, yeah. and if the pawn wasn't in e6, you'd happily drop back with your rook to yeah. b1. And uh, slightly more difficult is this, but still, we pl I mean, here king c7, of king course. King c7. Yeah. In fact, it's on b7, so I don't even need to explain uh, Tsukzwangs, which could happen after King E7. I'm pretty sure, right. pretty sure King E7 is also winning. Absolutely. But there's absolutely, there's absolutely no reason for White to even do that because King C7 wins kicks the, the rook away and does give us the time to play rook anywhere and just win a full rook for, for that. And Alireza, I think, is now coming to terms so, after King E3 has been played onto the board by Levon. He's coming to terms with the fact that he is desperately, he needs very, very desperately to find some kind of counterplay on the king's side to stop this incredibly straightforward plan from landing on the board. Mm. But it's unclear how. 
you could try rook c1, rook h1, right. but that's just not fast enough. Because after rook b7 checking, f6, b5, if you actually try going after that pawn, you're just not in time to return. Rook b8, very important, rook h1, b6, sorry, b7. With the king on g7, if you played rook, rook b1 story. here, there probably is a draw, because now the h pawn will be enough of a destruction. Right. But with the king on f6, there is no defense against rook f8 check, and so black just resigns here. And apart from rook c1, rook b1, you are struggling really to name a legitimate source of counterplay. You can remove a lot of pawns from, from the king side by playing something like h3, but... Uh, for, for some reason, it's important to play king d3 here. Once again, I'm struggling to explain this even to myself, that, let's say, rook b8 here isn't winning anymore because h takes, h takes, and g4 provides enough of a cover. Right. But if we start with king d3, rook c1, okay. and now we play rook b8, I guess the big difference is in this position we will be taking on g4. So it was important for us to kick away the rook from c4. And not allow rook to yeah, g4. So, so that we can fix this structure. And once again, it seems like we're losing the g3 pawn with check. None. But it will, not be, it will not be returning quickly enough. Yeah. yeah. With the, with, with the, and, and this mechanism we haven't shown yet, so let's show with this the gear. very yeah. important mechanism. Seems like black is fine, but yeah. no. No. Rook h8 followed by rook h7 takes b7. Right. Uh, feels like... Even, even the engine with its, you know, precision power and everything isn't, <clears throat> isn't capable of holding this against uh, good play from white, but in practical terms we have seen so many swings of the evaluation of this game already that <laughs> I wouldn't be very, very confident on betting that nothing else will happen now, that this will now right. conclude exactly the way it's supposed to conclude from here. But Levon is very much in control. Yeah, and Ali Reyes' fans are going to be disappointed because of the race for the Elo. Right, exactly. I mean, we are on ratings watch because the highest rated person on January the 1st will get that spot into the 2024 candidates. And so far, Ali Reza Faruja has a live rating of 2761. Right. Wesley So is not that far behind, 2756. And uh, Anish Giri is also in contention, 2753. But if he loses... The simplest way is calculating a loss of five rating points for the loss. And whoop, suddenly he would have a lower rating than Wesley So. Yeah. It's actually maybe even slightly more than five points because slightly he, more he outrates Levon. Uh, Levon has not had the best uh, last couple of years in 27-27 uh, that we... Ah. Yeah, so Le Levon is going to cost... Uh, maybe six. Like five and a half thereabouts. Right, yeah, gotcha. But honestly, they're all as so closely bunched together that that, that additional half a point it of might Elo be all in. might be the, the <laughs> very, very important oh. in the final count. And we'll return to the Rukan game, which is by far right. the more exciting of the two remaining games. But just to mention that this is still running. Right. Lanier is trying to get somewhere here against uh, against Wesley. But it seems like these two are now coming off the board. I can play bishop d7 and just threaten to take it next move. That's and, the simplest. And it seems like there is just not going to be very much uh, here for, well. for Lanier to, uh, to continue fighting with. Uh, Wesley, understandably, is trying to figure out last move g2, g3 in particular seems like a, mm -hmm. a very committal move. There's really no, going to be no changes of structure on the king side like this. So he understandably wants to make sure he doesn't blunder something simple. But it seems like the queen side is disappearing. And if we're talking about some position like this... Exactly. Best case scenario seems to me that you somehow manage to sacrifice this rook for the bishop and the pawn on g4. Precisely. Which... I mean, you can imagine this being winning if the Black King is on AA. <laughs> if it's on any kind of a reasonable square. G6. Yeah. A, I mean, in front of pawns is very easily drawn. But even, let's say, on D7 to begin with, should be a very, very comfortable draw. So I, I don't quite know exactly how uh, Black is supposed to uh, misplay it badly enough so that uh, Wesley loses. Thank you, Peter. And again, uh, it's all about uh, the game between Levon and Ali Reza. We, again, we've seen so many turns in this game. We thought that Levon should have been winning more or less out of the late middle game, and we were stunned by a number of decisions that Levon made that appeared to give Ali Reza a pretty um, convenient draw. It was this moment, move 40, that something really extraordinary happened, Jovi, that I'm still reeling from. We always say in chess, you know, last move blunder. The last 
move of the time control is the 40th move is the mm -hmm. blunder. Yeah. Well, this is a classic case in point. Uh, the last move by Levon, rook c5. At this point, a simple move like king f7 would have been fine. King g7 would have been fine. h4. The one thing he didn't need to do was move his rook. His rook is ideal, actually, on a4, and he moved it with one second. On this I know. Clock. I mean, keeping oh, us all entertained. Wow! But that was such a shock, and he nearly lost the game on the spot. And after moving the rook, he did invite this rook and pawn in the game, which we now consider, well, as Peter just explained, probably lost. Probably lost. And uh, he's he, he's finally made a move here, leaving Rooksy himself once check. again 12 minutes for now the rest of the game. No more time forthcoming for Alireza. Very clearly, you should not be going backwards here. After king d2, rook b3, your conversion will become difficult, if not, uh, if not impossible, because the, the, the very clever plan of getting the king over uh, to e5. e5. So just to illustrate once again, if we, right. we, we, we can try achieving uh, the same setup, but the right. king goes to e5. Actually, he, here this loses. So uh, Do we so need to play h4 first? I think king e7 is the only move that makes a draw. I'm so confused by all of this. <laughs> <laughs> Can we see but, but why you, the computer wins on King E5? King E5, it goes King C2 and it says now we have enough tempi. Okay. This position now after B6 is no longer a draw because I'm guessing once it gets to B7, we will be able to shake. I, I think I can maybe demonstrate. Let Please, me, H4. Let, H4. Me, H4. let me try and make a couple of waiting moves. Okay. And now I think we are probably winning with E4. Because what I want to do is to play e4 and then play f4 check. But here, after takes, takes king d6, this is enough. So I guess I'm going to be doing this with the king on c5. I think this is maybe the right plan, but I need to, I need to organize it in a more clever fashion. But the king can take a wonder, right? Yeah, and a wonder. Be... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, one more. Up, yeah. up. Yeah, we can go to g7 as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, provoke rook b1. And then actually maybe go all the way around. Yeah. Go all the way around and, <laughs> all win, around and, and the win, world. win that way. Right? In 80 days. Right. F7, G6, and eventually the, the king said. Because black is also completely stuck, because obviously it's very important for black to be able to cover the king with, with pawns, because the moment white gives a check to this king, the game ends. I, I'm still confused, Peter. Help me out here. Uh, go H4, please. Okay. Okay, and, and the hair you can just. Is GH, take. GH a draw? Yeah. F4 check, apparently. Yeah, F4 check is now winning, because F4 check takes, is... takes, king takes F4, king takes A6. And eventually I will play e4. Mm. Now I guess I bring the king all the way back and I go e2, e4. Is the winning plan. So you do this, I do this, you do this. <laughs> and I actually, because if I play e4 here, I'm worried black will make a draw rook down. Right. Yeah. So that was I wanted, what I was hoping. I want it back. So I bring it all the way back. Oh no. Yeah, it's beautiful, yeah, isn't yeah, yeah. it? Oh, this is too much. So we do this, we get you to play rook b6, and then we go. Hello. Please allow me to <laughs> give you a check at some point. Please. In the words of Shakri Armani, come more, on! <laughs> you can be even more cruel, right? You can move your king to d2 and get it that way, and then go e4. Mm, yeah, you, you, can, you can fine tune it even further, but this is enough. With the king on c2, there, there will never be enough counterplay. Wow. So rook c3 check played, and once again, I just want to point out that in, in sort of purely human terms, there needs to be a very, very specific reason not to play king d4, and I don't think... Let me just find my place. There is so much stuff on my screen. Rook c3 played. You, you, you always play king d4. The right. reason not to play king d4 is you find out this immediately blunders a pawn somewhere. Right. Okay. So... And, and if... Okay, rook c2, let's try for something. Now okay, I'm being, very, I'm being very... I'm being very... Put upon, I feel, because once again, judging by these evaluations, this is the only move that wins. What? Uh, oh, okay, makes sense. And uh, yeah, this is another thing that sometimes converts this position quite comfortably because you just protect everything. I will play b5. I will right. maybe even play f3, f4, uh, and then the black will never be able to attack anything, and I will start pushing. And we do king have king play d4 as a prelude. Yeah. But, but still, I'm sorry. Why isn't I king mean, d3? King winning? d3. Yeah. Yeah. Why isn't this winning? But apparently, apparently now. Uh, there is enough, maybe it's just not thinking deeply enough. This might still be winning, honestly, because it's it's now, no, specifically e5 saves the game. Why? And then, <laughs> and then g4. Or g4. And then black actually generates enough on the king side that we no longer 
can safely uh, run up the board. Because I guess G of 3, of 3, 4 at some point will become a topic. This is all very intricate and wow. uh, way above my, my understanding. I'm, I'm going to be entirely honest with you. Um, but king d4 is on the board. I assume uh, Ali Reza will play rook c2 because if you play rook b3, these are, all of these variations are now a full tempo down. Exactly. Which I assume now after rook b2, uh, even b6, and this is what I was seeing on my screen. Before. This, this starts being winning because after rook b8, yes, this time you actually uh, get, right. get your setup, but you still lose this position because this happens a lot, a lot quicker than black can react to. Let's say e5. We go king c6, and if we check, we go king d5, and you have to come back, and then stuff starts falling apart. Right. Uh, so, as you can see from this variation, uh, the, the, pr the problem of the black pawns not being compact and not being on their starting squares right. is such that we can even give up, uh, give up stuff, in, the stuff in the center and still be much faster than whatever it is that black is doing. At various times, I feel like we get master classes in openings and endings, certain middle games, and uh, this one, yet again, uh, giving us a master class rook, c2. c2. Yeah, and this is board. a very, very important point in the game, because if, if we are to trust uh, what the, the all-seeing what, what all eye is telling us, the all-seeing eye is saying that rook e5, defending the pawn from e2, not the most Obvious move, I think a lot of humans, myself included, would be reaching to play king d3 here. But rook e5, the idea is to get the rook out of the way so that when we push the pawn, we can support it with our king and we can build a bridge. Jody. Yeah, I was just going to say, though, we do have certain rules in rook and pawn endings. Please. So if, first of all, if you do have that extra pawn, your, the ideal place for your rook is to be behind your own passed pawn. Right. And then if it's not behind, then you want it on the side. Yes. And then finally, it's in front. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so That's there is the worst that, place. There is that little saying to aid Levon. Right. In this particular case, too, the reason why I might suddenly go, hang on a bit, I do have rook e5 because... If you play king f6 and I don't see the move f4, I do see the move rook e3. Absolutely. Yeah. And then e3 I start is a very thinking, stable setup. Wait a minute. Rook, the rook would behind. Gone past pawns, right? So now I want to play b5, rook b3, and then I'm absolutely certain I'm winning. Then it's like if I get that, if you, if we're off to the races and it's done. So I think if he just stops mm -hmm. uh, himself here, uh, rook e5. And he has stopped, which I think is yeah. a good sign for, for Levon here. It's and fair. I think yeah. what was confusing me was specifically I want to show one particular Please. position after rook e5. King f6, yes, I could understand that it loses, right. but I was wondering about this. And right. I asked myself, what, what exactly is the threat here? Because with the king on e6, it feels like the black king is close enough to the pawn to uh, be able to participate in the races. But in fact, Rook b3 is a threat here because even with the king on d6, let's make a H4, pass, H4. passing move of okay. some sort. Yeah. Yeah. Like, this is a queen. Yeah. Oops. If it was on d7, there would be king c8, king b8, but it's right. on d6. Right. And this is just a queen. It, you struggle to give up rook for it, frankly. Mm -hmm. right. But <laughs> so, we put it on king d6 to yeah. stop <clears throat> king e5 as well. Yeah. So there was a reason. Exactly. Yeah. So if, if, if you play this, I'm pretty sure I, I win on the spot by just playing king f5 coming and cleaning in. cleaning yeah, the king and, side. And then this yeah. whole thing will collapse very, right. very comfortably. So you get here, and then you suddenly realize exactly like h4, white will just go like gh, gh rook b3. Oops. And then after e5 check, as Yasser is describing, like just drop the king anywhere. And you, you do know you will win this. Yes. It might take some work, but you do know you will win this. Yeah, 100%. And uh, yeah, I think rookie five is findable, but... Um, it's not the most intuitive and the most obvious move. And again, uh, did we rule out king d3? King d3 is a draw. King d3 variation? seems to be leaning towards a draw for very, very specific reasons. But once again, I think the position after king d3, rook b2, rook b8 will be desperate enough for Alireza to start reaching for e5 and g4 because he will know that if he passes for three more moves, he, he might loses. as well he might as well resign here. Right. So you you play e6 e5 immediately, b5 g4, uh, let's say b6. Right. And you can even play f5 f4. And as you can see, there is now constantly a threat of a passer being created on the king side, which means that our king marches are just much much slower than they uh, need to be. 
and so much stuff disappears on the king side. I'm that you're sorry, just, Peter. It's still yeah. not intuitively obvious. B7, king G7, a king E4. Oh, oh, oh no, king C4, king C4. Yeah. Isn't H4 the big idea? No, it just goes with B1 even. Oh. King D5, it goes. And now it goes takes takes and h4 and it this says this is your passer yeah, yeah. and this it says now now too. i will and you might be able to get uh, f and h after gh but like the the famous the famous end game that people often describe actually here you don't get it because g3 is strictly the only move but it does make a draw but even let's say i mean this is losing but the, the point being that how do i how do i do organize it. it right yeah yeah like sometimes maybe you will be able to achieve this but this is supposedly a draw king king d3 play king, king d3, d3 on played. the board the very human move and this is where you have to find e5 and g5 i think maybe even specifically in the, only in that order as well so rook b8 because if e5. you start if, if you start with g4 i'm pretty no, sure you lose four. you lose to f4 and you will never actually be able to shake the structure exactly so it has to be e5 first right mm -hmm. instantly and then g4 and then you start threatening all kinds of breaks meaning that the white king is very restricted a and can white delay playing rook to b8 i mean it looks the most natural move on the mm -hmm. board but what just else? bearing you in can, mind you that throw, we know you can throw in the check but it doesn't really change very much because b5 e5 I'm, once again i'm going for the, for the exact same but to, uh, to, 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 to support, support Jovi in her question, leave the rook on b5 for a moment because I, we, mm -hmm. knowing <laughs> what we know, yes. h4. So, no, h4, I think you would just immediately allow, oh, no, this is the, oh, no, not with the rook on b5, of course. Ah, so. you see, that's why we left it. We tricked Peter, give ourselves credit, yeah. just a second. h4. Okay, um, it says g4 is now not losing because f4 runs into rook b3 check. Okay. And after this, you can even take this way. Really? Wow. Because the threat of creating a passer on the G file. Oh my and, word! And, the, and after this, e I, I think this right? is actually instinctively understandable because it seems like we've given White its second passer. Of yeah. But it's like in the context of these positions, the second passer is completely irrelevant. Irrelevant because the king will be staying on H7 anyway. So you can actually play H5. I mean, I've, I've lost the game along the way for some reason, but I wanted to illustrate yeah. the fact that this setup is very sturdy. You're still not, not winning this position. So I'm still confused. Uh, if I go after the e-pawn now, uh, Peter, with the king d4? There's, al there's always a four. Oh, I, I want to play e3. I beg your pardon. Okay. Oh, then you're going to go e5. I'm, I'm going to go e5. I, and then yeah. f4. I'm going to go f5. And That's four. it. Yeah. That's it. Okay. I now have legitimate counterplay because I've created of a course. disbalance on the, on the king side, right. allowing me to create a passer. In the meantime, Lev has played rook b7 check. I don't know if... There's apparently a massive difference between king g6 and king f6, but I don't think anybody plays king g6. In this no, position. they all just, play king f6. It just doesn't, king f6. Look, right. doesn't look normal to play king g6. This is an incredibly complex mm. rook and 5 versus rook and 4, but I think, Peter, you mentioned that the pawn on b4, that's the legitimate when you have five versus four. C pawn is a little bit too close it's a bit to the too kings. Close, yeah, A pawn, mm -hmm. um, you don't have the okay. winning. This in-game is very fascinating, but just can no, yeah, we let's take check a look. in let's take a look at the other on one. the other yeah. game between Lanier because, and Wesley? Uh, Wesley has done something which I would have been reluctant to do, but I guess it just holds. Because we left it here, he did play bishop d7, Lanier played rook a7, king e6, bishop f4. And his, obviously this was already a plan for Wesley before he played king e6. He just took on a4 here saying, I don't believe this is a problem either. I would have been reluctant to enter this because why? But right. uh, you put the king on f6 and then eventually, like white will struggle to actually get the pawn the to, advance, g, yeah, to g4 the and f5. Right. The setup with the bishop on d7, uh, like we can, we can continue the line a little bit. So we get here, white puts the bishop on... Wasn't, wasn't there some C3. famous endgames here where grandmasters have lost this? Yes. Yeah, I yes. can remember some. Where the bishop no, but I think, missed. I, I think this is a long enough diagonal that the bishop stays on it. So the, the trick here is, of course, we just chill and I eventually, go G4, eventually you do this. I go F3. And I can continue chilling. And I go the problem bishop is, D2 and king E5, and then I yeah. can't move anywhere. Yeah, so, so this is one position where right. everything is completely uh, frozen. and. The other one would be you play king g3, you play right. a4, and then you find yourself completely unable to push a5 without yeah. giving up the, the pawns for, exactly. for the bishop. Exactly, for the bishop. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay, well, very good Wesley, as he's uh, found his fortress. 
And for Wesley, again, in that race for uh, the rating place in the candidates, a draw uh, is very, 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 very uh, meaningful. Uh, exactly. It's very important for Wesley not to lose. Exactly. And uh, let's bear in mind as well, tomorrow is a rest day. Yes. No one wants to <laughs> go into turn, turn a rest day <laughs> having, having lost. lost. I, well, yeah. Before we perhaps wait for that game to conclude, there is something sure. I wanted to sort of ask myself and also you. Uh, if we allow King G5, do we lose? Let's say we go Bishop D7 here. Uh, okay, please don't do that to me. Oh, okay. Well, let me do it on let's, my let's board. Do it, let's uh, do it on your board. Uh, give, give me the variation you'd like to take a look at, uh, Peter. Rook takes a4. Uh, yeah. Uh, bishop takes a4. Bishop a4, king g4. Let's king, say bishop king. d7, king, g, king g5. So you allow, my, if, for reasons that aren't clear to us, you allow my king to be on g5. And then you're, you're, the question that you want to ask is that you're allowing me to play f4, g4, f5, uh, yeah. uh, check. Yeah, it gets it gets to the to the squares which I generally would not like to to allow it to get to. I exactly. I would be very worried uh, to allow the pawns. Although the question is, by the way, they're keeping their rooks on the board, which I think makes it life even a lot more simpler for um, Wesley. Um, I don't know, Jovi. Well, I've got the table base right in front of me, and, and it's it saying says, draw. Draw. Draw, but you have to know the technique, which is when you get to, to the pawn on f5. Yeah, when you get to the pawn on f5, it's very important to go with the king up to e5. Should the okay, bishop? Okay, but my bishop, my bishop, I was messing around, and I put my bishop on c4, so that might okay. make a difference. Well, that was fine. I can do that too. Uh, so you want to go after, for example, f4, bishop. E six. Yeah. Some, okay. Well, I, ha I have I have this position on my board. So okay. I can I can match your position for just a moment. Okay. Bishop c one, king e six, and, and against f five, you want me to put my king. Yeah, that's the only drawing move. King e five. Yeah. That is actually very uh, important to know in these types of positions. So it's a good thing that we are putting it on the screen. Because yeah, my my feeling was if we if we go back to f seven, we have probably lost. Right. Because eventually we will run out of, uh, and this is why I was speaking about the C8H3 being a long diagonal, and I can probably finally do it do it on my screen as well, so we can okay. we can use a larger screen. Right. We might need a bigger screen. Uh, we're gonna need a bigger boat. We are, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna need a bigger screen here. So we're talking about this position in which uh, we're doing everything wrong. We actually, yeah, yeah. So let's show what I was afraid of. This is now no longer a draw, right. because your drawing technique here is to uh, control with the king and the bishop the g6 square now. Correct. So white wants to play g5 and g6. Right. Once they reach the sixth rank, it pretty much is always winning. Right. So you want to try and prevent this, but this diagonal is just not long enough for the bishop to stay on it convincingly. So you, like, you play bishop e8, I go king f4, you go king g7, I give a check. You go king h7. Let's say king h7, g5. And this is just like after bishop e5, uh, the king will the king will enter, and you have to stop king f6, but you don't have enough squares. It gets to f6, you play g5, g6, and eventually uh, the squares run out, and you resign. And this is why it was so important to uh, keep them on g4 and f4, where there is plenty of squares on this diagonal. But what has happened is the rooks have stayed on the board, and what and Wesley's actually managed to maintain mm -hmm. his pawn on g4 which means that his life is so much easier. The worst he could pro possibly get is rook and bishop versus rook. I guess, no, I, I, I think what, the reason Lanier continues playing here is first of all, why not? Here's a pawn up and no risk. But secondly, I think the plan here would be to try and somehow surprise Wesley into some kind of a, not mating neck exactly, it's, a, it's an empty board. <laughs> right. But to drive the king, I don't know, far, far away and continue attacking the king. Because yeah, uh, hoping to win the game by F3. Trading f2 for g4 and then somehow winning the bishop for the g pawn is just not very realistic. No, no. Excellent. And I think we should probably return to the kings and uh, to, to, to the rook ending because it's Please. just much more uh, complicated to, to defend. King f6 has been found in the sure. meantime, unsurprisingly, because as we said, it's just a much more natural square for the king. And Levon is now back to thinking, but having played rook b7 check, 
He kind of, I think he commits, commits himself to going B5, B6 and so on. Right. And Alireza will have to uh, play the plan that we were describing with uh, E5 and G4, but he also will not have very much choice, mm -hmm. I don't think, which to my eyes feels like he probably finds it just out of sheer necessity. Exactly. Mm -hmm. well, well, Levant does have uh, another plan, which is just to s secure the king's side before pushing the pawn. But that's but the problem. That was the we problem. don't have uh, a, a good way exactly? of doing that. Uh, the desirable h4, h4 ran into g4. I guess you could go h3 and g4. h3, I guess uh, g4 is now supposedly a draw. I wonder if e5 is also a draw. e5 also seems to be holding. Mm -hmm. uh, the big question I was, was going to ask myself after h4, do we absolutely have to go for this really strange idea of giving white an additional passer. And it says no, it says you can also do this, and now king e5, and even like wasting a tempo with rook, uh, with mm -hmm. rook b1 apparently is, okay. is enough. But this is a moot point because mm -hmm. b5 has been played. Mm -hmm. Bavon has gone for the most direct. Yeah, and Ed here it once again appears to be an absolutely only move to make, e6, e5. e5 followed by g4, keeping those yeah. pawn break patterns in uh, your and arsenal. E6, E5. King E5. Yeah, I was going to say King E5 is, no. no. Yeah, King E5 played. I was going to ask that yeah. question. And now after B6, you're just not fast enough. Well, your engine seems to ha no, be, it, be, it, be it, having uh, <laughs> a, a manic depressive. <laughs> Adjusting, <laughs> right? They're uh, going up and down. And in here, this here, here the no. problem is, yes, you can control the B pawn, but eventually, like, white goes B7 and then trades it. The pawn innings are all lost. All lost. So you have to give white a tempo to collect something, and white is just threatening rook E8, trading the B pawn for the E pawn, and those endgames, pretty much all of them will be... Will be lost. Or rook g8 harvest. takes g5 as well, it's very, very strong. So b6 blitzed, the board. blitzed out by Lev, yeah. Uh, happy to have that opportunity. Yeah, further reinforcing the, the, the idea that these endgames really are difficult to play, even for the very best players. Truly. Yeah. King e5. But I think you made a very good point, seriously, Peter, this idea that you would have seen king e5, b6, you would have analyzed and realized you're losing. So you start to think about e5, mm -hmm. just because king e5 mm -hmm. leads you uh, and, and, to a dead end. This is where you also have to discuss the fact that there was a bunch of decisions to be taken since move 41, so Alireza actually got there with like seven minutes on the clock. Mm -hmm. And you get to this position, you don't actually have like an internal alarm system that tells you only move alert, please think here. Right. You've got seven minutes. King e5 seems logical. e5 seems like it's slow. It's not doing very much. It's only like moving your own weaknesses closer to the white king <laughs> right. so that it has a more convenient time collecting them later. Right. Uh, so you just make a move which, which looks the, the most natural and now, oops, you've lost again. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all very I have, heartbreaking. I, I have this image of um, Peter and I playing as a team but we can talk with one another. And then Peter is giving me this most depressing news, you know, like, <laughs> look, we're gonna lose it this way, we're gonna lose it that way. We might as well make it as easy as possible for our opponent and move our weaknesses closer to the White King. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, like, okay, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering how we lose if we give this check. And apparently, yeah, I was kind of curious if we can take on E2 here, but I think we discussed this, right? Oh, no, no, we no, didn't have, we didn't we didn't have that it. position. This is no. not the same position. We didn't discuss this is not this a, and, and, and this position is only lost for one very specific reason. Oh, this no. is just a study. This is just a study. And rook check and rook b5? And if rook no. b2, you lose very specifically check. to rook a5, b5. <laughs> and if rook c2 check, we go king, king b3, three. rook c6 is not winning, actually. You have to go forward. King b5, rook b2, king c6. Rook c2 check, we go into d7, and if rook b2, rook a5, rook a5 check, and then we return to c6, and we have the, bridge. the, bridge, and, the bridge built. Yeah. And does black have any salvation in perhaps sacrificing the rook for the pawn and trying to you, you, run with it, his own The, the question is where exactly? Yes, you yeah, have very king much d4, right king d4. King d4, we switch to this. No, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. you're yeah. supposed Gobble to go king c6. I, so I, I, I know I'm kind of cheating here, but no, we, now we're winning, we're just we're collecting switch. the entire mm -hmm. king side. Yeah. Nice. Uh, 
Jovi, is actually pretty ironic. Uh, prior to the U.S. Championship, uh, Sam Shanklin had come to me at the opening ceremony and said, yes, sir, three years of work. And given me this massively thick book on rook endings. So what did Sam do in his first five rounds? <laughs> is get rook ending after rook ending after rook ending, which he proceeded at various times to misplay. <laughs> it wasn't the, the greatest advertisement for his book. But uh, people who have gotten the book have just gone, you know, ballistic. They said this is marvelous, great yeah. stuff, and we're seeing how complicated rook and pawn is. Yeah, and can I be, think Peter. honestly, no blame attaches. Yeah, I, I want to say that. Oh, of course, no. Uh, this is. Yeah, I mean, it's so despite easy. despite investing time and energy, and I've also heard brave reviews about the Sam's book. Mm. They're so varied, and the intricacies and the small differences between something you may have even studied and the position on your on your board exactly. are, are so important in every single case that, uh, yeah, pe people make a lot of mistakes in, in rook endings. And <laughs> well, just that irony where you went king takes f5 and you changed uh, directions on his, yeah, you were supposed yeah. to go take the rook and yeah, you no. didn't. Like I, uh, no. I'm thinking of ways that what can go wrong. So, okay, so b6, black has to make a move. Um, say I try to go g4 or something. Yeah, Here. time to play f4 check, nothing else wins apparently for some reason. Only move. Yeah. That would have, that surprises me that that's the only okay, winning move. And steps. once again, the main line here is is going to force me to switch because the main line here goes king d6. I go rook, rook b8, b8, king c6, and now b7. after b7, rook b3 check, king, king d4, off. rook b4, king e5, rook e4, king f6, rook e2. And what? this is this is still winning. Wow! Even though we lose the h2 pawn, this is still winning. Your king mm. is so far away from the action. Yeah. How, is, how is this winning? We I play mean, rook e3. Yeah, we play rook e3, three. And, we have, and we have king takes g4. King yeah. takes g4. And the king is so far away that all of this, oh. even with an extra tempo, this pawn ending is still winning. You still lose to after h4, king takes g4. You're still, wow. you're still way too far and, and away. Can the king kind of... That's, that's a complicated ending. It is. If I were to, to take my chances, I think it would be here. Yeah, king d6 rook b8 played so far, so this has already been sort of passed up. King d6, rook b8, and now if you play g4, I suspect f4 is still the only move. The only move, by the way, mm -hmm. you still cannot afford to give black g f3, e f3, e5, because that will create enough of a problem. You wow. still, you're still supposed to play f4 and f4 only here. Wow, because the move b7. Yeah, B7, I personally would find that very attractive. Yeah, b7, I can even throw this in, and then go king c6. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, if I and, go now, and now the, enough disappeared off the other side that uh, your switches to, let's say you go rook, rook e8, e8 here. Yeah. The, enough has been moved, moved from the board. Like h2 is hanging, like rook e8 I can take with the king and then take on h2, I and see. then play h5, h4. You can still lose even this, I assume, <laughs> right. but it's harder. It's well. harder, yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, king c6 played. Harder for some. <laughs> yeah. King Easier c6 played, and now yeah. there are choices. Now b7 is winning. Uh, you can also repeat. Maybe you can even play. Like rook c8 check is a kind of a cute little trick in these types of positions. So we drive the king away from the b file because of, let's have the king b7. Uh, we can give an additional check. Like This is the dream. What we want is to just give away the b pawn, collect this one. Right. And once this one falls, everything else Rest. will also yeah. fall. So that's one way of doing things, and if it goes to the g-file, now we can actually even switch to... No, actually, no, this is too early. I think, honestly, just, just play b7. b7. Yeah, just play b7. We don't need to fool around here. Play b7, create basically an unstoppable threat of rook e8. Right. And, and just to show it on the board once, yeah. this is very obviously completely lost. Yeah. King of six, g4, and pretty much any move. The, sim g4. the simplest is just to go after the pawns. Exactly. And also in the position after b7, if you don't mind, Peter, mm -hmm. rook to b6. If you go rook e8, can I take the pawn in that case? Sure, but I can, for now, I can include king d4. Good point. And if you play king c7, I can, I can go after the, the, the king side, like something like rook h8, and you can take on b7, I'll take on h5. Right. I'm a pawn up, other pawns are hanging, my king and is my just king so much better so than much, yours. So. Yes. No, from here... From here, I think uh, you, you, take, you take left to, to convert this. Yeah, right? it feels like it should be in safe hands. With yeah, B7, the B7 on the board. Now, and he's just done it. Yeah. Wow. 
Incredibly so, complicated, Brooke and Pauline. Absolutely. <laughs> and I, I've, I've loved like the possible defenses for Ali Reza Faruja, but also the way that Levon has to win it as well. It's mm. also very instructive. And whilst we are, okay, Ali Reza just uh, approaching the two and a half minute mark. And yeah, I think he, no has play he has to yeah, play no more time King C7 this game, or maybe yeah. throw in a B6. I mean, yeah, the, what is the move which has the greatest resistance? I guess. The most it, resistance? I think it's pretty much always G4, but by this point, F4 is no longer the only winning move. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a, I think, on, on the two previous moves, G4 would absolutely force Livon to find F4 or that the win. That was or the box. win is once again gone. Right. But now after G4, F4 is still winning, but also King E3 is now winning. So there is a much, can, more, much more leeway and for G4. Indeed G4 indeed played. G4 played. The most yeah. resilient. Yeah. And you just said, it's something that's really confounding to me. I mean, I thought we were going, you know, King C3 and driving the rook away and King D4, or, or I thought we were going to go rook E8. You said to me that after G4, I also have the additional move King E3 to win the game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, with the king, <laughs> no, but, yeah, I'm sorry. struggling to understand I know this one. You're inviting black to play e5. You know right. the move. The, the, the move I thought no, we were that, trying that, to then avoid. We will, then we will finally play rook e8 and collect the pawn. Ah, I got it. So, okay, that that's absolutely. Okay, let's let's e5 ask a human rook. question here. Does rook e8 win? No. No, that's the one that doesn't win. And this is maybe why we want an additional tempo. So, in this position. Black actually, no. Black actually gets enough counterplay with Rook B3 being a very mm -hmm. annoying threat. So maybe this is why King E3 is winning because, let's say, just to just to, re just to recheck to illustrate. Yeah. This was a draw with the King on D3, no longer a draw because we have the F4 square so we against can go the we Rook, can go rook H6, H6 and start and, collecting. Uh, yeah, gotcha. All of this is, I mean, but honestly, at, at this tempo. point, at this point, I would be reasonably confident in understanding what's going on. And in fact, I think King E3 is an easier move to understand because, once again, just to restate, this maybe pretty much forces us to collect, correctly assess this position as winning after Rook E8. Right. Which on 10 minutes, 12 minutes, which is what Levon has, to suddenly... Is a calculation. To, yeah, to, to liquidate into an equal rook ending <laughs> in terms of material. Right. We're giving up our proud passer on b7 and we're entering this, which does look promising, but you, you don't know. You're yeah. not with a nobody, nobody knows, you don't no. know. Uh, so I think if, if we're now choosing between f4 and king e3, maybe king e3 is more understandable. Mm -hmm. Just re-establishing the threat of rook e8. We just right. want to play rook e8 next move. Exactly. Let's see what Levon does. I can finally buy into a variation that I'm feeling <laughs> confident about. <laughs> King e3, that, that, that feels like a really good move to me. And uh, again, rook e8 is what we want in the position to just simply trade that b7 pawn for the, rook, uh, for the e6 pawn. Yeah, but just so to we, remind everyone that immediate rook e8 would be a big mistake. It yeah. would throw away the win. So Levon still has to be careful. So we're expecting either f4 that would require a lot of accurate calculation or As king well. e3 right king e3 i'm not sure about king e3 I, i'm not sure i would reach for that move i i like it because i like this idea very much of just sneaking my king in mm. but i do understand that in this particular case after rook e6 uh king takes no uh, rook takes very important it takes. was rook takes b7 rook takes, rook, rook takes e6 king, king d5, d5. Yeah. Uh, that I had this very annoying check on b3. If my king were on e3, on the other hand, I mean, I think this one is the yeah. easiest mm. to calculate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're, yeah. you're, you're ready to take twice on mm -hmm. f3, right? You get, you get here, when you calculate rook e8, you get to this position, you realize king c2gf exists. Right. And you think to myself, how would I improve this position? Because I have more or less unlimited time. Black isn't threatening to take on b7. Right. How do I improve my chances in this particular endgame? And yeah, you, 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 you go king e3. Yeah. Exactly. I think it's quite a difficult move to spot. I think it's much more well, instinctive to pick throw, up the f-pawn. Throw in the fact that you're exhausted after six hours mm -hmm. of play. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you're still calculating some incredibly yeah. treacherous mm. endings. Uh, I'm well, in and, awe of the players. This is really the confounding thing about this game, is that they 
over the course of the, the 50 moves that they made, they are sort of alternating between god-level play and right. mistakes they would never make in the Blitz game. Right. And it's just so strange to, to, to watch. These are, these are very, very strong players, and they have demonstrated it multiple times during this game. Absolutely. But they have also made moves which I think they will themselves struggle to explain if you ask them afterwards. G4 takes F3 was yeah, you played have to take very with, You have to quickly. take with the king, yeah. EF rook takes H2, very yeah. understandably, is not something we want. We know. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a way of losing two pawns. But king yeah. takes F3. F3. Yep. Yeah. And now, and we now will... again, the threat is rook to E8. Mm -hmm. uh, and our desire, once again, is to trade a B7. And what happens if you go E5? I'm guessing you go rook F8. Because I want to be clever, mm -hmm. right? F8 or even H8 as many. But I like the rook f8. That makes sense to me. You want to collect this pawn, and then after you've collected that pawn, another one. But do you have to calculate, though, Jovi, e4 check or not? King e3. King e3, yeah. Uh, that's so nice. Yeah. Oh, that's just so nice. No, it's, it's very, very controlled from here. No. I that, really, I really I think like it's just rook very controlled very from much. here. I think that that's actually a very clean win. And time, one minute, 40 seconds. Again, we think it's a losing position. Check. He's reaching to play a check. No, he's, rook b6. Rook b6 is clever, trying to protect the e6. Play king c7 pawn. and take with the king on b7, protecting the e6 pawn, yeah, but... Uh, king f4. King f4 to g5. Mm -hmm. Aha, it, this might be the only win, by the way. I saw it on my screen and I was kind of, aha. The way to, the way to go here, uh, because really the other evaluations are not filling me with particular confidence. We go king f4, right. and after king c7, we say, your biggest problem is your king, sir. It's very far away, so and I will just do this. Right, I will secure the king's side. I will make sure my king's side cannot be touched, and then and I will collect queen, everything very, very calmly. Your, your, your king is... W very far from the action. So once mm. again, king f4, ideal is king g5, king And is this the only way to win? I'm not entirely sure because you need to let it run. Uh, some other moves here, given the valuation, which might be winning, but considering how low, uh, how little material is left, you're sort of less confident. Yeah. Sometimes plus two in a position like this might not be enough. Because I was looking at moves like rook h8. Yeah, rook h8, I, I, I wouldn't, yeah, this is now... <laughs> now in the drawing territory. Very, very... Comfortable draw, I just go mm -hmm. king to six. This yep. is not, not even right. a problem. And this is why uh, rook c8, keeping the king cut off on the b file, is so uh, horrifying for the defender. Your king yeah. is just so far. And you pretty much always include you're king f4 first. Yeah, and you're, you're moves like e4 also draw. Specifically because there is this. Otherwise it would have been winning, but yeah. this creates an issue. Okay. Nice motifs to know. Yeah. Still not very easy for Levon. And also after king f4, you kind of have to calculate rook before check because king g5, rook e4, and you have to give up some... But once again, it's the same, it's the same thing, yeah. Check. We can, we, can still, we can still do the exact same thing here. And the king is just cut off so far away from That you. one looks very clean. Mm -hmm. Does it? h4? Yeah, but... <laughs> yeah, it's past pawn. Yeah, sir. What? Yeah. Mm. And you actually have to go after, after the king h5 throws it away. Okay. King h5 <laughs> throws it away, but this is winning. Oh my goodness! I f4, we go right? king f5, and you cannot actually defend against the threat of king oh. g5. Oh. Wow. And oh. but that's actually something that's very relevant. Mm -hmm. oh, that's what I'm saying. We were chalking up the victory as if okay, it's really secured. Yeah. yeah. And now I'm by, looking. By the way, and I'm saying, I, I it's think not I that. think I've seen this in in, in theory books. Because now the question is, how do we? We will win if we play four. Clear. But how do we play four with this pin? And black just runs out of squares. You go king f3, rook h2, and you go king g3 here, and you finally Drive start the pushing. Rook away. And also, let me let me let me ask the machine something. If I play king b6 here, mm -hmm. and I don't immediately play king g3 and d4, and I, like I spend a tempo somewhere, is this still winning? Uh, the reason I'm asking the engine about this is I thought, I thought the way to win is eventually, after all the frontal checks, mm -hmm. eventually, uh, I th no, but here obviously we go king f6, but sometimes the way to win is to do this. And then, 
Yeah, and king, without king, king b5, five. you're you're losing. But of course, nobody nobody goes king h5 here. You go closer and closer mm, and closer. Right. And you win. King f4 on the board in the meantime. King f4 on the board. But like you say, uh, the players are intermittently playing incredibly good chess with a howler mixed in, mm. uh, and that's really throwing us off. By the way, that 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 variation with rook b4 check. And rook e4. Yeah, he's played rook before check. I think we should be watching the board, and perhaps we should be using exactly. We should be using your your analysis and board to try and. And we've got rook e4 check on the board. I think that this is. Uh, I mean, it still requires some very good play. King g5, uh, essentially box, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Seven minutes, seven twenty-one for uh, Levon. I can see it nicely. Mm -hmm. On my screen now. King, King G5. G5 on the board. So rook. Yeah, we're expecting e4. rook e4. And is it something to play? No. You yeah, want rook e4, h4? Is yeah, I was thinking h4, and then rook. I was trying to trick the king to, to h5, but okay, it's right. not the, possible. This was the ch takes and rook g5 mm -hmm. check, and like you say. Tricking me to h5, yeah. But uh, yeah, rook yeah. e4 rook played. E4. And the big question is whether rook c8, c2 now is the only thing that wins. I, I'm not 100% certain. There might be other things as well. For instance, maybe king takes h5, rook takes c2, and immediately starting to push is fast enough. But you really don't uh, want to be involved with so that. I'm not sure about that yeah, one, yeah. Peter. You uh, really don't want to be involved with that. Yeah, rook e2, h4, and are you sure? I mean, would you be like, you know, sign me up. I'll, I'll bet my house <laughs> on this uh, on this one. I've got this in the bag. I'm not comfy about that. It, it actually says it's winning, but I would. I, as long as you see rook c8, rook c2, I think you always play rook c8, rook c2. I do too. But this idea of returning the rook to secure the king side, especially the e2 pawn, but even far more important to just to make sure that this king remains in purgatory for the rest of the game while your king is making a harvest you sign me up for that one and, and what happens if you just uh, move your king? king and give me the pawn yeah and then rook to g you want to go rook g4 oh, yeah, or, I okay because maybe i am threatening h3, h3 g4, g4 mm -hmm. so rook g4 but uh, do i have time now do I have time for this, or maybe I just Actually, go e3, I, I right? think I think we might have to go back to that race. Well, e3 with the idea of rook f2, rook f4, or...? Yes. Mm, okay. I was thinking uh, that I was going to smoke mm. the rook out of g4, uh, but if we get this position... Because I was going to suggest, having studied what, what the engine is telling me, I think Please. in this position what, what does win is yes. rook c3. Okay. Mm -hmm. Creating a very strong threat of rook e3 has yeah. to be resp responded to with rook e4. Okay. Yeah. And now we can play king g5, rook e2, h4. And I have a feeling that with the king cut off as far as it is, it's not even the h pawn exactly. It's just that once you vacate the e file, and you will eventually have to vacate the e file, I'll play rook e3 and I will collect everything. That is a good point. So at a certain moment, the pawn will mm. be threatening to go to h7, the rook will go to h2. Yeah. And that will always be met by rook e3. Yeah. I think wow. if, if you look at this position for, for a little bit, you realize the pawns on e6 and f5 are completely immobile. They really right. are never going to start moving. Right. And it does look winning. But it's not a very comfortable uh, solution. Yeah. Rook e4 on the board. And a big moment here. Uh, five minutes on the clock for Levon. Rook c8. Again, we're sitting in our wonderful... Uh, studios here enjoying you know our commentary the commentary of the chess engine we know rook c8 check and rook take c2 uh, is a winning method but rook c8 Le played Le Levon not a hundred percent sure and he's gone for it though he did play rook c8 rook c2 and uh, just to keep you all posted on the game between Lenier Dominguez yes, and Wesley, so that. it does look like Wesley has a very comfortable fortress. That is about the most comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I remember this uh, Bodvinik uh, 
is your bishop anchored? I remember story. that quote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it is. Then it's a draw. <laughs> and uh, Wesley uh, looking very, very, very comfy in yeah. this one. I'm going to go back to the rook ending. We've just seen rook c2. Uh, do you breathe a sigh of relief here as Levon, uh, Peter? I think, I think he knows he's winning from here, I, I, would, I would suspect. Okay, well, there's still one more hurdle, right? Because What's the hurdle? Ali Reza can play h4. And then right. have a check. And then rook to g4 check. And right. then it's very important you don't go king h5. Okay. One last test. One last hurdle. You don't go king to h5 because... I guess it's just kind of impossible to make any progress. You're, you're stuck. Do we play <laughs> e5? Do we play I king b6? I think we play king b I don't know. Yeah, he goes okay, h4. H4. So we, That's we're, the hurdle. That's the question. We are heading He's towards that it. very, very quickly. G quick takes move. h4. King h5 only move makes a draw, and that's the move rook g4, g2, pinning the rook on c2, creating the idea of like e5, f4, f4 f3. f3. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. okay. So, so if king h5, by the way, rook g2, not intuitively obvious, but then again. I think findable. Yeah, you, you start to say, well, wait a minute, f4, f3, uh, yeah, that's serious counterplay. What did I do with my king? Mm. I feel like an idiot uh, putting my king on the h file in that position. So g h, rook g4, check on the board, and this is that. Did you say you saw it in the study, Peter? No, it's not exactly that position, but uh, I was wondering if maybe my specific question there, once we get to uh, exactly this position, king takes f. No, I think f4, or even this, yeah. Uh, my question was, is it important that the king is on b7, and does it change anything if it gets to b5? But it just doesn't. Uh, and the point is, we can continue this line for a bit. King g3 on your board, rook h8, e4. You give me all the checks in the world, I get to... Uh, Say e3. No, I think I actually go forward. I think I go okay. to like g6. And then you can no longer give me checks because that will lead to king f7. Right. So like, yeah, so king f5, rook f8, king g6. And here you have to play rook e8. Right. And I think so, I'm oh, just I'm in time to, to play, play rook e2, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is a solution. I play rook e2 here, and if you play uh, king c4, it might be the only way to win, but king f7 does win. Wow. Hang on. Uh, yeah, correct. Yeah, king f7, <laughs> rook e5, king f6, king right. d4, I give a check. Exactly. So I'm just in time to, uh, to either put the pawn on e5 or win the rook in this, in this very uh, famous construction. Wow. Um, Again, we've been chalking up the victory for some time, and it, again, it comes down to a single tempo that decides the outcome of the game. Jovi, this is, this, these are 20 move variations, and these players are calculating like mad, trying to find a way out, yeah. uh, is Ali Reza. Well, one thing I wanted to say about end games is that you don't necessarily need to calculate absolutely everything. You don't. You can. You know, one thing that one should do when one studies endgames is you should just collect significant positions. So, for instance, the one that one position that we do see is that uh, Peter's highlighting right now is uh, yeah, the king being cut off two there. lines and. Yeah, I just wanted to check of the thing about king of seven. No, e5, of course, e5 is also winning here. I don't know why I played king of seven here. Uh, e5 is also winning. You can e5, play e5, five, king, king d5, king and of six. And now king of six, yes, yeah, sure. And this I, is still I have a rule. Once the pawn has crossed, I call it the river. The river? Just, I don't know why, but I call it the river, then it's uh, winning. Hmm. I've always called it the equator. Oh. You know, I have my side yeah, of yeah. the globe, my, my space, my 32 squares, you have your 32 squares, there's an equator between us. Well, great minds think, River? think somewhat alike. You were raised in London with the Thames? <laughs> <laughs> I was, actually. <laughs> I was in Hawaii with, <laughs> with the equator. Um, what have the players done? What have they King achieved? of Six has been, has been achieved on the board in the meantime. Let me just refresh my board and uh, uh, King F6. Minute 30 seconds for Ali and uh, three minutes for Levon. Yep. He has to take because otherwise he will lose the same two. Well, so okay, very Rook interesting. G2. So he, he's realized that and oh, he was lost. Oh, his idea is king takes e6, f4. f4. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, Tricky. that's a nice oh my God. <laughs> Only move wins here. Only one move wins here. Okay. okay and that's a move that we will not be able to guess. I mean, I, I know, but I, I... There's not very many legal moves, so maybe I would have got, gotten it on fifth try. Right. King E5? No. H3. Oh, be yeah. serious. H3? <laughs> This is a very, very good practical, uh, practical shot by Lireza, by the way. This Brilliant. is incredibly impressive. So, Spotting that this exists. Tell Black's, us why H3 Black's is idea winning. idea is F4, I F3. think after F4, I think we go rook C4. Yeah, yeah, we go, we go rook C4 here. And this ends up winning after rook takes C2, rook takes F4, because the king is so far away. And we now have two. So yes. Black will take even longer than usual to actually fight against the H pawn advance. Yeah, have to bring like his rook all the way G4, back. E4, E4, we just start pushing. E5, E3, mm -hmm. rook E4, and it's very, very useful for us that the H3 pawn survives in all of these variations. But oh, honestly, this is a goodness. bit unfair, to be honest. Like truly, this is a bit unfair. But H3. Well, I am a pawn grubber, so I might have fallen, uh, come around to it just out of necessity. And they're said. equal on the clock as well now. So this, is, this is still very intriguing. And again, the subplots of the highest rating, and can Ali Reza actually save this game? Save his five rating well, points? Well, we've, we've seen a more impressive save. H3! H3 played. Levon. Levon is good. Oh, he... Awesome. And if we go and if we go rook h2 here, uh, among other things, we can even win with rook c3. Apparently, h3, we we can even give up e2 with both of black pawns surviving. <laughs> Once again, hugely important that this is alive. So this is becoming a queen so quickly. So wait a minute, f4, h6, rook e3, h7. h7, h7 yeah, <laughs> in this position. Although black, of course, will continue from of here. Course. You know you're not saving. This. Right. Yeah, you know you're not saving. Wow. Wow, what but I'm still, I, you know, I just have to tip my yeah, hat, big applause, and I want H2, to, I, H3. The, the first two times I've done this uh, accidentally, and I want to apologize to the production team, but now I kind of, you know, exit stage left. Because <laughs> I, <laughs> Peter, we lost Peter. <laughs> Come back, yeah. why did we lose you? Yeah. <laughs> H3. Exit stage left. H3, F4, look at Levon, he just played that last move like, okay. He's calculated this out, Peter. Yeah, he, I think he's actually figured this out, and he is uh, wow. now once again pretty much nailed on to, to, to win this game, because... Rook it, takes e2, it rook takes itself. f4. Even though I have a pass pawn, these two very scraggly, ugly, doubled h pawns... Okay. They rule. carry the day. They Let, carry the let's day. Let's go Please. a little bit. Father with a variation and sure. rook e3. three maybe here? Yes. Okay, makes a lot of sense. You want to capture a pawn. Are you just simply going to go... H5, rook h3, king g5. H5. And we're just fast enough. We are just fast enough here. Rook takes h3, king g5. Some ideas of even rook yeah, h4. Yeah, e5, rook h4. Exactly. e5, rook h4, wow. rook h3, check, rook g4. The king is so far. Then we have the luxury of actually doing this. Rook g3, oh, rook g4. That's just nasty. Well, yeah. Rook takes e2 played by Ali rook Reza takes and f4. rook takes f4 on I'm board. I'm just going to go back. This is actually the, the position that uh, the players Reza, have achieved. less than a minute. We're expecting rook e3. Uh, the king is terrible. The king is terrible, but the problem is the desirable king c6, h5, King d5, h6. Of course, if this h pawn was missing, it would be very simple. Rook h2, I would give up my rook for uh, the h pawn and I would make a draw. The doubled pawn makes all the difference in the mm -hmm. world. Well, e5 and played. e5 played. Now, at least a couple of moves are winning. The simplest is just to play rook g4. We don't need to. Uh, Anything fancy. Yeah, we don't need to think about too much. We're just pushing the h pawn, controlling the e pawn. Once it reaches e3, we'll play rook e4. And is rook b4 one step in the wrong direction? So the whole idea with that is then, okay, I know it's an actively uh, yeah, encouraging yeah, 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 the yeah. black king. Okay, and but then I it's wanted all right. to go h5. So you, you, still you've winning. Got, yeah, still okay. winning. So you've got rook h4 if, if, you, if black changes 
ships and goes for the H pawn. You've got it, rook h4. I'm not adverse to uh, rook b4 check either. I did well, like honestly, rook g4. Honestly, if we want to send that rook to, on towards, a mission? Towards, towards the left side of the board, I like rook c4. Yes, that was the other one I that like I wanted rook to c4 say. Yeah, here I was keeping. thinking rook e3. But once again, h5, rook h3, king g5 is winning. We. We, no, is, we know that position we, is winning. We're, we're right back into uh, our... And, and there's no way to kind of jettison the pawn with... It's still very too, too far. It, you, you're, not, you're not getting close mm. enough to the h pawn quickly enough. I was thinking right. e4. Rook e4, king c6, but rook h6, rook h4 will still win very, very comfortably yeah. there because it's just way too far. Peter, you are a human chess calculator. <laughs> Actually, there You've are some drawing variations. Okay, they don't make any sense though. Rook f1 <laughs> what, would be what, a draw. What, what, what? I just, uh, suddenly the table base came up on my screen. And it shows you Rook f3, also a draw. Yeah, but nobody, nobody plays rook f3. The fact that rook f1 <laughs> isn't winning isn't immediately obvious to me. But so yeah, this rook is the current is position. Mm -hmm. and let's so we're expecting e4 rook b4, rook, e, rook c4, rook g4 all win, correct? Yeah. But rook f1 yeah. fails. Rook f1 fails, yeah. Okay. I don't know and why. How, why tragically It, does it, it fail? fails because of e4. Okay, but of course... Rook c4. By the way, you kind of played that with... Okay, 58 seconds. Not, not one second on his clock, but 58 seconds. Levon has played rook c4. Uh, that's kind of twisting the knife a little bit. A little bit, bit but yeah. it's a goodie. It's, it's a goodie. It's a good move, but yeah, Peter. it does feel like he's taunting his opponent a little <laughs> bit with his endgame technique here. Yeah, just keeping... And the, the variation to show here would be e4, yes. h5, e3. Yes. And we probably actually invest a tempo in rook e4 in this position. Mm -hmm. Immediately returning. And yeah, you can... And after rook f2 check, king g5, rook g2 check. Uh, king g5? Yeah, let's say? go king g5, rook g2 check. Yes. I think the simplest actually is king h4. Oh, Just nestling another yourself. Another yeah. reason why we love the doubled h yeah. pawns. Nestling yourself between the two h pawns and e2 h6. I think this is actually cruel. This is oh, oh, 3. Oh, 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 oh. Two. Three. Keeping us on our toes, toes, but he did play. I, rook e3. I mean, I have played a lot of rook and pawn endgames in my life. I, I, I think this is unusual mm. in the sense that I've never seen a rook and pawn endgame where doubled h pawns have been this strong. I mean, <laughs> doubled h pawns is a reason for a fail, epic Abs fail. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. But this and is, in this case, it's just so unfair. Yeah, half a minute, the, by the way, 20, huh. 27, 26. He doesn't really have much choice, so I think he will play h5, king g5. It's just sure. that I, I don't know what else do you play in this position. Yeah, you just, no. you just start pushing. Exactly. You just start pushing and you trust that the king on b7 is just so far off that uh, it will carry you. I have to tip my hat to Ali Reza to that whole line with rook g2 and forcing the move h3. Yeah, Ali Reza's gone e4. He also knows rook Remarkable. h3 is losing uh, and... Does h6 make a draw now? h6 is a draw now, but nobody plays h6 here. There's really play, no reason play, to play do. h4 myself. I think h4 is more uh, logical. <laughs> very logical. Yeah. Whoa, yeah. he played yeah, king, king g5. g5. That's still that's, winning. That's still fine, yeah. That's still, that's fine. still in the table. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's the rook g3, king h4, nestling between yeah. the double h pawns. That is still completely that's, fine. That is yeah. just cruel. King g5. In the meantime, Wesley is kind of outplaying Linier in that position. <laughs> Who's playing for a win, you're asking? Yeah. Uh, He's going just... to go to G2 with the king and then uh, ask, ask uh, Linier exactly how are you planning to make, <laughs> make a any... draw. <laughs> well, no, I mean, there is a draw, yeah. Well, I'll sacrifice my rook on F2 and yeah, yeah, exactly, geniusly yeah. uh, win. Uh, so King B6 played... not a big factor there, uh, by the way. Uh, Linier oftentimes... No does have a, a clock issue that doesn't seem to be the case here. So after king b6, the cleanest is once again this really, really strange looking... I will go back to... Uh, yeah, h3, h4 chosen by Levon, which is still completely fine. Um, pretty much every single move was winning there, but yeah, him wanting to preserve both of his Why not? passers for, for the longest possible time is very understandable. Yeah, Why and not? I have the table base right in front of me telling me that it is completely winning. 
for Lavon. I mean, that's the beauty of the table base, that chess, you know, when there's not so many pieces, has been so worked out that the com these table bases can just indicate that's mm. a draw, right. that's a win. Yeah. I was going to say you could play h6, king takes c4, h7 there, but once again, nobody does that because you don't not. want to involve yourself with this queen versus rook. Certainly not, but uh, rook c4, uh, rook c, rook c4, c8 uh, was played by Levon. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, I don't think it was the first time I became familiar with the uh, table base, but it was in 19. 95 in Philadelphia, the first Gary Kasparov versus Deep Blue match. They, the two sides were negotiating the rules of the match, and the idea was, was ever a, a position came into a table-based position, the, the two sides accepted the result of the game. In other words, Rook and Bishop versus Rook, Gary would not, Gary's the defender, mm -hmm. Gary would not have to defend it because the computer has access yeah. to the table base. So the idea was table base decides, end mm -hmm. of story. And it was sort of like, well, how many endings were there? And it was something unbelievable. And I mean, there on your screen you see 30,000 endings. A, and we and do sweet. have a victory. Exactly. And Levon Aronian wins against Ali Reza Faruja. So wow. Levon now joins Wesley So in being tournament leader. But what a game by I don't Levon. want to use the word epic, but in some ways it really was. This was an incredible game. I mean, to the very end, and this, the tricks. <laughs> so, the traps. so many tricks. And, wow. and once again, starting from a 40, Levon played almost a perfect game. He didn't find rookie five. And if we want to be extremely strict with him, we yeah. will say that this actually threw away the win. Right. But I don't think the, the reason King d3 isn't winning is entirely obvious at all. Right. And apart from that one misstep, I think he converted very, very cleanly. But yeah, there were some events between move, I don't know, 20 and 30, which were quite difficult to yeah. as commentators uh, explain. And well, uh, maybe this game is also soon Finally. ending in a draw. I mean, I love the king, black king on <laughs> <Yeah>. g2. <laughs> Are you <And> safe? <laughs> yeah. There was are a, you sitting comfortably? The only, yes, way to give, the only way to give check to that king is just to blunder And, rook. okay, yeah. the position has been repeated three times, and this game also finishes in a draw. Uh, are you familiar with the novel, as well as the movie, with Dustin Hoffman, Marathon Man? Marathon Man. Oh, it was a scene in the... In, is it safe? Is it safe? Uh, and I'm looking at this king on G2. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is, it's safe. it is pretty safe. Yes. It is safe. It, it is, is one safe. of the safest kings I've seen in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> You're not smoking that king out. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is, is a very, safe? very nicely um, positioned monarch. Wow. Wow. I mean, that, that, that game just kind of really just it took it out of me. What an incredible game. Just before the free day. You were saying, Jovi, you don't want to lose the day before the free day. For Ali Reza, that was a, that was a huge blow. It, it could potentially knock him out of the candidates as well. Potentially. I mean, that game had a lot of consequences. It you know, He's in the did. running for winning this tournament, but also, as you mentioned, that rating spot in the candidates. And now the gap has narrowed. How things change. There was an MVL uh, victory here at the Sinkfield Cup where it was the American team that was the welcoming committee. MVL defeated Hikaru, Wesley, and Levon. <laughs> you know, like, he came, he saw, he accepted the American gifts. It's actually two Americans sharing first place, Wesley and Levon, thanks to this victory. And I believe... Uh, Wesley is probably like half a rating point ahead in the race now. I think this was our calculation, right? Something he was. Something. Like yeah, we, we don't know exactly the fractions of the the, the one rating point that are mm -hmm. in play here, but it feels like Wesley is now in the lead with uh, three rounds, effectively three rounds to go for them right. to play because I, I don't think either of them have. No, Wesley did play against. No. I'll, I will check. Fail. Okay. <laughs> but tomorrow is the rest day, though. I mean, yeah. what would you recommend to the players to do? 
Get a lot of rest. Get a lot of rest. <laughs> lot Do of nothing. Rest. Yeah. Tennis. 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 Relax. Just uh, take your mind off the chess. Maybe prepare for the very next opponent, but don't 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 overdo it. No, just take a rest. Mm -hmm. Come to the board with vim and vigor. Mm -hmm. And um, here's what uh, the results are. Uh, Jovi, do yeah. the honors. Look at this. And uh, we can see that Wesley So still remains on top of the table with a score of three points out of five. A little bit Levon Roman <laughs> is there with two and a half points on out of four. And uh, there is a game imbalance and that is due exactly. to Jan Christoph Duda's withdrawal after round two and so his games have been voided. And uh, let's go over to Anastasia, who's in the playing hall, and uh, she's there with a special guest. Yeah, and I have hero of the day today, Levon. Congratulations, such a big fight, and finally you managed to win this game. What happened at the very beginning, and what you think were the critical moments? I think you got a nice uh, position. Yeah, I, I think uh, I looked at something like that with my second uh, Aram Hakopian. Uh, oh. But I didn't really remember what I had intended, but I think this all makes perfect sense. You know, I'm just developing. And uh, yeah, I felt C5 is very strange. I, I thought C5 is, um, is not the move, because after that somehow, you know, uh, I mean, if he has to play D5, then it's not going to be good for him. Yeah, probably he can take on C3 and then just... But uh, I think uh, maybe it's more precise to take one move before. Mm -hmm. So I think was, let's go for some critical moments. I think there were so many in this game. So you push this d6. I think it was really important. Yes, to get rid yeah, of the yeah. spawn and uh, to consist. I was afterwards. very surprised by queen e7. I thought rook fc8 or rook ac8, some sort of you know, it's a tiny bit better for me, but. It's not the end of the world because after this it felt really comfortable for me, you know, because queen comes to f3 and I felt it should be a very nice position for me. Yeah, and then knight d4 of course was surprising. I I mainly looked at knight d5 and I thought, you know, it's a tiny bit better, pleasant yeah. position. You know, you can play forever. And after knight a4, I think this is a very nice position for white. Yes, yes, yes. everybody yeah. agrees with, with you, but <laughs> but I think it was actually this moment when he played f5, which made his position even worse, yes? No, I saw that I can take and play uh -huh. rook d7, but queen b8, I wasn't so sure I, I can yes. immediately benefit from mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt that this is a kind of a critical thing, if either I take or... But knight c4 felt kind of a move that should be unpleasant in time trouble for my opponent. Yeah. You had many choices at this position. Actually, when it's good, it's yeah. hard actually to make yeah, the yeah. choice, yes. So. No, because I felt A4 is such a risky move, you know, strategically, you know, this always is hanging. I have this queen d3, f3 mm -hmm. ideas. Maybe concretely I, I blundered something. It's quite possible, but... Uh, Did you feel uh, at any moment that, you know, win was slipping or... Yeah, let's say, I, Which was this moment? Yeah, I think somewhere here, somehow, uh, I... Un underestimated this rook b8 and I felt, uh, you know, um, it's it's a very good position but it's not that easy after knight c6 but mm -hmm. still I was, because I was in time trouble I felt, you know, if I play slowly I might not get the chance. Mm -hmm. So here I felt, but it's, you know, it's not type of position that is very pleasant for black to play. Exactly, I mean you have a pawn up, yeah. I mean and you can play it forever. Sure. And of course I should ask you about this moment when he, he made the move with one second on clock. I mean, <laughs> did you notice, what did you feel at this no, moment? No, I didn't notice because you did I, notice I, I left. Ah, you were not there. No, I was not there. <laughs> Yeah. But when you came back and saw 31 seconds, did you notice that? I didn't even you notice didn't even that, pay, no. pay Yes, he made it like rook c4 and it was move number 40 and we know that this is the move where you do, do normally mistakes, right? Yeah, I think rook c4 was probably a mistake. Mm -hmm. But uh, rook b5 generally is an unpleasant move that I made, mm -hmm. you know, just to make him uh, come up with a decision. This, I'm not sure if this is, if what, what this position is, because I really don't know. Oh yeah, Peter, you played actually very well. Peter showed us many, many lines and I think mm -hmm. uh, you played really, really good from this point and finding the more or less the only lines and maybe you just can show a couple of moments where you... It, it was very surprising, yes. you know, that this is actually is winning. I felt that here, 
uh, wait. Yes, uh, that here, I somehow started remembering and I couldn't remember it fully. Because uh -huh. I thought, I think the rook is on the short side, so maybe this is losing. Let's say king b5, doesn't matter. King g3, rook h8. I mean, it's of course embarrassing not to remember, I mean, this is a basic position. But I somehow remembered something like this. And here, king c6, king f6, I think. No, uh -huh. this is a draw, yeah? Uh, rook e4, I mean... Oh, no, wait, don't uh, rook, the, sorry. The yes. rook e2, <laughs> yes. uh -huh. and uh, king c6. Ah, e5, yeah. Five. Rook is on a short line, yeah. Mm -hmm. Rook is on a short file, so it doesn't work. I mean, work. after five hours of play, I mean, you, you, are, you can forget anything you want, you know? <laughs> ah, actually, king f7, king f6. So, but if, if, the, if the king is here and the yeah. rook is there, it's a dead ah, it's draw. It's a draw, yes, okay. Yeah, but because of the rook here, but it's... Uh, I, I was kind of shocked that I have to <laughs> resort to this. And here, uh, of course, I think h3 is the only move, I felt. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, something else is winning, too. But I felt... Uh, I need to play this in order to have this uh, rook c4 business. But here, uh, you know, I, I was very shaky. <laughs> yeah. You can uh, imagine. <laughs> but I mean, to win such a game, which actually now you have plus one, it's complicated with the standings, but do you feel as a leader now of the tournament? Co leader. <laughs> well, it's hard to tell, but, uh, you know, winning a, a classical game is a, always a wonder, as my friend uh, Boris Gelfand said. And uh, I, I agree with him even more so nowadays. So uh, you need to make a little wonder to win. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy I managed. Exactly. This is what happened. Thank you so much, Levon. Thank you. Have a good rest tomorrow. We, we have a free day. All the best in the next games. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you for Levon. And indeed, that move H2, H3, I felt it was necessary. It absolutely was. It was, it was the only... Uh, winning move and here's our remaining schedule. Yes, and it's important to note that tomorrow is a rest day for the players. So the games will be resuming on Monday, November 27th. And then from then on, the players will be playing every day until November the 30th. And of course, playoffs will be played if necessary. Thank you, Jovi. And I tell you, Peter, uh, that rook ending really uh, yeah, that was I feel a, like I need to rest <laughs> after that rook ending. Yeah. Final thoughts of this that was a, uh, that was a day round. and a half, yeah, and in particular yeah. that game. That game featured so many twists and turns, and it then did. eventually study-like conversion by by Levon, who f figured out the very very intricate end game at the at the end. I think he made from move forty until the end of the game. He made one. I will call it an inaccuracy. I don't even dare call it a mistake. And that right. was a very very clean conversion after the somewhat shaky play earlier. We've doubled the tally. <laughs> we have. We're on two now. Yes. <laughs> uh, fantastic, fantastic stuff. And uh, tomorrow, uh, tennis, uh, potentially for some of us. It's on the schedule. <laughs> yes. <laughs> are, you, are you saying yes and we can see you on the tennis court? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've got a, my racket. I've yes, got my uh, shoes. I'm ready to go. And then four decisive uh, rounds starting from, uh, from Monday. Everything to look forward to. The rating uh, sport race has tightened up beautifully for the last right. four rounds. Wow. Um, let's, uh, let's just enjoy it while, while it lasts, what can I say? Absolutely. And we've officially passed the halfway mark yes, <laughs> and now entering into the second stage of the tournament. But tomorrow it is a rest day and for now we are going to say goodbye and thank you everyone for watching and see you on Monday, same time, same place. Good goodbye. night everyone. This has been a presentation of the St. Louis Chess Club. Any reproduction or distribution of this content without the express written consent of the St. Louis Chess Club is prohibited.